डॉक्टर A very warm greeting to all. Sabka saath, sabka vikas, meaning together with all, development for all, was highlighted as the finance minister presented the first budget of the Amritkal era. The goal is to create strong, empowered, and inclusive economy that is driven by technology and knowledge with a robust financial sector. The highlights of the budget included green growth, bridging the last mile, and inclusive development. Taxman is excited to organize the budget marathon featuring renowned industry leaders who will guide us through a comprehensive analysis of the finance bill. Our expert panel will delve into the key provisions of the finance bill and provide a comprehensive analysis of the proposed changes in direct tax, indirect tax and corporate laws. Join us today for a thought-provoking examination of the amendments outlined in the budget. As your moderator today, I, Sia Ridma Bhatia, from Taxman's Advisory and Research Department, welcome you. Today's event will feature 11 sessions by 13 knowledgeable speakers over the next eight hours. You can view the full speaker schedule and agenda on taxman.com slash budget. This webinar is conducted live on Zoom as well as on taxman.com, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can submit your questions by the chat box or comment box and our team will respond to them. The speaker will also address some of the selected questions at the end of each session. So we are now starting the budget marathon with direct tax laws, which have amendments to over 100 provisions. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker for today, Mr. Mukesh Patel, an eminent international tax expert and champion for taxpayer education, enjoying 46 years of experience as a veteran in the legal profession. He has served as a member on the Justice ESAR Committee for Simplification of Income Tax Act and as an expert of the tax force for drafting new income tax law. He will share his insights on the overview of Budget 2023. I would like to hand over the session to Mr. Patel without any further delay. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Ridima. Can you please uh, put me on the full screen? Yeah. Thank you. So, a very good afternoon to you all on the occasion of a very historic event post budget, which was initiated last year by taxmen. And this is the second marathon the trailblazing success of the first marathon encouraged taxmen to come up with renewed fervor, with extra vigor, greater imagination. And therefore, today, you have non-stop eight hours of a marathon. And as was explained by Ridima, 11 sessions 13 speakers. On behalf of taxmen, with whom I have been myself associated for close to five decades now, I would like to take this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome. It's a happy coincidence that the Amrit Kal budget has been presented and this initiative is taken up by taxmen in its golden jubilee year. Founded in 1972, Taxman has been a pioneer in taxpayer and tax professional education in the country. And today has taken several initiatives, not just in the print, but even on the digital media and has gone into research 
practice academic and learning sessions. With this, Taxman enjoys a unique reputation. And I would like to, at the outset, compliment the entire Taxman team for this wonderful initiative. Friends, you are going to be having a great learning today. In these opening remarks, I want to share with you my own insights into the Amrit Kal budget. I have been myself fortunate to track closely, study and analyze budgets right since 1977, the beginning of my professional career. And I was fortunate to learn the art and science of budget analysis from my very revered budget guru, Sri Nani Palkhiwala, who greatly inspired and motivated me for this. Over these 47 years, I have seen 16 finance ministers present their budgets and taking an overview of the 75 years of India's budgeting history. Let me tell you that the Amrit Kal budget is bound to go in letters of red and gold as a historic budget, a budget that has paved a new path, a new vision and mission for the country when it is marching ahead towards the 100. The striking features of this budget are growth, inclusive development, and fiscal management. Inclusive development to start with, you know, the budget encompasses provisions for almost all important sectors of the economy, be it agriculture, be it industry with a focus even on the uh, small and medium industries, the micro industries, the focus on education, health, and more than anything else, to keep pace with the times. The focus on green growth, the focus on uh, uh, the artificial intelligence and the digital movements to bring in ease of doing business, to ensure that the plethora of laws with which the you know, citizens of the country are entangled with, you know, he can heave a sigh of relief. I think these are some of the very striking features when we talk of the inclusive development. Coming to growth, friends, this is a big bang budget when the FM Nirmalaji has presented something bold and beautiful. Just take into consideration the 10 lakh crores allocated for infrastructure development. And imagine the kind of kickstart it will give to the economy in all sectors with this capex spending. Even on the budget, a railway front, I think this time the layout for the railway budget in terms of 2.4 lakh crores is perhaps one of the uh, biggest ever. And therefore, this is a budget which is clearly directed to ensure higher growth in terms of overall GDP and the economic development. And as was rightly mentioned by the Honorable Finance Minister, to put India from its position number five into the top three, you know, League of Nations in terms of development. Obviously, our GDP growth, which is very close to around 7%, has become a matter of global envy. 
and no wonder why because india is the place to be foreign direct investment is flowing in the government has geared up to keep a environment which is tax friendly investment friendly for global investors but this time the entire i and focus and the expectations were of the common man the middle class taxpayer what is he going to be given by the honorable finance minister it was almost a long wait for 4 years 4 years you know i myself used to say that there was nothing very tangible in terms of personal income tax reliefs in the budgets of madam nirmala ji but this time i think she has not only been generous but she has perhaps in her endeavor to present a historic amrit kal budget given tax relief from the personal front which i tried myself to analyze and work out these are peerless reliefs in india's budgeting history of 75 years if there have been only two budgets which have given a double digit tax relief as compared to the preceding years tax relief the only two budgets which focus for this purpose one is what we know historically 14 years ago of 2008 mr chidambaram's budget of 2008 at that point of time in one single budget of his he gave a relief which worked out to a tax saving of 11.03% over the preceding year i remember in fy 2007-8 if i were to just give a comparative example with an illustration on taxable income of 15 lakhs the income tax was around 4 lakhs and 52000 and that was slashed with a package of reliefs and it came to around 4 lakhs and 2000 and this 50000 of tax relief with reference to the preceding years 452 worked out to 11.03% there was no double digit tax relief until then and chidambaram ji said at that time that perhaps no finance minister in the future also may be able to match the kind of relief that he had given well history has proved it that our southern finance ministers can do wonders and this time nirmala ji has overtaken chidambaram ji in terms of the relief she has granted friends take into account 2022 23 the current fiscal when i am comparing apple to apple so i am taking the existing new tax scheme and the proposed new tax scheme on 15 lakhs of taxable income under the existing new tax scheme the tax payable is 1 lakh 95000 and with the package of reliefs on the personal tax front about which my other colleagues will be talking about more elaborately when they dwell on this the reliefs work out to a healthy 39000 rupees and therefore against 195 next year on the same income a taxpayer middle class taxpayer would be required to pay just 156000 and taking this 39000 with reference to the 1 lakh 95000 that works out 
to 20%. Just imagine, friends, 20% tax relief bonanza with a peak almost of 39,000 at that level is something which is a tangible relief, which will help. So on one hand, the economic growth and development will come with the allocations of spending by the government on all important fronts, keeping into focus inclusive development and with more money into the pocket of the common and the middle class taxpayer, what you will see is it will be directed either for a healthy consumption, boosting up the consumption economy, or a part of it would go for savings, which in any case would be equally useful. The finance minister has had many insightful, you know, they have nothing directly to do with the finance bill. And in order that they may not be missed out, I would like to cover these in my opening remarks and observations. I would say in this Amrit Kal year, the finance minister has been indeed kind to senior citizens because the most popular investment scheme for senior citizens which was the Senior Citizen Savings Scheme and which is the Senior Citizen Savings Scheme, it offered uh, them something to park their hard-earned life savings. But at the same time, you know, uh, it was 15 lakhs, which it was being felt needed revision. So the 15 lakhs has been doubled to 30 lakhs, and if both the spouses, husband and wife, are senior citizens in the family, it would work out to 60 lakhs. 60 lakhs of investment that can be made at the prescribed higher rate of uh, interest, which is currently 8%, would mean that the senior citizen family couple would get annual income of 4 lakhs and 80,000, which is almost 40,000 rupees a month, no worries of tax, because obviously up to rupees 7 lakhs, keeping in view the tax rebate, there is no tax. So a very large number of senior citizen couples and families would definitely be happy. A gesture of Mahila Samman has also been shown by the Honorable Finance Minister with the small uh, two lakhs Mahila Samman Patras carrying a, a return of 7.5%. I was only wondering if this could have been a little more in terms of the possible limit of investment. But nonetheless, as a gesture that has been made, this is something indeed welcome. Coming to the direct tax front, while I would not want to go into the individual specific proposals, friends, I am personally so happy indeed, having been part for almost close to four years into the participative process of meaningful tax reforms through my very active involvement and contribution that I could very humbly make being part of the issuer committee and then the task force on direct tax laws. I think some of the wonderful changes that were initiated around the time we were trying to push through, you know, making the life of taxpayers easy for business and industry, enabling them to enjoy the ease of doing business, even this budget itself contains a, a series of measures which are aimed at ease of doing business. But I think two things that have happened over the past few years, one is in terms of taxpayer compliance, as the Honorable Finance Minister herself quoted the figures, the CPC at Bengaluru has equipped itself with such 
efficiency and strength that in a single year almost 6.5 crore returns were processed and it was perhaps a great record that in a single day 72 lakh itrs could be accepted without any glitch and what is most heartening is as once again that was quoted that around 10 years ago it took an average processing time for a return to be processed by the cpc of 93 days that has been brought down to 16 days 16 days is the average in fact you may consider it almost miraculous but it's a fact and it was heartening to note nirmala ji herself sharing these figures that 45% of the returns which are currently filed are being processed in less than 24 hours i think we need to give a big pat on the back of the entire cpc team which is truly doing a wonderful task and i am tempted to you know because under uh, the banner of under the platform of taxman last year inspired by the response of the budget marathon we were inspired to take up uh, almost which came close to a marathon project but it was a cpc open house and i would like to in particular compliment the very dynamic chief of uh, cpc uh, its uh, director dr cb chain matthew who along with his team you know on the taxman platform and i was very happy to conduct the same you know in a series of almost 4 hours of rounds that we did we took up so many questions of common taxpayers and tried to address their uh, difficulties their challenges and also sensitize uh, mutually each other about the problems and difficulties i would like to tell the cpc both at bengaluru and the uh, tds authorities there in the north gaziabad that the finance minister has taken note of the fact that there are grievances still because systems you know have again limitations and therefore we have to be continuously on the move for innovation but i am glad that a special mention has been made that there would be a focus on grievance redressal as far as uh, you know the times to come are concerned so we hope that with uh, better you know we are again uh, the, uh, the fm indicated that an extremely tax payer friendly and uh, next generation kind of uh, tax return which will be like a pre filled return trying to ensure that a tax payer does not make any mistake at all in fact uh, the ais that has come the annual information statement has i think uh, played a great role in trying to ensure that uh, there is a greater voluntary compliance in fact i would say friends that in these past few years on the personal income tax front the voluntary compliance that has been there is indeed very heartening and even after the the entire package of tax reliefs that are being given you know the government revenues are consistently going up in fact post covid also the growth in the income tax revenue was not just heartening it was truly remarkable so we are all set for good times when the, the when the tax gdp you know balance is going to be consistently improving and for voluntary compliance having been improved i think you know three things are very important one is obviously i would say uh, the 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 
role of the annual information statement, the role of the insight of the income tax department has played, you know, a, a, a very key role in the sense taxpayers now do realize that uh, the department, the income tax department knows everything about them and therefore they cannot afford to play hide and seek. That's number one. Number two, I would say the faceless assessment scheme. This is now almost three years and barring some small aberrations and hiccups, I would say the faceless assessment scheme has truly delivered in uh, coming up to the expectations that we had in terms of, uh, in terms of the ease, in terms of transparency, and to an extent, even accountability with so many inbuilt features into the faceless scheme. And the FM has indicated very firm and clear that even in the time to come, the scrutiny is going to be more and more selectively less in number. That means the thrust is going to be to place trust so it's a thrust for trust as far as the tax department is concerned in their relations with taxpayers. So with technology assisting greater voluntary compliance, with technology trying to meet the expectations of taxpayers in terms of, of faster processing of refunds, etc., and also uh, trying to have more happy taxpayers who have passed through the scrutiny assessments, I think all this put together is setting up the stage for a perfect, you know, direct tax regime in the times to come. Of course, there are so many other things we need to achieve, but I would particular, in particular, like to also compliment the tax. It's not easy for the FM to be bold enough to say that, okay, while in the budget that I'm giving relief to the middle class, I'm equally giving something which is due to the high net worth individuals, to those taxpayers showing income above five crores, who perhaps were very justified in saying that there was no need for inflicting a 37% surcharge because we, we were giving out wrong signals. So this is again a landmark budget, which you know is capping the maximum personal tax rate to 39% with the return of surcharge uh, from 37% to a maximum of 25%. This is also, I would say, one of the very welcome measures as far as the overall direct tax proposals of this budget are concerned. So this budget, even, you know, there are small things that have been taken into account. For example, you know, the need to have physical gold. Uh, if it is to be converted to electronic gold, you know, there would be capital gains issues, but imaginatively they have been addressed. There are measures which have looked at simplification and rationalization of several provisions. But before I conclude, I also want to make just a personal observation and understanding in regard to this big debate of old versus new that has been going on for some time. It has been three years now that we have had the new scheme in fact, the existing new, which came in place of the old. And the feeling was very strong that the existing new has not been able to take off in comparison to the old because of some very inherent flaws and drawbacks. I'm very happy as the, my colleagues and the other speakers will try to dwell into this in much greater detail. Several speed breakers and hurdles in the existing new regime of uh, personal income tax 
have been sought to be removed by several important amendments that have been made under Section 115 BAC. And therefore, I consider this as a very healthy measure because when on one hand, you are expecting that the income tax department is knowing everything about your income and you cannot afford to miss anything in terms of reporting your income. It was a challenging task for the department to be able to really take a look at the plethora of deductions, exemptions, etc., that you are claiming as a common taxpayer, you know, and claiming deductions for them. On one hand, a large number of deductions were giving rise to litigation. And therefore, that was required to be checked. On the other hand, it was also becoming tempting for taxpayers who had mischief in their minds that the government not, may not be able to really track into the kind of claims that are being made by them, except for scrutiny and with the focus being lesser and lesser scrutiny. You know, it was, it was an irony, it was a contradiction, how to handle this situation. So the new scheme, the plain vanilla kind of a thing where with 15 lakhs, it's just a 50,000 standard deduction and nothing more. That means the taxpayer has to show his income correctly. There is no scope for him to mischievously claim a false LTC or a wrong HRA or an erroneously understood ATC, ATD kind of a you know, deduction claim. So I would say philosophically, we have to accept this fact and the very fact that the default regime is now going to be the proposed new tax scheme. I think we are moving into a very positive direction where the taxpayers are being told that your tax affairs will be simple, transparent, and obviously on part of the department, there will be the accountability that is expected and it will also match the expectations in terms of ease of compliance. So with all these friends, and as I said, I repeat, this budget will be long remembered as perhaps being the number one budget in terms of the highest ever personal tax reliefs in terms of the percentage relief offered by any finance minister. And the FM could not have waited for a better time than the Amritka. So with these opening observations and with my compliments wholeheartedly to team taxmen for taking up this wonderful marathon. And I sincerely hope they will continue this with added vigor, strength and imagination in the time to come. Mukesh Patel, I would like to close with all my good wishes and greetings to all my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for setting the tone for today's marathon, sir. It was indeed a fantastic session, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we are now proceeding to the next session on personal taxation. We would like to welcome Saraswati Kasturi Rangan, partner Deloitte India. Saraswati has extensive expertise in expatriate tax issues and social security, offering advisory services for assignment structuring that leverages double taxation avoidance agreements and social security agreements. Warm welcome to you, Saraswati. Thank you, Ridhima. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be present and making a presentation to this August gathering. And uh, coming after uh, Mukesh, sir, I think uh, it is indeed a formidable task that is set out in front of me, but I will do my best. And uh, if I could get the rights for presenting, um, okay. let me just uh, try uh, to share my screen. Um, yeah, 
Yeah. So the session Please is all yours. Whether my screen is visible? Oh uh, yes. You can take it through slide share mode. Yeah, I've done that. Is it visible? Yeah, perfect. Great. Okay. So um, good morning, or rather good afternoon, everybody. And yes, as Mukesh so rightly talked about, uh, this has been an eventful budget uh, from an individual tax perspective, I should say. And yes, everything has indeed been about the new tax regime or the simplified tax regime, as we call it. Uh, and this is something that was indeed expected or has been an ask uh, from the finance minister, because while in 2021, uh, we had introduced the, the government has introduced a simplified tax regime, it had not really taken off. Uh, yes, traditionally, as Indians, we are all used to having tax incentives for various investments, for deductions for payouts like tuition fees and repayment of housing loan and so on. Uh, so, yes, um, that is something that I think psychologically we've really got used to it. So having to move to a regime without any deductions and exemptions was indeed a paradigm shift. But I think the key message the finance minister has given in today's, uh, in, in this year's budget, is that the simplified tax regime or the new tax regime is here to stay. So as you can see, and, and what I would quickly cover in half an hour, and I think about 15 minutes or 10 minutes we can keep for Q&A, uh, is what are the changes in tax rates and what are the implications? Uh, amendments to certain exemptions and reductions, talk about certain new provisions, and uh, then make maybe quickly wrap up. Uh, so let me go on to the tax rate, uh, which are, uh, as, as you can see on the screen, uh, we've, I've tried to categorize it as to what are the rates under the regular tax regime, which definitely have not undergone a change, but I put it in only for us to have an understanding of how it looks. And there are no changes, of course, so I'm not going to go by it line by line. But clearly, if you look on the right hand side, you can see what are the tax rates which were there till FI23 under the new tax regime or the simplified tax regime, and what is that that is proposed in the budget. So clearly, under the simplified tax regime, the uh, maximum amount not chargeable to tax was two and a half lakhs, which has got increased to three lakh. And after that, every three lakh, there is a change in the tax rate by 5%. Currently, the change in tax, ra tax rates was after every two and a half lakhs. And the maximum marginal rate continues to kick in at 15 lakh. But one key difference between the rates that are prevalent till FI23 to what we are going to see from FI24 onwards is that there is no 25% rate that is applicable under the new simplified tax regime. What is also interesting is that it's not only the change in tax rates that have been made by the that have been proposed by the finance minister. The basic exemption, as I called out earlier, has been increased from 2.5 to 3 lakhs. The simplified tax regime will also provide the rebate under 87A, which is now limited for taxpayers with taxable income of up to 5 lakhs to taxable income of 7 lakhs. So this clearly means that anybody with a taxable income up to 7 lakhs will have zero tax to pay because they would have a rebate which is available to them. The finance minister also has heard the masses, especially the salaried class, and extended the standard reduction which is available under the regular tax regime to the simplified tax regime as well, which means that salaried employees can have a deduction of 50,000 rupees from their total income, from their salary income to have um, uh, no a lower taxable income. And for pensioners, this amount of 15,000, which was available under the regular tax regime has also been extended. But there have been no changes in the exemptions and deductions under the regular tax regime, clearly giving a very strong message that the new tax regime is here to stay. And over a period of time, it may be expected, there has been no intent stated by the finance minister that over a period of time, we may need to stick to the new tax regime. What is also a very attractive, and I think Mukesh sir called this out as well, that for taxpayers with over five crore of income, HNIs, who were subject to a 37% of surcharge, which means that the maximum marginal rate for those over five crores was 42.74%. 
for them, the surcharge has been slashed from 37% to 27, 25%. Clearly, the maximum marginal rate is coming down to 39%. So this is something which is very attractive. Now, what do we as taxpayers, how does this impact us? What do we need to do before making a decision as to whether I go by the simplified tax regime or do I go under the regular tax regime? Maybe I would just like to make two comments here. One, the simplified tax regime now is the default tax regime, which means that you, if you want to avail the regular tax regime or the old tax regime, as we, call, as we can call it, you would need to make a choice. You would have to exercise a choice. The conditions for exercising a choice for flipping between regimes remain the same. So if I am a taxpayer without business income, I can continue to choose year on year which is the tax regime I would want to be covered under. And I would naturally need to do a math myself saying that, hey, these are the kind of investments and these are the kind of deductions I would be eligible to under the regular tax regime. And hence, individual has to take a call as to whether they would want to come under the regular tax regime or simplified tax regime. And as in the earlier um, scenario, for business uh, and profession tax, uh, taxpayers, or rather taxpayers who have income from the head um, business and profession, they would need, they would, they can make a choice, but it is only once, it can only be changed once in a lifetime. So that those provisions continue. These were there earlier. They continue. The only change is that the default now is the simplified tax regime, which means that when you look at the new tax return in all possibility, the default would be the new regime. And if you want to go to the regular tax regime, you would need to consciously make a choice, which means that you have to file your tax returns in time because if you file your returns in a delayed manner, you cannot exercise a choice other than the default option. So the default or simplified tax regime. So we need to be mindful about that. Now, I would like to go to the next slide. This is a quick snapshot of the simplified tax regime the way it has been there today versus the way it has been uh, proposed as to where are the income levels, which there where there is a tax rate change. I did call out in the earlier slide, but maybe this visual will help. So clearly up to 2.5 lakh in both the situations, it was not taxed. 2.5 to 3 lakh, we did have a maximum amount not chargeable to tax as 2.5. That is now going to 3 lakh. So clearly there is a saving for those who have uh, for anybody where the taxes, uh, tax labs are being used and you get a, a lower tax for 50,000 rupees. Similarly, for every uh, alternate line item that you see, so between 5 lakh to 6 lakh, there is a 5.2% and this is including the education source. Surcharge has not been considered for this purpose. Every alternate line item, you can see that there is a 5.2% reduction in tax rates under the simplified tax regime. So if you have been under the simplified tax regime today and you want, if you're comparing your tax payouts under the new, um, under the proposed simplified tax regime, clearly there is going to be a significant saving. What is that saving going to be? So if I am a taxpayer with income up to say seven and a half lakhs, I would have paid a tax of 39,000 under the existing simplified tax regime, which would now be zero. So clearly there is a substantial saving of 39,000 rupees per annum. For individuals with over five crores, and I'm now jumping into the other end of the spectrum, the H&Is, where today they would have been taxed at 42.74 at a maximum marginal rate, that is dipping down to 39%. Uh, and if we look at the absolute numbers, it's about 20 lakhs of tax saving at that level. Uh, clearly, it would change uh, person to person. And my um, gut feel is that even if they consider, say, the ATCs, ATDs, AT, TTA, and all of that which are available, they are more likely to be better off under the simplified tax regime. So it is a call indeed for the HNIs to move over from the regular tax regime to the simplified tax regime. Now, in what happens to those who are in between, between say seven and a half lakhs to five crores, is it is there anything that's compulsive in terms of the tax rates change 
that would move them away from the regular tax regime to the simplified tax regime? I'm not too sure. I think it is important for those who are under the regular, who are today in the regular tax regime to continue to monitor the kind of investments and save and deductions that they are claiming today to see whether there is a need or is it better off under the simplified tax regime is something that each and every individual would need to take a call. Uh, approximately, if, if even if you leave out HRA and LTA and so on, uh, under an ATC, you get 1.5 lakhs. If you have NPS employee contribution, you get an added 50,000. If you are a home loan, um, uh, if you're availed home loan, you get uh, two lakhs uh, loss available for self-occupied property as well. And so about four lakhs, if you look at it, there, there could be a likelihood that you would be better off under the regular tax regime, uh, especially if you are in the 15 lakh and above kind of income levels. So it's something it's important for us to look at. One thing that is available under the simplified tax regime and it's continued, is a tax benefit on employer contribution to NPS. That is something that was available earlier and continues to be available. So I just thought I'll share uh, some of these practical aspects. One thing that I kept hearing about the simplified, and allow me to take a sip of water. Yeah, one thing that I keep, keep hearing about uh, the comments relating to the simplified tax regime is that the government is really not encouraging individual taxpayers to continue the investments, uh, say maybe uh, the Provident Fund, the equity link savings scheme investments, LIC and so on. So is that something that to be looked on negatively is something again that, that has been a matter of debate. Um, every session that I've participated, this has been one question that has been thrown at me. And I think we need to look at things a little more pragmatically. Yes, traditionally, we as taxpayers have been provided incentives, uh, tax incentives for investments. There are, uh, like Provident Fund and so on, are really attractive uh, tax benefit schemes. The kind of um, uh, exemptions we have, Triple E scheme, a Provident Fund, for instance, at the time of contribution, you get a deduction. The employer contribution is not taxable. The accruals are not taxed at the point of withdrawal. If you met the specified conditions, then again, it's not taxable. These are very limited kind of uh, regimes that are available. The question is, should we take away some of these deductions, which today I'm getting, say, for Provident Fund, LIC contribution, and so on? And will it indeed impact the savings um, attitude of our taxpayers? Well, yes and no. I would say the way we need to look at is, We've been a country where there has traditionally the social security system is something that has been run uh, by the joint family. In as culturally, uh, we did not build up, I would say, initial in the initial years, a very strong social security system because culturally we've been supported by families throughout, unlike many other countries. And hence, in the organized sector, the Provident Fund was one of the limited. Um, social security regimes that was available and hence indeed it did require some kind of an education to employees to make sure that they did choose to contribute to such kind of formal retiral schemes. Similarly, life insurance and so on, given the lack of social security, formal social security system, it did make sense for the government to support it. Over the last years, we've seen oh, in various budgets there has been a lot of focus on the um, NPS, the National Pension Scheme. And there has been a call out in terms of pensions available for even the unorganized sector. And clearly we are, um, from a social security perspective, moving towards, a, um, what do you say, a nationally available pension regime. The schemes could be varied and they would indeed need to be varied given the demographics of uh, India as a nation. Um, we cannot have a one size fits all. And hence, I think it's time that taxpayers make their investment decisions on their own. And it need not necessarily be nudged by the tax reliefs that are tacked to it. Yes, it can be a decision that I make saying that in terms of the amount of return that I receive, I would always look at a post-tax return, but tax should not be the driving factor. I think this is one message that we are getting uh, from the government, though it's not been really called out. And this is something that I've heard over in many uh, by, um, uh, many debates. 
I would also like to touch upon what Mukesh sir touched, uh, talked about. Uh, well, is, does this mean that there is going to be a, a, a dip in this amount of small savings that we see and so on? I think some of which could possibly get compensated by the increase in limits which are provided. Uh, say, for instance, the senior citizen savings scheme, the limit has been enhanced from 15 lakh to 30 lakh. Uh, and similarly, the monthly income scheme, the limits have been increased and the Mahila Saman certificate has also been introduced. So I think there are alternate avenues for uh, uh, savings, small savings, but they are not really driven by tax reliefs. I think that's a key message that's coming. So uh, I would like to move over. Um, I know we've spent a bit of time on this. Um, I'm conscious of time. Let me go to quickly touch upon various other aspects which are available, um, which have been made. These are some of the amendments which have been proposed um, from the existing provisions. So for instance, capital gains, then there has been a sale of a long-term capital asset, which is a residential property. Um, for section 54. And if I've been selling any other long-term asset, I would possibly lean on in section 54S and invest in a residential property to get an exemption from a capital gain. In the past, this has been without a cap. Uh, this budget proposes a cap of rupees 10 crore, I think, which is a reasonable amount. So that is one of the amend amendments that has come in. Uh, taxation of insurance policies, we did have a provision relating to uh, taxing insurance policies where the premium value was more than 10% um, of the insured uh, amount. There is an added provision which has now come in, which says that in the event my aggregate premium uh, in a year is 5 lakhs and above, then um, the amount which would be received as the proceeds of the insurance claim would be taxable. The cost of the uh, insurance um, would, of course, be available as a deduction, provided it has not already been claimed as a uh, as a tax benefit. Um, to the extent it has not been claimed as a tax benefit, it can be considered as a cost, and the differential amount would be taxed. Uh, this will be available. This would be applicable only in respect of policies issued after first April 2023. Uh, the other amendment which has come in is. To clarify, I think it's more in the nature of a clarification that uh, interest on housing loan, which has been taken um, either for acquisition or for renewal, if the um, interest cost has been taken as a deduction under Section 24, it cannot be added to the cost of acquisition because then it would come in as a double benefit. So that has been something that's something that has been clarified. Now there are certain new provisions which have come in. I just couple, and I think the first one. Uh, Mukesh sir did talk about it. Um, there is a uh, scheme which has been uh, introduced and SEBI runs this. There is an FAQ issued by SEBI also in this regard, where it's possible to convert the physical gold to an electronic gold receipt. So instead of uh, having my gold, say, in biscuits or in some other form, and there are certain specified forms in which the gold would need to be handed over to the, uh, shifted to the vault manager. Uh, in which case I would get an electronic gold receipt for the value of gold. And it can be in various sub, say, say 100 grams have been given, then I could get electronic gold receipts for 10 grams each so that the, you know, the liquidity or the transfer becomes easier in smaller denominations. And the, this transfer or this conversion from gold to electronic gold receipt and vice versa would not be treated as transfer for the purpose of capital gain. So clearly, this is to encourage holding of um, a gold in electronic uh, form. Uh, and there is a say, say be directed scheme for it. Uh, the other change that has been brought in is with respect to the taxation of market-linked debentures. In the past, they were treated as long-term capital gain at 10% without indexation, where it was meeting the long-term holding criteria. Uh, going forward, this is going to be deemed to be treated as short term. So irrespective of the period of holding, it will be taxed at applicable rates at uh, under section 50AA. Uh, this is one of the change that has come in. I think there are uh, a smaller changes, which I thought it will be important to call out. Uh, taxation of gifts, there is a deeming provision that 
attached to a non a gift to a non resident exceeding 50000 will be deemed to accrue and arise in india uh, similarly even if it is to a not ordinary resident it would be deemed to accrue and arise in india so basically the change is that uh, in addition to non residents this provision will also be applicable to resident but not ordinary resident a presumptive taxation the base has been made a little more broader the presumptive taxation under 44 ad the limits have been increased in the case of income from business from 2 crores to 3 crores and in the case of uh, profession it has been increased from 50 lakhs to 75 lakhs the condition that the amount for for business that the aggregate of amounts received during the year uh, it should not in cash should not exceed 5% of the turnover or gross receipts that's there the other change is on tax collected at source uh, I, I do believe this is something that could have an impact on cash flow uh, there was uh, a provision which said that foreign remittance towards purchase of overseas stores to a program and there was no threshold limit for this was subject to a tcs of 5% for any other purpose, other than, of course, education, medical treatment, uh, repayment of education, loan, and so on. Uh, for that, there was a, a limit of 7 lakhs. And beyond that, it was subject to a TCS of 5%. This is now being changed into 20%. And in respect of the second category, that is any other purpose, now the 7 lakh limit has been taken out. So there is no li uh, limit. It is applicable for all remittances under LRS. This is something which people who are making remittances overseas may need to look at a little more in detail. I'm not really able to fathom the drive for this, the, the underlying intent behind this, um, introducing this 5% was to um, get these under the taxable radar, which I think was achieved with even a 5% TCS. I'm not too sure why it was increased to 20%, but Having said that, the rule is now 20% going forward. Leave and cashment, I think this is again something that the salaried class would welcome. Uh, the total, uh, the aggregate leave and cashment exemption that a salaried employee could avail during his or her lifetime was 3 lakh. And this has been increased uh, from 3 lakh to 25 lakh. So, of course, the uh, notification is yet to come, but this is something again which would be welcome given that. This is these limits have been set ages back. Uh, procedurally, also there are some changes which have which have come in. Um, the tax refund, which is due to an employee, where there is a reassessment pending, now there has been more teeth given to the assessing officer that the refund is not payable till the proceedings are complete. And uh, no, there would be a. Uh, I think this is practically being followed. And in any case, this has been uh, regularized in the form of a, a regular rule is what my sense is, because in practice, we have seen that the income tax authorities do uh, adjust these demands and only the net amount is paid. Again, procedurally, from a provident fund perspective, where an individual did not have a PAN, the TDS rate was 30% and it is now being made uniform because many of these would be applicable to employees uh, who are at the lower end of um, the taxable spectrum, as otherwise they would definitely have had a PAN, right? So uh, the government has done right by reducing the TDS amount to 20%, uh, marginally reducing the hardship in those cases. Uh, assessment timelines have rolled back to 12 months as against nine, nine, nine months, which was again a change which happened in the interim. And this change is applicable for proceedings which would be completed from assessment year 22-23 onward. I think this is the last one that I have. This is a TDS credit, which uh, uh, there is a procedural change that has been provided. The what the memorandum talks about is there could be situations where an individual has offered his his or her income on a cruel basis, but the TDS would have happened when the credit of the income actually happens, which means that in the year when the credit of the TDS is uh, due to be claimed, I would not have offered the income to tax in that year. So technically, am I eligible is a question that comes up. And hence, there has been a procedure that has been laid out in, in this 
budget. What it says is where there is an income which is already in, included by the taxpayer and the tax has been deducted subsequently uh, in a subsequent financial year, the SSE can make an application to the assessing officer. There is a two-year timeline which is given. So where the tax was deducted at source, um, within two years, in, I, I need to uh, make the claim. And the assessing officer will go and amend the order of assessment or intimation and allow a TDS credit. The interest period for which I am, the interest, um, the period for which I'm eligible for the interest would kick in from the date of filing of the application. So this is something that would be effective from 1st October 2023. This is against a procedural change. So I think that is it um, uh, me in terms of the content. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I yeah. was, I'm hoping I was audible. Uh, yes, saw a yes. message. It was audible? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was very perfect. Okay. So can I ask you a query, Sarsati? Yeah, please go ahead, Ardhima. So one of our attendees asked, can interest paid on housing loan above rupees 2 lakhs, which is not claimed as a deduction, be still available as cost for capital gains computation purposes? I, I had the same thing. Uh, many of us were not claiming the interest cost in the fact but apparently it looks like it is something that's available because that what the government has clarified is that uh, only if you've already claimed it which would be uh, limited to two lakhs so if i've been claiming a self-occupied property and i've been say incurring a cost of say five lakh as interest per year uh what the clarification says is only two lakh that since you've, you've claimed that is not allowable so it looks like three lakh is available uh I would. I had the same question when I read this, saying that, oh, so does this mean you can claim three lakh? That was my response as well. Great, great. Uh, another one coming up is with people more with people more opting for new regime. Will this impact mutual funds or will it not impact them? Mutual funds, insurance companies, because many of us invest mainly to save tax. So it's like an ecosystem. See, I don't think so, uh, honestly, because. And as I said, there could be some minimal impact. The only benefit that was available was under the equity link savings scheme under ATC. Uh, and this is a debate that is going on. See, it's not just the mutual funds. Does it mean that people will start, uh, stop taking insurance policy? Does it mean, mean that PF will stop contributing to public provident fund or PF? Well, I don't think so. Um, uh, yes, there could be at initial levels. And, and I've anyway been seeing a trend that the younger generation is finding the keeping of documents and submission of these to the tax authorities a pain. So I think what the government is trying to do with the simplified tax regime is sort of increase the, um, you know, protecting the tax base and at the same time, increase the ease of filing tax returns. So I think that is what it is intended. It is not really intended to discourage the savings. And in any case, the limit of 1.5 lakhs has been there for years. And I think uh, those who are at slightly higher levels of income would anyway be made making investments more than that. So I don't think this would have a direct impact. Yes. And I say, and I, as I said at the start of the session, this has been a debate that's been going on, saying that is the government discouraging savings and investment. I don't think that is the intent. The intent is that don't make tax a decision uh, factor in terms of, no, that should not be a driver. There are many who've realized that the kind of insurance policies they purchased, looking at tax benefits, did not really give them the right amount of returns. So it's important for us as investors to look at what is the return I'm getting from a scheme and then make a decision rather than say that, hey, I will invest in this because I get an ACT, ATC deduction. That's the wrong deduction. Correct. Uh, next we have, is it correct to conclude that recesses between 15 lakhs and 5 crores total income and having substantial deductions under Chapter 6A be better off to remain under old regime? Perfect. I, I agree so. So even if nothing, even if I presume that somebody with a 50 lakh income 
may not be staying in a rented house. They could have their Correct. own house and so on. They could possibly have a housing loan of two lakhs and they would possibly have an NPS of 50,000. They would have medical insurance. So I would say, yes, uh, the ones, in fact, I would say between 15 lakhs to up to 15 lakhs, there is a possibility that I may not invest so much. I would have want a higher take home. So I may not invest so much in, in, in all these ATC related deductions and so on. Uh, it's a presumption that I'm making. I would still say that everybody has to do their own math. But right. the tendency that this population would move more towards a regular tax regime is definitely high. Absolutely. I agree. Can I take two more then? Absolutely. I think there is, there is time. We can take questions. Uh, so this is very interesting. If return is not filed on time, then I have to opt for new regime only. Is that so? Yes, that's correct. Because that is one of the implications of making the simplified tax regime a default tax regime. Today, if I had to opt for the simplified tax regime, and I'm talking about the situation before the budget 2023, if I file the return belated and I have not opted for it, I would have come under the regular tax regime. Whereas now the situation is going to be flipped. Your tax return by default would be the simplified tax regime or the new tax regime. And if you want to opt for the regular tax regime, you would have to make a choice. And this choice or the option to make this choice is available only if you file the returns in a timely manner. So this is something you would need to be mindful of. Right, right. Uh, so the next one is, if I have different policies summing to rupees 5 lakhs in a particular financial year, will the matured amount be taxable or not? I was honestly hoping this question will not come. Uh, I did have this question. See, today there is no clarification available with respect to the insurance. The, the way it is worded in the proviso, it looks as if it is applicable only to that particular policy. But this provision, a similar provision was available for ULIPS earlier where the limit was two and a half. And okay. there, if you look at the related FAQ, it looks as if they are going to be adding up everything. So it's debatable. I don't know whether that FAQ is going to be applicable for this, but there seems to be an alternate view that you will have to add up all the premiums that you pay during a financial year. And if that crosses five lakh, yes, the proceeds are going to be taxable. But remember, this is applicable only in respect of new policies which come in from April 2023. Uh, and I would still like to wait for an equivalent or a similar clarification for the insurance before I jump into the conclusion. But apparently, it looks like Correct. if you read these two on par, uh, what the question is a relevant one. Okay. So since we have five more minutes more, let's take a few more. I think the personal taxation is one such hot topic. Um, so next is employees do speculative transactions, FNOs, and uh, those income report are reported under business head. Correct. So that means they can't shift every year between old and new now? They cannot. So if somebody has got an income under the heads business and gain, and this is not something that's come in from the budget 2023, this is existing under when the simplified tax regime was introduced itself, this was there, that they can only move out once. So that is clear, irrespective of if they cannot do a financial year to year flipping in, flipping out. They cannot do that. Okay. And this standard deduction of 50,000, which is uh, very hot now, which is under the new regime, is only open for salary and pensioners or do we uh, seek to have more clarity on it that it would be for all the... Standard deduction has always been against the salaried income. Correct. For the others, anyway, the maximum amount not chargeable to tax is there. And for right. those who have income, say, from consultancy or business and so on, you can always deduct the related expenses. The Correct. concept of standard deduction was has always been introduced so that there is no gen concept of deduction of expense for a salaried class. So say I travel to my office and I'm incurring my expense for that. I don't really have or uh, no, I'm, I'm incurring related expenses uh, um, relating to my office work. I don't have a specific deduction that is permissible. I'm always taxed on a gross basis on the salary income. And hence the concept of standard deduction has come in. So that's available for salaried class. And, and for pensioners, it was 15,000. That's correct. Absolutely. Uh, then I think last one to go. What is the proper amendment regarding accommodation purposes? 
uh, accommodation per quest set, I'm, I'm just trying to look at it. Is it the house property one? Um, let me just pull it out. Uh, yeah. The WASA amendment on section 17, uh, two. I think there is some rule expected which will, um, I don't remember it offhand, um, sorry, but I could respond to that if the question is you no, know, a little more clear. Um, I'm happy to take it offline. Perfect, perfect. Great. So thank you so much, sir. So it was a valuable session and I think this is such a relevant topic for everyone. It will definitely benefit a lot of individuals. Thank you so much. My pleasure and always a privilege to be presenting at the attachment session. Thank you so much. We had a great time having you. Here. Following an informative session on personal taxation, next we will have a session on capital gains presented by Subira Agarwal, partner, Grant Horton Bharat. Subira has 17 plus years of experience in mergers, acquisition, trust structuring, corporate restructuring, capital restructuring, due diligence, and cross border transactions inbound and outbound. She specializes in corporate restructurings and promote uh, rationalization from a tax and regulatory perspective. She is active in panel discussions and tax seminars conducted by varied professional institutions, etc. Greetings, Subira. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Ridhima. It's a pleasure meeting you on online. Great, great. So the session is all yours now. I don't have the right to share the screen, Ridhima. Just one second. I think you can share it now. Yes, I can. Just give oh. me a minute. Uh, my screen is visible yes yes uh please go to the slide sh show more and then yeah I, i'll do that uh shall i begin correct yeah please yeah. uh hello everybody it's a pleasure meeting everybody online uh, and I hope, and I have been attending the past two sessions. They have been very knowledgeable. Uh, I mean, I hope I'm able to do justice to the topic which has been given to me. Uh, so we actually had been expecting a philanthropy of changes in the capital game regime, because as we are all aware, there are, you know, uh, there are multiple capital gains tax rates applicable. There are uh, different classes of assets. There's different classes of period of holding provided because of which we had always, I mean, there was a lot of news also on this, that probably in this budget, uh, they will simplify the capital gain tax regime. So overall, that has not happened. However, there are some critical changes which have come in the capital gain tax implications, which I am trying to cover in this session. One most critical one, of my, one which is being talked about most is the taxability of uh, market-linked debentures. So what are market linked debentures? So market linked debentures, if I talked about, you know, there are two aspects to market linked debentures. The principal part of the market linked debenture is like a debt. Whereas the return is linked to either the market indices or some particular security or to gold, any listed security. So what happens is that in a market linked debentures, you have, you have uh, debentures or you have MLDs where the principal is secured, and there are ones in which the principal is also not secured. So if the principal is secured and the return is linked to say the uh, Nifty index, then, and say the life of the MLT is 10 months, then you get a 10% return on it. So what happens is if you've bought a market link debenture of say 10 lakhs, after 10 months, you get back the 10 lakhs plus the 10% interest on a cumulative basis. 
you don't get it on a month to month basis but you get the return when the redemption comes through so what used to happen is that since my principal is secure and generally what the expectation was or they were structured in a manner that the interest is also secured if in the interim period the mld was being sold how the holder of the mld was treating the return so he will get say after 5 months he is selling the mld a 1 lakh principal uh, sorry a 10 lakh prim- principal amount plus a 50000 he is able to sell for 10 lakh 50000 50000 actually is an interest accumulation but it was treated as long term capital gain and since these were listed there was a tax implication on 10% this budget is now what it is saying that this security is like is in the nature of a derivative and therefore irrespective of your period of holding the entire return should be taxed at the rate of the short term capital gain in fact they have given a very specific definition of market linked debentures now which says it's a security having underlying principal component in the form of a debt security and the return is linked to a market returns or underlying securities or indices or any other kind of assets so this is more like i would say that probably the understanding was always this but it was being interpreted in a different manner the interest was being treated as a capital gain and people were paying uh, tax as a capital gain sorry as uh, as capital gain now they have clarified that irrespective of your period of holding you you will be subject to short term capital gain on that instrument so this is specifically going to uh, affect the hnis who used to make a lot of investments through mlds and this will lead to them basically rehashing their uh, investment plans the next uh, amendment which i would like to uh, bring to notice is the one relating to edrs so sebi is the regulatory body as ta- as far as the gold exchange is concerned and they have set up a framework for uh, spot trading the bsc came out with the egrs in october 2022 now so the framework is set but if there are not requisite changes or requisite uh, uh, provisions for making the conversion of hard gold into egr a tax exempt transaction nobody would go for it and the entire objective around egrs was that the gold the, that the people should stop ha- stop kind of hoarding gold and it should come into the market economy and so the government has now brought about certain changes as far as egrs is concerned and what they are basically saying is if you convert gold into an egr then you will have no tax implications on the conversion and the period of holding of the egr would run from the period when you had bought the gold and similarly the cost of acquisition of the egr would be the same as that of the gold and vice versa or it is true so this is a good change in a way that you know in india there is a lot of uh, mentality or uh, or you know people kind of buy gold a lot so this could be an alternate form of investment rather than investing in hard gold it is better to invest in egrs which then kind of adds to the economic progress of the country as well this is again another change which is uh, affecting the hnis predominantly so under 54 and 54f earlier there was no threshold on the quantum of uh, monetary threshold on the quantum of exemption which, which you were getting now they have said that the maximum capital gain benefit that you can get is 10 crores see my personal view on this is in india you know in india is a very big country and in each state you know the property dynamics are very different and therefore maybe this threshold of 10 crores could have been linked to factors such as whether the investor is from an ncr region or a non ncr region or whether he is from an a metro or a non metro because the cost of properties is very different 
now in today's time if a uh, if an entrepreneur is making a significant divestment if suppose he is selling off his business and the, he wants to do some tax planning around his earnings from the divestment a 10 crore threshold would not be very attractive for him and just to bring parity i really feel that they should have linked it to the place where the investment is being made and what are the usual property rates in those uh, areas basically the next change is more like a clarificatory change where it really says that in case of intangible assets which are self generated the cost of acquisition as well as the cost of improvement will be taken as nil so when we are calculating capital gain on any asset the factors that we need for calculation of capital gain are like date of acquisition cost of acquisition consideration date of transfer and in the supreme court in the case of bc shrinivasan had held that if the cost of acquisition is not known then the computation mechanism fails this change will put to rest that argument and now even if the now in a way the cost of acquisition has been provided by the law that it is nil so we can't take the position that the computation mechanism is failing in case of self generated intangible assets as far as borrowed capital is concerned what was presently some individuals how they were doing is that if there is an interest on borrowed capital they were claiming it as a deduction under section 24 also when they were computing their income from house property and then that interest was also being added to the cost of acquisition and cost of uh, improvement at the time of sale of property so in a way there was a double benefit in that through this change where now the, the government is saying that if you've claimed an interest as a deduction under 24 you cannot claim it while computing capital gain so this is this is kind of a rectification which they have brought about that it disables a person to claim an exemption under two provisions of law and i think so that's always the intent of law that for the same expense you can't uh, get a double benefit the next one again is uh, a significant change where it says that if there is a capital gain so what was happening till now is that when a person was calculating capital gain on a land or building which has been transferred under a under a jda the sale consideration was equal to the stamp duty value of the property plus the cash consideration so the position which people used to take was that if they are getting Uh, consideration over and above the stamp duty value in the form of say a bank transfer so that they were not considering while calculating the uh, capital gain now the government is saying that the total amount received whether it is in form of check cash or any other mode that has to be taken into consideration while calculating capital gain so the next change is with regards to transfer of assets uh, from an overseas fund to a fund in india this change is very simple where only the sunset date has been shifted from march 23 to march 25 the next change is not really a change under the capital gain regime but a new section 115 bae has been introduced for corporate uh, uh, cooperative societies which undertake manufacturing activities various tax rates 15% 22% has been signif- uh, has been specified that if the cooperative society is engaged in manufacturing activity they will be subject to 15% or else they will be subject to 22% further it is mentioned that if the cooperative society is making making short term capital gain out of non depreciable assets then they will be subject to 22% capital gains tax this is all for my side as far as capital gain uh, provisions are concerned however you know i would uh, really like to put my view on a few things like we were talking about the capital gains tax regime which we were expecting that there will be some simplification and which has not happened uh, this is something i think so should have happened because it becomes it it, it is it is kind of a very difficult scenario for the ssc and especially for the layman they they kind of become dependent on the professionals only to do their own tax calculations then the tds structure the tcs and the tds regime which we have we have 194q on one hand and 206c on the other hand 
So again, there were, we were expecting some kind of a rationalization. Similarly, on redemption of preference shares, technically speaking, redemption of preference shares is a capital gain event, but there has been questions around whether 115 QA also becomes applicable on redemption of preference shares, uh, because there is no clarity around that. Then there is there, the RBI and the MCA has allowed cross-border transactions, both inbound and outbound, but the tax still does not talk about the tax implications on an outbound merger or demerger. So there is a lot to be done, uh, a significant budget this time, a very pragmatic budget, and they have brought about significant changes also. But I think so there is much more to be done as far as the capital gain regime is concerned. Rizama, that's all from my side. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to take that. Yes, we do have some questions coming. Thank you, Sugira. Yeah. Investment made in residential property above 10 crores on sale of shares, house, etc. How will it be taxed? LTCG or STCG? Investment made in residential property. Correct. Right. So, uh, see, 54 or 54F was providing that you can invest in residential property if you've made a capital gain on some other form of asset. So, uh, we will have to see that uh, from where the capital gain is being earned. So, okay. it, is, it does not depend upon where you are investing. It, we have to see the source of capital gain. So, if it is shares, it's, suppose if it is unlisted shares, and you've been holding them for more than 24 months, then it becomes long-term capital gain. Right. Or else if it is listed, it becomes 10, uh, it becomes 10%, depending on your period of holding and the class of assets. 54F, 54F, uh, 54F and 54 are just enablers to, uh, to enable you to do some tax planning. And they, that has been restricted now. Okay, okay, got it. So whether 10 crore capital gain limit is for one property in lifetime of a CC or all cumulative capital gain of all properties sold during the span of a CC? I think so it's a, a, yeah, I, I think so. It's a, uh, it's a one-time benefit which the government has given. And in fact, you know, it depends upon the number of properties which you are presently holding. According to 54F, you can at max hold two properties. So if you have already bought two properties, you cannot go and invest in a third property to take the benefit of 54F. Correct. Next query, which we have once again. Oh. What would be the valuation of brand in case of sale of brand from point of view of income tax? <laughs> it's that's a that's a very subjective question generally you know the value of brand is linked to the value of business so brand itself uh, is not i mean there is no parameter provided in the income tax act as to how a brand will be valued and in fact it has been a subject of litigation also because what happens is especially in cross-border transactions if you transfer brand from india to overseas even transfer pricing becomes applicable so right. generally general principle is that the value of brand should be equivalent to the value of business it represents correct but it is a tricky one because, you know, you do DCF valuations five years later, your DCF valuations may not hold good. So, so, so it's a tricky thing, basically. So, uh, Suvida, what do you think is the reason behind introducing this 10 crore limit under Section 54 and 54F? See, they are saying that the logic given in the memorandum is that it was to promote the housing sector. And since that is no longer a requirement, they have they are withdrawing this uh, uh, this exemption. But I think so. What they are really doing is that all the exemption provisions they are trying to simplify the tax regime, and that is why the threshold the thrust thrust is now more on the new tax regime than the old tax regime where you were able to claim all these tax exemptions. So it, the, the, the thrust is on simplification and therefore slowly and slowly they are reducing the exemptions basically. Right. Moving on to our next query. Uh, so uh, when land is acquired by government and they issue TDR, 
is it a case that cost of tdr is nil mm, and this i'll have to check this i'll have to check okay and uh, next another query which we from our attendee is so there is no concept of ltcg in mld irrespective of period of holding yes nothing they have done all, done away with all together they okay. have not even mentioned a period of holding they are saying any gain short term capital gain interesting any uh, thoughts on impact of sale of self generated assets based in patents etc and capital gain arising on the same so now since they have clarified that self generated assets intangible assets the value is nil and principally that is the position we used to take unless and until you become very aggressive and you say that since there is no cost uh, therefore there will be no tax implication because the computation mechanism was failing but conservatively the position was always this that if it is a self generated asset then the right. cost is nil so i think so this is the correct position which is now been clarified correct right due for a long time right due for a long time yes this has been a subject because the moment you take an aggressive position uh, you are bound to get into a litigation scenario right and it have been a like there were bundle of litigations pending out of it right yes definitely so another intangible asset question coming is how would you compute valuation of intangible assets in case of slump sale so again i mean depends upon what the intangible asset is you know if it is uh, if it is an ipr on which you have spent uh, uh, funds on suppose there is some research which you have done so there could be cost associated with it if it is right. simple brand there could have been marketing expenses so depends upon what has been capitalized but again that all will go in your books whether you will be able to claim it in tax is a question mark now okay okay right this is also like it it's it will take time to analyze i think when the provisions are more clear yes. and practiced right right uh, i think another very hot question of 10 crore is can exemption of rupees 10 crore each be claimed in both provisions of section 54 and 54f or they should be clubbed no no they should be clubbed you cannot uh, claim the same benefit twice again or split it even it doesn't provides that way okay okay we we do have time sure we can go for another queries right yeah yeah so with the new tax on mlds be applicable for mld sold before 1st april 2024 or april 23 i think so it is effective from the next uh, assessment year so it should be applicable from 1st april 23 i'll have to check that but i think so that's that's the intent okay uh, so savita while we wait for more queries on uh, to come can i ask few question that what were actually your expectations for the capital gains because yeah. india is a growing economy now and especially virtual digital asset i think was some, one such thing that more clarification required right so so that's that's true and you know in the capital gain regime if you see today it's become pretty complicated now so if you see if if it is a non resident who is selling even unlisted shares they are subject to 10% tax whereas a resident is subject to 20% tax correct so this itself is an anomaly that you giving a benefit to a non resident it is basically okay the objective is to attract investment from overseas but from a domestic player perspective and people used to you know plan around it they would want to shift residency for a particular year so you are kind of you know encouraging people to uh, take steps to step to do a tax planning which is not the intent of the law Okay. So, so, so that was one angle, I think. So, the tax rate harmonization is something which was really uh, expected. I mean, right. if you see in the this budget, the main critical not not capital gain, but the fifty six seven B implication, which they have extended it to uh, fundraise from overseas as well. If you see, they have said that it any investment coming from overseas cannot be above the 5627b value which is basically the dcf value whereas fema talks about that the lower threshold threshold is 5627b which is dcf value 
So if okay. a company is raising funds from overseas at a value above its DCF value, it would mean that it will become taxable under 56. So right. on what I mean, this becomes a discouragement for the companies to raise funds from overseas at higher values. Absolutely. So that has created a kind of anomaly. We we expect that before the bill gets approved in the parliament, maybe there will be some clarification on that. Yeah, that is, I think, is very much required. Yeah. Any other expectations which you were thinking was very relevant? So like if you see the social stock exchange has been now uh, uh, being considered, in fact, in an in-principle approval has been given to the NSC and the BSC. So we were expecting some changes, some uh, clarifications with regard to ATG will come in that, that any investments which you made through a social stock exchange that would be considered to be an investment under ATG. But the budget was totally silent on it. On one hand, you are promoting a social stock exchange. And on the other hand, there is no clarification in the tax laws. Right. Similarly, as I mentioned, that a cross-border transaction, it has been approved for some number of years now. But there has Correct. been no clarification on outbound cross-border mergers. Similarly, if you see 4713B, which talks about conversion of a partnership into a company, even at a partner level, there is an exchange because the partner gives up his partnership interest in the partnership firm and gets the shares of the company. But the law is silent on it. So there That's are still a long way to go. There's a, still a long way to go. Absolutely. So while we were discussing a few points, we do have some queries coming in. Sure. Oh. Uh, Will, I don't know if uh, this suits your uh, segment here. Will the new angel tax applicability for non-resident investors affect the startup sector negatively? Yes, it does. That's the precise point which I was making. Like suppose if the DCF value of some company is say 1000 rupees per share. Now what 5627B is saying that the moment you raise above 1000 rupees, mm. you become taxable under the Indian law. That means even under FEMA, though FEMA allows you to raise beyond 1,000, under FEMA, 1,000 is the lower benchmark. Right. Right. So it becomes a discouraging factor for the startups that they will they will think twice before raising above 1,000 rupees, which is their DCF value, because they will know there will be an immediate tax outflow from them. So the negotiations will change now. When a fundraise is being done from overseas and which is going to be above DCF, the tax factor will have to be taken into consideration that what would be the net proceeds in the hands of the uh, uh, the fundraiser. Absolutely right. Right. Oh, then, will this 10 crore limit which we were discussing will apply on sale of depreciable assets? I don't think so. I don't think so. It talks about... Uh, I, uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Next is, if I transfer under construct property, under which section I would get exemption? Section 54 or 54F? It's residential property they're talking about. So then 54, I think so. The under construction one. Okay. Again, I'll have to check this. Yeah, because I think there's a controversy going on whether it's a proper residential property because since the possession certificate yes. is not good. So, there. I mean, we could go because 54F covers all kinds of assets. So, probably 54F could be a safer bet than... The 54. safest one would be that, yeah. right? Yeah. And if you have to take a liberal approach, you will go to section 54. Yes. Correct. Next, we have here. Will the restriction of double deduction of interest and taking as a part of cost of acquisition apply to builders as well? It should be. It should be at par. But, it, you know, it talks about income from house property. A builder would not be uh, uh, submitting his income under house property. For him, it will be PGBP. So, right. uh, strictly speaking, this amendment is not becoming applicable to them. So, right. I mean, and in case of builders... I mean, yes, I mean, there could be a situation similar in that, that uh, dynamics as well. Absolutely. So coming up, next question is, let's see. 
So if I sell, say, five residential units and invest in one property of more than 10 crore, am I not eligible to apportion and claim from all sales? I'll have to check whether 54 says one residential property sold or is it reading uh, for multiple residential properties? Because, you know, 54, they have just put a limit on 10 crores. So I, I mean, seems logical that I may have sold two properties and the proceeds I'm investing in one. Uh, but we'll have to check whether it talks about sale of one property and reinvestment or it allows you multiple. Right. Next is, if the new property bought under section 54 or 54F is more than 10 crore by more owners, the cost per head has to be considered? Yes. It is uh, per, uh, per joint owner, basically, it has to be considered. Per joint owner? Yes. So I think people can have a good time planning it on this perspective then. Yeah, I mean, uh, we had uh, we had kind of uh, opined it on this also in the past. Achha, uh, okay. Where wife, husband are owners, do I get the benefit on a per owner basis? So hmm. yes, it, it, you get the benefit on a per owner basis. Oh, this is I think uh, for every listener, it's a route for a safe tax planning deal. <laughs> Uh, then one more, please. Uh, disallowance of interest as a cost of property is prospective in nature. Prospective in nature, I think so. Again, this is applicable from 1st April 23 only, financial year. So, again, I'll, I'll have to check this. I think this is actually a very uh, relevant topic. We do have more queries coming in. So Harish asked, Madam, full amount invested in property after sale, but construction not completed before three years. What is the position? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's not only the budget queries are coming in, I think general queries are too coming in. <laughs> this, is, this is like taking a position. <laughs> Because it says three years, so you are extending three years beyond three years. <laughs> Not the right platform to advise, I think. <laughs> um, then next is uh, capital gain has to be computed for each sale and hence the exemption is also to be claimed for each sale, correct? Yeah. So what's the question here? One thing. <laughs> I think meanwhile I get the full question. There's another one coming. So you have your views on claim with respect to cost of acquisition with a with interest on self-occupied house property, which has not been allowed under the income from house property. So nice. That's fine. That that should be fine. If you have not claimed it under income from house property, then you can claim it as part of cost of acquisition or cost of improvement. Okay. And I think we do have some time. Let's wait uh, for one more query to come in. Meanwhile, I had a personal uh, question. What is that one amendment brought in this budget, which is actually a very welcome change, which you thought is very, was very much needed? So the what was very much needed has not come in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> what has come, but what is the... Yeah, but if you see, you know, general trend in the budget, Slowly and slowly, one, they are fading off all the exemptions. Okay. Right. Secondly, if you see the changes which come are more uh, draconian for the HNIs. So somewhat like a Robin Hood scenario is kind of prevailing. And like if you see this MLD change or the 54F change, these are all, you know, these kind of cut down the tax planning avenues for the HNIs. We have been, you know, over the years, at least now seven, eight years, we've been hearing the hearing a buzz in the news saying estate duty will come back, inheritance tax will come back. That is not coming back. Okay. Yeah. Right. But through this means they are trying to bring around parity that as far as any specific benefits available to the HNIs that are slowly and slowly getting cut off. That is that is one thing. The welcome changes, you know, in India, if you see that this EGR change, if I if I talk about the capital gain regime only, in India, people from ages, you know, we we traditionally have that mindset of hoarding gold, 
and you know gold kept in lockers or at house it's it's useless in a way right. it is not contributing to the progress of the country so this change or this concept of egr and particularly amongst the young generations now i think so they would see it as a welcome change and you know they have they have provided it both ways you you mm. have the option of converting egr back to gold also it's not you are stuck with egr only so the exemption has been provided both ways so that way that way i think so it's a good change uh, coming out in the budget but it's a slow understanding process i think for the tax bill it is very slow understanding even you know traditionally accepting it is also going to be not so easy ah uh, right this yeah. is what i was thinking because we we uh, the gold thing is not only an investment but a status symbol also yes yes ha but so, that's why i am saying that if they have allowed the change both ways from gold to egr egr to gold so if there is ever a need so that is also there is also a probability of converting it back to gold also right okay perfectly right so uh, i think uh, one questions here any other questions while uh, we move on to the next session i request everyone if there are any other question please so i think uh, as you said for the exemption part that uh, the finance minister is actually moving away or uh, giving away with the all the exemption i think the idea is clear they have said it again and again that we need to simplify the tax we need to simplify the tax yes it any head there are enormous exemption and as we, i see we uh, are so moving towards a digitalization era okay so there will be a scenario where the tax filings become so simple that everybody just logs on to the income tax site fills his income and he is done with it right so then we are the chartered accountant should <laughs> worry about it no worries our need will not finish <laughs> that is that is true because the in the path of simplifying it complexities are still coming that is also there you know and then rather than just uh, you know doing the uh, uh, focusing on this kind of work where you are filing tax returns there is a wider avenue to right. to the economy at large in various other ways so right. so i don't think so uh, i mean if i see i have never in my life helped a client file his returns i have always been an mna guy so i mean advisory is something very crucial for any transaction right next uh, one question here has come in just one second. how does india's capital gain tax regime compare with other developed economies of the world today <laughs> this is very so, interesting no no so it's an interesting question and that is what we keep kind of happening if i leave around us us has a very complicated tax regime in total okay if you leave that out overseas generally i have seen capital gain is considered part of your income business income only there is no okay. separate rate like if you see singapore there is a 7% 17% rate on your business income 17% rate will be applicable to capital gain also if capital gain becomes taxable out there so there there are various parameters which have to be tested to see whether capital gain is exempt from taxation in singapore or whether it is taxable so that's a different scenario but worldwide if you see in most of the countries capital gain is generally considered a part of your overall income and the same corporate income tax rate becomes applicable to it right the scenario which we have in india where there are multiple rates multiple period of holding multiple classes of assets this is this Sorry? is not there overseas uh, i forwarded to you na just now the mail yes friends yeah so sorry yeah absolutely right i think this is uh, pretty much correct Before, in fact, in a number of countries, capital gain is an exempt, uh, right? Asset, basically, but I think with the people uh, going to more tax avenues like Dubai coming with taxation, yes. So yeah, I mean, uh, the the thought process is worldwide fifteen percent would become the basic tax rate. Absolutely. So so then when it becomes fifty percent, then it is like everybody is at par. Hmm. Uh, dubai is already coming up but again you know dubai is coming up with a 9% tax from june or july in this year right. but uh, it's still not applicable on capital gain 
So, do you think that India is still, uh, as we can say, a strong investment asking oh, yes. country? Oh, yes. <laughs> Taxation is not so much of a determining factor for inbound investment. Yes, if they could have simplified, it would have been an additional bonus and encouragement for the investors. But uh, that is not, it's the economy in general, the progress in the economy, which is the attraction factor for uh, FDI flow into the country. Perfect. I think that is what uh, solidly stands now with yes. so many countries having, I'll not use the word recession, but an economic backdrop right now. India is an attractive marketplace still, even after with all the complexities, right? Yes, yes, definitely. Great, great. So one last question uh, we have, as you said about the conversion of gold, can the scheme of conversion of gold bonds vice versa be equated to preference shares to equity vice versa? Preference shares to equity is like a conversion. So that is not taxable at the time of conversion. Yeah, it's the, it's the same thing, but not really a comparable kind of thing. So principle is the same, basically. So they can but understand. You know, yeah, but you know, you can convert preference into equity, but not equity into preference. Hmm. But that and, is not there. Yes, that is there. Hmm. In the EGR scenario, it is both ways. Right, exactly. Yeah, but the basic principle is the same. Hmm. On the state, on the control part, or on the value part. Yeah, the conversion is tax exempt. The cost of acquisition period of holding gets grandfathered. So that principle is is the same. The same, absolutely. So that was, I think, very engaging, and it was very nice to have an interactive session with you. Uh, Thanks a lot. I was not expecting so many questions coming in. It was very <laughs> no, no, there's there's not much uh, changes in the capital gain chapter. So I couldn't have extended it for 45 minutes. But uh, it was really great participating in uh, in this webinar. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It was it was a pleasure having you. Thanks a lot, Rizman. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. So let us now progress to our fourth session or corporate taxation. To take this forward, we have Ian Dwaraknath, partner of Pricewaterhouse. Dwarak leads the corporate and international tax practice and who has over 23 years of experience in advising clients on international taxation and transfer pricing across various industries. He has expertise in advising multinational companies on Indian acquisition and operations, including tax incentives, contracts, IP arrangements, and tax optimization strategies. He has a strong track record leading cross-border teams on complex projects such as business restructuring, investment restructuring, and value chain analysis. Alongside him is Tapan Gupta, partner at Price Waterhouse. Tapan is a partner in the TRS line of service, working in corporate and international tax and merger and acquisition practices. With over 20 years of experience in corporate tax, he has extensive expertise in transfer pricing and MLA. He has advised numerous domestic and multinational companies on tax matters in India and abroad. A cordial welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the session is now yours to lead. Please take it forward. Thank you very much, Ridhima. And good afternoon to everyone. I hope you're able to hear me clearly. Yeah, yes. Great. So I think as the this slide, uh, Dorak. Yeah, sure, Tapan. Thank you. So as as the previous speaker was saying, uh, she was struggling to extend the session to forty five minutes because of very few changes. I think in general, the reaction from the community has been that the budget has represented stability more than anything else, and the number of changes are a few uh, and not too many. Are you able uh, to see? Uh, I think you'll have to switch to the slides, Tapan. I'm able to see the screen, not the slides. One second. Sure. I'm not able to see myself, actually. Okay, let me just see if I can do it. Uh, do you want to just stop sharing? And I'll just yeah. see if I can share my screen. Yeah. I hope you can see my screen. 
Yeah, I can see. Thank, okay, thank wonderful. You. So I'll I'll control the slides, Tavan. No problem. Yeah. So so as I was saying, I think the the over overarching uh, message from the budget has been one more of stability and continuity. Um, and if you listen to the finance minister's speech on the first of February, there were four broad themes that she set out. Uh, the first was continuity and stability. The second was to promote entrepreneurship. The third was to widen the tax base and provide certainty to taxpayers. And the fourth was to focus on the compliance aspects. Now, when you when you just take a step back, let's try to understand what the government's thinking has been. For any investor, whether it's a domestic investor or a foreign investor, perhaps the most important thing that they look at is for stability. And that is not only in the taxing system, but also in the political system um, that exists and the economic uh, structures that exist within the society. And they look for certainty. And with that view in mind, uh, there has been no change in the tax rates that have been proposed in this year, which is a sign of the stability that the government wants to put. Similarly, there has been a great emphasis on rationalizing several laws and reducing the overall compliance burdens of taxpayers. That is not necessarily limited to taxation, but across various statutes which would apply to corporations which are operating in India. From an entrepreneurship standpoint, there was a recognition that startups continue to be a very important um, part of our economy and our growth. There have been some amendments which we will talk about, uh, some of them which help startups, some of them which may not help startups that much. Uh, there has been an impetus for MSMEs by ensuring that their cash flow is bettered through the 43B amendments, which allow for deductions only on actual payment basis and the concessional rate of 15%, which has been extended to cooperating cooperative societies which are formed. In terms of clarity, which has been provided, there are several areas which require clarification, which taxpayers for, had, had asked for. Uh, one was in respect of market-linked debentures to bring that in line with equities, uh, the cost of acquisition or improvement for self-generated intangible assets, and there has been clarification which has been issued in regard to that in the budget proposals. Treatment for online gaming is something which has been introduced. Last year, it was the treatment of VDAs. I think this year, recognizing that online gaming is the next thing which has caught on, uh, the government has brought in clarity on that. There has been clarity which has been provided with regard to 194 R and Section 28, in the aspect of whether cash benefits can be treated as taxable income as well, requiring deduction, and also in the context of business trusts. And we will discuss all these in, in greater detail as we go through this presentation. From a compliance standpoint, the appointment of 100 new joint commissioners to help with the disposal of appeals is definitely a very strong, positive message that the government has sought to put forward. Uh, they've increased the threshold for small businesses and professionals for presumptive taxation, which is again a good move. They, they have brought in some amendments to Section 10 AA, which bring it in line with the old Section 10A in order to ensure that certain conditions are met for taxpayers to claim those benefits. They've also empowered the revenue to carry out inventory valuations or to request for inventory valuations in the course of assessment proceedings. Some of the timelines uh, for assessments have been rationalized. And finally, um, as you would have already heard, the postal income tax regime has, has been liberalized to some extent. So overall, it does appear that the government is serious about sending a very strong message to investors, which is focused on stability and continuity, on providing clarity and certainty to them, and at the same time, ensuring that compliance aspects are met. So with that, maybe I will, I will pass it on to Tapan to take us through some of the amendments in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you, Devarat. So as Dorok mentioned, obviously there were quite a few changes, etc., which are there. But uh, what we will do is that we'll cover uh, some of the key changes uh, which we thought would be relevant. Uh, so I'll start with uh, with with the same theme that Dorok mentioned, which is promoting entrepreneurship. And the first and the first thing that is there is on the startup taxation. So what happens generally in a in a normal scenario, if if let's say there is a loss in a company in year one. And uh, and there's a profit in let's say year three, and uh, uh, there's a requirement to brought forward this loss and adjust that loss against the profit. 
that is possible only if you, if you the shareholding the uh, the uh, continues at 51% at the year in the end of the year in which the loss was incurred and in the year when you are trying to set off that loss now there is an exception to that uh, from a startup perspective is that this condition is relaxed in in the case of startup is that even if there is a change in shareholding uh, beyond 51% for the first seven years, then uh, still you are able to do the set off. Now this seven years has been extended to 10 years now. So within the within 10 years period, even if there's a change in shareholding beyond 51% voting right, still the carry forward of loss and set off would be permissible. The only thing that needs to be uh, uh, considered is that uh, the shareholding should continue throughout the period, which means that the shareholders who were holding shares uh, with voting rights should continue to be the shareholders in the year in which the set off uh, is being taken for the losses. So the change is that from seven years, it has been extended to 10 years now. So within the 10 years period, that benefit can be availed. Uh, the second thing which has happened is that for the purpose of of taking the tax exemption under ATIAC, a startup was required. Uh, the startup was required to basically incorporate before 31st March 2023. That has been extended for one more year. Now, if the startup is uh, registered incorporated before 31st March 2024, the benefit of ATIAC, which is basically tax holiday for a period of three years out of 10 years, would be eligible. Second is on uh, the MSME front. Uh, it's not MSME per se, it is only micro and small, not medium enterprises. So for the purpose of uh, uh, payment to micro and small enterprises, that has been covered under 43B now. So within the time limit provided under the MSME Development Act, which basically states a default period of 10 days, unless you negotiate a separate term, credit term, which cannot be beyond 45 days. So if the payment is within that period, then it will be allowed. If it is not within that period, then the deduction will be allowed only on payment basis. So uh, take an example, let's say as of 31st March, uh, there's a provision which has been made. And, uh, and as per the negotiated term, the payment has to be made within 30 days. So even if the payment is made within 30th April, the deduction will be allowed for the for the previous year ending 31st March. But if it is paid beyond 30th April, then the deduction would be allowed only in subsequent year. So uh, in 2019, there was uh, uh, for the purpose of uh, companies who are engaged, who start up a new manufacturing entity, uh, there was a section which was introduced, section 115 BAB, which basically stated that if there's a new company which has been set up uh, after 1st of October 2019 and uh, before 31st March 2024, then they would be able to get a concessional tax rate of 15%. Okay. Now, this was only there limited to companies. Now, this has been extended to uh, cooperative societies as well. So any cooperative society which is set up after 31st March 2023 and starts operation before 31st March 2024 would be able to get this 15% uh, concessional tax rate. And all the conditions which are there for those new companies, exactly this section, uh, which, is, which has been introduced, 115 BAE, exact same uh, conditions apply, which means that it is only it should only be into manufacturing there should be no other operations incidental income if any will be liable to 22 percent tax without deduction related party transaction if any would have to be arm's length if there is if the transaction is beyond arm's length that the differential amount will be subject to 30 percent tax and amt provision like in in companies you do not have mat for 115 bab similarly for uh, corporate societies, you, there won't be any AMT once they uh, opt for this 115 BAE deduction uh, concessional rate. Yeah. 
Now, from a uh, tax certainty and widening of tax base perspective, there have been quite a few changes which is there. I'll, I'll uh, cover that one by one. Uh, first is with respect to market link debentures. Now, what was happening is that with respect to market link debentures, which are listed in a stock exchange, uh, any transfer, any gain arising out of that market link debentures, if it was held for more than one year, it was considered as long term capital gain and subject to tax at the rate of 10%. So there was the government felt that there was a lot of leverage happening, which the income, which probably would have been subject to tax at normal rate uh, uh, as interest is basically getting a beneficial rate of 10% because of this long term capital gains uh, position. So the change which is which has been proposed is that the new section has been introduced 50 AA, and it has been proposed that any uh, amount which is received on account of transfer or redemption of market link debentures uh, uh, will be subject to a short term will be treated as a short term capital gain and would be subject to a normal tax rate. Uh, the second thing uh, which has happened is that with respect to again uh, listed securities, uh, section 193 provides for a withholding tax of 10%, but for listed securities, this there was a carve out or exemption which was provided for this withholding tax. Now that exemption has been withdrawn. So any interest which is paid for listed securities like debentures, bonds, etc., will be subject to section 193 and a withholding tax would apply. There's a change with respect to the treatment of uh, in respect of transfer of intangible assets. As you would know that uh, more, many of the intangible assets in the nature of goodwill, right to carry business, etc., uh, are basically, as per Section 55, it's mentioned that the cost of acquisition would be nil or the cost of improvement for those assets would be nil. But beyond that, also, there were various other intangible assets which were not covered under Section 55, were not defined uh, that the cost would be nil. Uh, people were taking positions that uh, because the cost cannot be determined uh, cannot be determined for those and it is not provided under section 55 what is the cost and therefore uh, taking the benefit of the supreme court ruling in bc Srinivasa seti uh, it say that the capital gain cannot be computed and therefore uh, there cannot be any tax so in order to overcome that now what has been provided that if there is for any intangible asset or other right etc by whatever name called the cost of acquisition will be considered as nil. And for those assets also, the cost of improvement will be considered as nil. And therefore, in those situations, if there is a transfer, uh, now the capital gain can be computed because the cost would be deemed at nil and the entire will be subject to capital gains tax. Yeah. Uh, Winning from uh, online gaming as this uh, online gaming was uh, is is covered any which ways under section uh, 115 BB. Uh, but what the government has done that uh, considering that this this particular sector is actually growing, they wanted to carve out that from that section and introduce a new section called 115 BBJ. And uh, what has been proposed is that uh, any winning from online gaming net winnings would be subject to a 30 percent tax the method of computation etc will be prescribed so most likely it'll be whatever winning what what uh, minus or whatever is the subscription charges etc probably that kind of computation will be uh, will be prescribed so any net winnings will be charged to tax at the rate of 30 percent similarly uh, with respect to withholding tax also uh, with, there is a separate section which has been provided, which is applicable from 1st July 2023. Uh, there is already a section which is there, uh, 194B, uh, which covers this. But but uh, given that there is a separate section for the purpose of tax computation, a separate withholding tax uh, section provision has also been uh, uh, proposed, which is 194BA, where the withholding tax will be at the rate of 30% again on net income. So when the payment happens at that point in time, the net income will be determined and the withholding tax has to 
happened. If there is no payment which is happening within the year, then as of 31st March, whatever is the accrual on that withholding tax would happen at the rate of 30%. And now, and and obviously it would be uh, beyond uh, 10,000 rupees. So up to 10,000 rupees overall in a year, they won't be withholding tax. Beyond 10,000 rupees, this 30% withholding tax would apply. With respect to 194 LCLD, there is no uh, proposed amendment as such, but there was uh, under 194 LCLD where uh, where uh, there is a, a ECB or uh, interest on uh, foreign exchange bond or rupee denominated bond, etc. There was a concessional withholding tax rate of 5%, which is provided, provided those uh, loan, bond, or uh, loan or bond or uh, etc is uh, issued prior to July 1, 2023. So that cutoff date of July 1, 2023 has not been extended, which means that any ECB, any bond, uh, infrastructure bond, long-term bond or rupee denominated bond, etc, which is issued uh, after July 1, 2023 will not get the benefit of, of concessional tax rate of 5%. Similarly, for 194 LD, with respect to income from securities of uh, uh, FII, et cetera, where the withholding tax was 5%. Now, after July 1, 2023, the withholding, that concessional rate of 5% will not be applicable. So the government has not extended this uh, uh, July 1, 2023 timeline. The next is with respect to profit and gains uh, from... Uh, from business. So 28.4 section says that any benefit or perquisite arising from business or exercise of profession would be subject to tax under, under business and income from business profession. Now there are rulings including Supreme Court ruling which suggested that this section should apply only if the benefit is in kind and not in cash. So what has been proposed is that the, that any benefit now uh, going forward, whether it is in cash or in kind or partly in cash in kind, will now get covered under 28.4. Similarly, uh, 194, they have also clarified that uh, 194 provides for withholding tax when, when a payment is made, which is in the nature of benefit or perquisite arising from business or profession. It basically says that if the payment is beyond 20,000 in a year, then there's a withholding tax of 10%, which has to be done. Now, there was clarification, the section, the way the section read, there was this interpretation that this 194R should apply, should not apply in a cash uh, benefit or procured, but there were circulars which were issued uh, last year in uh, July and August, that even for cash, it would apply. So that circular basically now has been uh, proposed to be introduced in section 194R itself, giving uh, giving clarity that even for cash uh, payments, uh, the withholding tax has to be done under 194R. Yeah. So there is there's, uh, some amendment with respect to uh, the REIT and INVIT. The way the taxation of REIT and INVIT works is that uh, there is uh, between REIT and the unit holders, there should not be double taxation. So whatever is taxed in the hands of the REIT or INVIT when it is distributed is no longer taxable in the hands of unit holders. And similarly, whatever is exempt in the hands of REIT and INVIT is subject to tax in the hands of unit holders. So any distribution of interest, dividend, and uh, rent. So any, let's say the REIT has investment in SPV, and the SPV distributes uh, dividend or pays interest to the REIT, which in turn is uh, distributed to the unit holders. It is taxed in the hands of the unit holders as dividend or interest. Similarly, if uh, the REIT itself owns real estate and earns rental income. The dis that rental income is not taxable in the hands of REIT. And when it is distributed in the hands of unit holders, it is taxable in the hands of unit holders. And there is a withholding tax mechanism also, which is provided. 
Now, what was happening is that uh, in case of uh, the REIT having made investment in the SPV by way of loan, if that loan was getting repaid by the SPV to the REIT and that loan was distributed to the unit holders, the position that was being taken is that it is refund of loan, etc., and therefore not subject to tax in the hands of the unit holder. So business trusts, which is REIT, was not paying taxes with respect to the refund of loan, and there was no tax which was being paid in the hands by the unit holders as well. So there was double non-taxation which was happening, which is classically the uh, uh, the case that was there with respect to uh, the dividend stripping type of scenario. So you, you get the money and not paying taxes, the value of the unit comes down, you can transfer and have losses. So the government uh, uh, saw this and they wanted to plug this loophole. And what they have now proposed is that any amount which is not taxable in the hands of REIT whenever it is distributed will be liable to tax in the hands of the unit holder, which means that in, in the scenario where you get a loan, that loan is distributed to the unit holder by the REIT, it will get tax in the hands of unit holder as income from other sources. But if the unit hold, but but if this is by way of redemption of unit, then the unit holder will be able to get a deduction against the cost of acquisition of the unit. There is a change with uh, in section 56.27b. 56.27b basically. Uh, provides that if there is uh, issuance of shares by a company, uh, which is which is an unlisted company, and uh, the shares are issued at a price uh, which is more than the fair market value, the differential amount is liable to tax in the hands of the issuer company. There is a, there's a carve out which is there, which is with respect to money coming from a VC or, or the shares issued, uh, issued by a uh, startup. Now, this was not applicable with respect to any issuance of shares to non-resident. So it was applicable only with respect to issuance of shares to a resident. Now, what has been proposed is that the carve out which is there for non-resident has been removed, which means that any company now receiving uh, 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 issuing shares to a resident or a non-resident, barring the carve out that I mentioned, which is basically VC or, real, uh, or uh, uh, startup, in that case, the differential amount will be liable to tax. Now, the issue is with respect to the non-resident is that if, if you look from a FEMA perspective, the shares has to be issued at not less than fair market value. While from a 56 to 7B, if it is issued at more than fair market value, it will be subject to tax, which means that it has to be issued exactly at the fair market value. Either, otherwise, it will fall foul of either FEMA or they have the taxation in the hands of the issuing, uh, issuer company under 56.27b. So that becomes a very tricky situation. And for startups, which are basically not registered as a startup in that sense, not having the startup certificate, for them also, uh, fair market value becomes a very uh, tricky situation because normally you it's very difficult to determine what a fair market value of a startup would be. It is sometimes more of a negotiated value between the subscriber uh, and and the issuer company and uh, therefore that that becomes a challenge whether whether somebody can argue that uh, whatever is the value at which uh, independent first timer subscriber is subscribing to the startup because it's a transaction between two unrelated parties and therefore it is supposed to be arm's length and fair market value etc is something Will, will have to be evaluated and, and I'm sure there will be a lot of litigation surrounding this going forward. So there is uh, uh, one uh, change with respect to TDS uh, credit. Now, from a, uh, from a law perspective, the year in which the income is offered to tax, the corresponding credit should be, uh, should be claimed in that particular year. But practically what has been seen is that in many cases there are mismatches where, where somebody is accounting for uh, income on an accrual basis, whereas basically the payer is, uh, is deducting at a later point in time. 
uh, but practically what we have seen generally is that uh, as long as as uh, the taxpayer is able to justify let's say he is claiming in in subsequent year the credit although the income has been offered in earlier year as long he was able to justify that that income has been offered to tax not in this year but in any of the earlier year uh, sometimes the tax authorities were allowing credit and sometimes obviously if the the courts etc were allowing credit saying that at the end of the day the tax uh, has been paid the income has been offered to tax and therefore credit should be allowed even if not in that year but in subsequent year now the change which is proposed is that now if there is a tds which happens in a subsequent year where the income has been offered in a prior year then you need to make an application to to allow to ask the uh, department to allow the credit in the year concerned where the income has been offered to tax and that application has to be made within 2 years from the end of the year in which the tds is has actually been done uh, obviously this would create a lot of lot of uh, issues as to how do you map uh, and a lot of data etc would have to be maintained to uh, maintain to in order to claim uh, those withholding tax credit which was generally being credited in the year when actual uh, tds was being done the other aspect is that uh, uh, now they would not allow uh, a credit which was being allowed earlier uh, from a practical standpoint uh, 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 tds which is pertaining to earlier will not be allowed any more in in the year in which the uh, tds is actually done so that's the change which needs to be uh, looked at and it, it's an important very important change from a taxpayer perspective again from a interest perspective to 44a interest uh, will be allowed with respect to that credit but it will be only from the period from which the claim is made uh, till the time the refund is actually allowed there's a change with respect to the presumptive taxation under 44 bb and 44 triple b which applies to non resident and uh, the the section basically with respect to non resident who are into business of uh, uh, mineral oil exploration or tanki power projects etc they have the option to uh, uh, to offer to tax uh, on a presumptive basis so 10% of the receipt Uh, they can offer it to tax saying that 10% of the receipt is income and pay tax on that 10% of the receipt so what was happening is that uh, this this presumptive tax was optional and what the non residents were doing in in many cases is that wherever the profit was more they were offering at presumptive basis wherever there were losses etc they were not using the presumptive basis and actually doing on an actual basis and that loss was being carried forward to subsequent year and in that year let's say they are offering on presumptive basis the losses are being adjusted against the 10% presumptive income and and the taxes were being discharged that way so what has been proposed now is that this switching if you are doing then the losses etc which is there which you want to carry forward and set off against the presumptive income will no longer be allowed so you have to pay tax on the presumptive basis no brought forward loss can be allowed uh, and adjusted against the presumptive income the only limited point that needs to be looked at which is again not very clear is that again in subsequent year let's say uh, year 1 you have done uh, actual basis there was a loss year 2 presumptive basis and therefore loss is not allowed to be carried forward and adjusted year 3 again you do actual basis whether the loss which was there in year 1 will be allowed to be adjusted against the profit that you are reporting in year 3 on a non presumptive basis is something not very clear which uh, which probably requires some clarity yeah come moving to the theme of focus on compliances uh uh what has been so we have seen that there are a lot of cit appeals etc which are under faceless uh, they are pending disposals are not happening for last couple of years and the government also has recognized that aspect so what they have proposed now is that they would set up joint commissioner of income tax appeals uh, or additional commissioner of income tax appeals 
and they would be entitled to dispose of uh, the matters which are emanating from uh, assessment etc etc which was which could have been done by cit appeal the only limited point is that any order passed by jcit or uh, or uh, authority above jcit those would not come out, come under this but any order passed below jcit uh, will uh, jcit would have the power to uh, adjudicate on that and there will be rules etc which will be defined which are the uh, which are the kind of cases which will come uh, how the faceless etc will work so those scheme etc will be provided later on there's a uh, uh, again uh, relaxation with respect to the uh, the the deemed income or the presumptive basis income which is which is there for uh, certain small businessmen or professionals uh, cover, uh, covered under 44 ad or ada which which basically uh, as of today says that if if you uh, have a turnover or turnover of less than 2 cr then you can go under presumptive basis for business and the 8% of that would be considered as as the income and if it is realized in check etc 6% would be considered as as a deemed income and tax will can be paid on that similarly for services also if the if, if the gross receipts is less than 50 lakh rupees 50% uh, can be considered uh, on presumptive basis as the income and taxes can be paid on that so this threshold of uh, 2 cr for business and 50 lakhs for professional services has been extended for uh, to 3 crores for business and 75 lakh for services but with a rider that this extended uh, uh, the uh, the 3 crores and the 75 lakhs limit would apply only if the the total turnover or, or, or receives 95% of that is other than by way of cash so it should be check etc so it the the cash component should not be more than 5% of the total turnover or gross receipts moving to sez Uh, as dorok was mentioning that uh, obviously there were certain conditions which were there for 10a 10b stpi eou etc uh, some of those conditions was was not there for sz unit uh, which is which is that the claim is possible only if you are filing the return within the due date or the sale proceeds etc is realized in foreign foreign exchange within a period of 6 months from the end of the financial year or or the period as may be allowed by the rbi so this condition was not there uh, for 10 aa this conditions have now been introduced uh, uh, from 24 25 onwards which is uh, the next uh, the current financial year next assessment year and so going forward acz unit wanting to claim uh, tax holiday would have to file their return within the due date and would have to get the money within the prescribed timeline if the money is received thereafter uh, then there is a provision under 155 for uh, for uh, rectification of the of the earlier order to get the extended benefit like uh, special audit uh, a similar thing has been introduced not not special audit completely in that sense but uh, the the government believes that on account of the valuation of inventory uh, there are assessees who are deferring the income to subsequent year so what they have proposed that in in certain situations if the tax authorities believe uh, that there is a requirement to get a inventory valuation done then uh, that uh, they can refer to uh, a cost accountant nominated by pccit and then the cost accountant will give a valuation report which will be taken into consideration for the assessment purposes the next is with respect to withholding of refund uh, so there have, there's a section 241a which basically states that if if the if if the tax authorities believe uh, that in the interest of revenue uh the refund which is due uh for a particular year has to be withheld if there has let's say open assessment etc pending they can withhold the refund 
Similarly, there is section 245, which says that if there is a refund which is due and there is a demand which is due for any other year, the refund for one year can be adjusted against the demand for the other year. Uh, so what has been proposed now is this 241A is merged with 245. Now, which from our reading uh, give, gives the impression that let's say if there is a refund which is due and there is an open assessment which is there for any other year and the tax authorities believe that that can result into refund uh, demand etc in future and they believe that in the interest of uh, revenue uh, that refund has should be withheld they now have the power to withhold that refund even if it is with respect to a likely demand which can be there for any other assessment year business reorganization there is a proposed amendment which is uh, so earlier they have uh, proposed an amendment that in case of merger etc uh, where the where the return has already been filed uh, the successor entity can file a modified return uh, or an updated return uh, uh, giving effect to the merger and that return has to be filed uh, within six months from the end of the month when the merger order is received from the tribunal or the court but there was no provision with respect to how the assessment reassessment etc would have to happen for that now they have basically introduced that for those uh, cases where the return has been the updated uh, modified return has been filed they have provided the mechanism for the for assessment reassessment of all those returns there has been change in uh, timeline for uh, uh, for for certain assessments, compliance, etc., uh, the regular assessment proceeding, which which uh, currently uh, provided that uh, the assessment has to be completed within nine months from the end of the financial year plus twelve months in case it is referred to TPO, is now extended to twelve months. So going forward, it will have a twelve month period as against a nine month period plus twelve months for uh, for TP. In case of updated return, which is which is there, which was introduced last year under 139.8a, uh, the people can file an updated return within two years from the end of financial year. In those cases also, the return was required to be assessed within nine months from the end of the financial in, year in which the return was furnished. Now that has also been extended to 12 months. Time limit for uh, submitting TP documentation, which, which was there, that, that has to be submitted once you get a notice within 30 days or further period extended, uh, further period of 30 days as may be extended. Uh, now that has changed. It is now proposed that it has to be submitted within 10 days and a further period of not exceeding 30 days can be provided. So within 10 plus 40 days, uh, if, if the extended time is provided, the TP documentation would have to be submitted. Otherwise it will be deemed that there is no TP documentation and there could be penalty under section 270. Uh, which is two percent of of the international transaction with respect to return to be filed uh, once a notice is issued under 148 there was no specific uh, period which was there provided under the law now it has been mentioned that uh, that it has to be submitted within three months from the end of the month in which the notice is received or uh, such extended timeline and if the return is not filed within that period, then it would be considered as the return has not been filed under Section 139. Coming to personal taxes, now uh, obviously there's a lot of push from the government. The government wants that uh, that people actually move uh, to this new personal tax regime, which is provided under 115 BAC. Uh, it was there for two years, but uh, there was not much traction. Uh, under this now they have tried to make it more attractive and and the government believes that with this changed slab rates uh, uh, which is there uh, there should be more and more people uh, taking this benefit and going under this regime now this regime has been made a default regime which means that this is automatic unless you choose the old regime uh, the slab rate uh, you can see on the screen it is uh, it is far more liberal than what it was there earlier uh, the exemption which is 
there up to 7 lakh there won't be any tax because of 87a deduction which is a rebate which is provided uh standard deduction is also there now earlier it was not there 50000 rupees standard deduction so for salaried people uh, effectively till 7 lakh 50000 there is no tax uh for high net worth individuals uh, the highest surcharge was 37% if the income was beyond 5 crores now for under the new tax regime the highest surcharge is 24% so if it is beyond 2 crores 25% and that remains so there is no 37% surcharge for hnis which means for them the effective tax rate uh, comes down from around 43% to around 39% so with this uh, the expectation of the government that at least 50% of of the sse which are uh, uh, having an income below 15 lakh rupees or 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 in a higher uh, tax lab uh, likely to move under the new tax regime some other changes from a personal tax perspective uh, gifts which uh, which was paid by a resident to a non resident uh, was subject to tax it was considered as deemed to accrue arise in india if the gift was beyond 50000 but uh, from but there was nothing which is which was there from a, a rnor perspective and people were taking position that obviously if if the gift is is given by a resident to an rnor that would not get taxed now uh, section 9 has been amended to provide that if the gift is given by a resident to an rnor it will be deemed to accrue arise in india and liable to tax uh, insurance uh, there there is a change with respect to uh, the the exemption that you get when when the insurance uh, that you uh, that you buy uh, when when the maturity of insurance happens then that insurance is uh, is not taxed under 1010d uh, now of uh, there were changes earlier year which which basically said that the insurance where the the premium is more than 10% of the sum assured in those kind of insurance though, that exemption uh, on account of uh, receipt on account of maturity uh, will not be there similarly with respect to ulip also there was changes that if the premium is more than 250000 per year that uh, exemption will not be available now they have made one more change is that if the insurance premium aggregate insurance premium uh, with respect to a policy which is issued after 1st of april 2023 any sum received uh, from such insurance will be liable to tax excluding a situation where the sum is received on account of death so that will obviously remain exempt but otherwise it will get taxed and any premium which is paid uh, for such insurance uh, that will be eligible as a deduction against that income ltcg exemption now obviously there are a lot of uh, government felt that this benefit is being availed by uh, hnis where they are obviously having long term capital gains on account of seller property or other long term assets and they are investing in properties and and getting a exemption uh, on 54 or 54f uh, now that there was no cap uh, with respect to exemption that can be claimed under section 54 or 54f now a cap has been introduced proposed uh, that it will be restricted to 10 crore rupees so beyond 10 crore rupees no deduction will be eligible under 54 and 54f uh, there is also a change from a tcs perspective uh, uh, with respect to foreign remittances under lrs scheme other than medical education which was uh, tcs was at 5% uh, now tcs has been in increased from 5% to 20% with respect to lrs other than medical uh, uh, or education without any threshold limit or for buying foreign tour packages so that's it uh, from my side over to you dorak thank you thanks tapan for the detailed uh, examination of the budget proposals i thought we'll just end with a with a little bit of a summary in terms of what the industry expected what were the broad expectations and uh, what finally came out in the budget um obviously one of the asks from the investor community uh, was the need for stability in the taxing system and uh, there is definitely in this budget a resounding yes uh, in response to that 
uh, the finance minister has not made any changes to the tax rate, no major changes to the law, no retrospective amendments, etc. So a very strong sign that stability is something that the government is focused on and that is something that came out very strongly. Ease of doing business, I think there were several proposals which were put forth in the budget speech which had to do with multiple laws, whether it was um, you know, with regard to the gift city, linking various other uh, legislations, decriminalizing, decriminalizing various proceedings under laws, etc. Uh, definitely, I think a lot of things have been done there. But could there have been some more things done? And if you listen to some of the changes that Tapan was talking about, whether it has to do with the amendment in Section 245, uh, which allows the tax officer to withhold refund in circumstances, if it has to do with, say, the inventory valuation opportunity or option which is given to the assessing officer, would those really help in ease of doing business? Or are they prone to misuse such that perhaps taxpayers may struggle because of those provisions? Reduce litigation compliance. The introduction of the 100 joint commissioners to handle small appeals is a fantastic um, is fantastic development and definitely, definitely it will speed up the process of litigation uh, through the appellate uh, courts, etc. I think the question, however, remains is what will happen on the ground? We have seen in the last year to 18 months, uh, the process of search and surveys still continues. Uh, there are still aggressive high pitch assessments which take place from the taxing authorities. So will the mindset of reduced litigation, which is the message coming from the top, will that really flow down? Or is it going to be a struggle? Because end of the day, taxes do account for a majority of the government's budgetary revenues. Um, and therefore, will we see a continued focus on investigation, search, surveys, and assessments by the tax authorities, or will we see a reduced litigation? Similarly, could the government have done something in terms of speeding up the board for advanced rulings? And I know last night there was a notification issued uh, notifying the members of the bar. But is there something that the government could have done to introduce some certainty, speeden up the process of the bar, which has been in a limbo now for a long time? Boost for manufacturing, um, in my view, is a tough one. Here was really an opportunity for the government to do something big. Everyone has been talking about China plus one. China's reopening post-COVID has been disastrous. And again, it has created an opportunity for India. The 15% rate is definitely one of the most competitive in the world. But it comes with the rider that your operations have to start by March 2024. So could the government had, have considered a little bit of an extension in the timeline, especially considering the fact that Labor reform is still stuck because we have not been able to clear the, the labor amendments, etc. Land reform is still stuck. In those circumstances, could an extension in the manufacturing rate have helped? Could the government have tinkered even with those provisions to not require a new company to be formed? Could it have been through an expansion of operations? Those are things I feel that the government missed out. Similarly, if you look at cooperatives, yes, 15% tax rate for cooperatives, but think of it in perspective. It says you have to set up between 1st of April of 2023 and 31st of March of 2024. Now, how practical is it for a for an organization to set up a cooperative and be ready and commence its manufacturing operations in that time? Manufacturing is not services. It requires heavy investment. So in 12 months, you have to commence those operations to claim that benefit. How viable is it? So I think the government certainly missed an opportunity here to show that India is that China plus one option. Innovation entrepreneurship, again, I feel is a big missed opportunity. Uh, yes, we spoke about startups and the seven years to 10 years in respect of the losses, but the change in 56 to 7B is a big one. There is no clarification on ESOP taxation, which is one of the biggest issues for startups because their employees tend to be out of pocket at the exercise stage and not at the liquidation event. And that is stopping them from incentivizing talent. So that's a big one. There is still no guidelines or no notification issued by the government in respect of allowing Indian companies to list overseas before they list in India. So those were some of the things that they that would have really boosted innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, yes, they did help the MSMEs to some degree. But if you're looking at the startup ecosystem, uh, I think they missed an opportunity. Global developments with Pillar 2 coming in and legislative process having started in many countries, there was an expectation that India would also give a path to Pillar 2 what that would have meant. And as most of us know, Pillar 2 basically provides for a global minimum tax rate of 
uh, for certain multinational companies above, above a threshold. And if that global minimum tax rate is not met, then there are different mechanisms through which a 15% rate can be used, whether by way of a top-up tax in the home country or by way of an income inclusion rule. Um, and that, again, would have been a development that was an expected development um, that the government should have given clarity and a path in the budget. It need not have been in FY24. It could have been at a later date, but certainly a path to, uh, to pillar to adoption would have been important to give that signal to the global community. And finally, reduce tax burden. Definitely, yes, with the changes in tax rates that we spoke about. Uh, so overall, I think, yes, the budget has done many good things, has simplified and provided clarity, but perhaps uh, could have taken a bit of a bet on certain of the other developments. So with that, I think we are uh, at the end of our time. So, um, Pridima, I don't know if you have time for maybe one question. Uh, we do have uh, some good questions coming. Shall sure. we? Yeah, great. Yeah. So, so, so maybe I'll I'll pick it up, Ritima. If that's okay, I can just uh, yeah, pick yeah, it up. That's so, perfect. So sure. So Tapan, there's a couple of questions. One question um, says for remittance under the LRS for education or medical above seven lakhs, does the five percent TCS remain intact? I think there is an exemption, right, for medical. Yes, uh, it remains intact. So for education, where uh, the remittance is out of loan that has been taken uh, and which is beyond 7 lakh rupees, it is 0.5%. Uh, for medical, uh, it is 5% and uh, 7 lakh uh, uh, limit re remains. So apart from those, it will there is no there is no limit. So without any limit, it will go to 20% tax from 5%. Yeah. The next question, Tapan, is what kind of appeals are likely to be shifted to the JC's jurisdiction? Only the new ones or also the past ones? Interesting. No, uh, it basically says that even the past ones can also go. So they would basically decide which are the ones which can go from CIT uh, appeal to JCIT. But of course, uh, not the orders which are passed by JCIT or ACIT or any of the above rank or under their direction. So barring those, uh, all other orders can go, but they would decide. Interesting. So I have a few more queries from other channels. Shall I, if you have two minutes more? Yeah, maybe we'll take one more question. Yeah, so one is the proposed amendment in section 43B, which is discussed relating to some table to MSME. Will that demotivate entities to do business with MSMEs? What do you think? So maybe I'll, I'll try to respond to that top one and you can add. Um, I'm not sure that that is a demotivation for MSMEs. It is not a permanent uh, denial of the deduction. All the government is doing is ensuring that similar to other 43B items, that the deduction is available when the actual payment is made to the MSME, right? And there are, of course, certain timelines, etc., which are prescribed for payments to be made to SME, MSMEs. Um, and if you don't make it within those timelines, then obviously it will be allowed to you only on a payment basis. So I, I'm not sure that it is it is going to disincentivize companies from working with us. Correct. Great. Thank you so much. That was a very useful session with you both. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Ritima. Thanks, Tapan. Thank you. So as the saying goes, during the times of change, some construct barriers while other erect wind turbines. This sets the stage for today's fifth session which focuses on the topic of international taxation and taxation on online gaming. We are delighted to welcome Daksha Bakshi, founder of SRI Solutions with us to take on this topic. Daksha has 35 plus years of experience in international tax advising, focusing on legal strategies. She's an expert in cross-border M&A treaties and domestic tax issues. She has worked with advisors globally to offer compatible solutions. Daksha is highly regarded in the industry ranked as a top tax advisor in India by Legal 500, Chambers and Partners, and other, other prestigious publications and organizations. It's a pleasure to have you here, Daksha. So without further ado, thus I'll just say the session is all yours. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's a joy to be uh, part of this uh, uh, marathon and uh, discussing these uh, changes that uh, I am going to talk about. Uh, there could be a little bit of uh, overlap between what was um, said in the previous session because that covered all corporate taxes and 
um, uh, I also noticed that it covered some personal taxes and something to do with the uh, with the other uh, non-resident related, international related taxes. So there could be some overlap, but that overlap is uh, pardonable because uh, it just brings into focus, this, this session brings into focus everything that deals with uh, either non-residents or in cross-border situation. So uh, uh, I would just request um, uh, the audience to bear with that kind of uh, overlap. And in case there is something uh, that you feel that I can um, answer as a question, uh, please feel free to ask. But let me just finish the uh, presentation. Uh, before we start delving into the questions, because it is possible that um, uh, since I'm picking up all the uh, non-resident related and cross-border uh, transaction related things from all over the uh, finance bill and budget, I could be covering what you have in mind uh, towards the uh, in the next part of the session that is going on. Uh, so please wait uh, for the questions, and I will answer them at the end. So uh, without uh, without much ado, let me just uh, start with my um, uh, my presentation, and um, I hope to find my presentation on my screen. Uh, <clears throat> there we are. Seems like we are there. Okay, so uh, here we go. Um, all right, um, so let's just um, start now. Uh, so let me just very uh, quickly um, run through what it is that I'm covering. I'm obviously cover covering the taxation of gaming receipts. Then um, international taxation, which impact non-resident and cross-border transactions. I uh, there is also one slide which sort of you know takes um, uh, takes account note of the fact that there are there are certain situations which have been get status quo, and within the international tax, I am talking about anti-avoidance measures, uh, something uh, about startups, international financial services center. Uh, rollover capital gains tax benefit, which is CAP. The reason I'm bringing this in is because even non-resident individuals, uh, NRIs, are going to be impacted by that. Uh, provisions which impact cross-border mergers and acquisitions. There are a lot of provisions which impact cross-border, uh, uh, impact mergers and acquisitions, but I'm focusing on those which um, uh, impact only the cross-border mergers. Sorry to interrupt, Daksha. Uh, I think your PPT isn't visible. Is it visible now? Uh, I am no, sharing. The screen which you have shared is just a limited one. Uh, could you please share the desktop? Then you can go to the PPT. Sorry, say that again. Could I uh, watch? Could you stop sharing once and once you share, share the entire screen as in the entire window. Okay. Uh, that's exactly what I did now. Uh, okay, stop share. Now the entire screen, just click on the screen and then you can go to the. Okay. Yeah. Now is it visible? Is it visible now? Yeah. Please uh, slide up and down now once. Okay. Let me do it here. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Smooth. Yeah. This is. Um... Okay. So then I'm going to talk about. Um, um, higher TCS and uh, the, on the LRS payments, taxation on transfer of market link debentures, which is the reason I'm talking about that. Are you, are you able to see or not? Yes, 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 sir. Yeah. Um, the, because the non-residents are also uh, uh, investing in market link debentures, then um, non-residents are made eligible to DTA benefits for income from mutual funds, which is a positive uh, development, lower withholding tax available uh, uh, for interest from business trust to non-residents, no tax exemption to foreign news agencies, transfer pricing related. Uh, so let's uh, delve into taxation of gaming receipts. Uh, now, Section 194B levies tax on winnings from lottery, crossword puzzle, and game and other games. 
um, card game and other games. And section 194BB levies tax on winnings from racing in any race course or for wagering or betting in any race course. And these winnings are taxable. This is the current position. These winnings are taxable at the rate of 30% under section 115BB if they exceed um, uh, 10,000 rupees and include winnings from, and they also include winnings from any sort of gambling or betting of any form. Um, now, this provision was interpreted in such a manner that each transaction, uh, that people thought that each transaction has to exceed 10,000 uh, rupees to become taxable. This resulted in tax leakage. So to plug this loophole, now it is proposed to amend both sections 194B and 194BB as follows. What, the, what it says is that the winnings in each case under both the uh, uh, sections as amended will be aggregated. Section 194B specifically excludes winnings from online gaming with effect from 1st July 23. So till, uh, till then, uh, so till 30th June 23, whatever the winnings from online gaming, which could have been covered under Section 194B, they are being taxed or they were being taxed, but now they will not be taxed under that section. Now they will be taxed un under another section. And all the transactions will be aggregated to apply the threshold of 10,000 in each case. And losses will also be allowed to be deducted to determine the net taxable winnings under each section. So this is a mixed thing. Since losses are allowed, uh, it is possible that in a year, the person doesn't really make uh, much uh, gain out of this and may not really be taxable uh, in that sense under this, this particular section. Or since it is getting all aggregated, maybe it is much more that is going to be taxed rather than each individual uh, winning, which was under, under 10,000. So it depends on each uh, individual uh, person who is making money out of these gaming transactions. Uh, tax as per section 115BB uh, would be levied on the net winnings. The new section 194BA would apply to online gaming winnings and would apply both to resident as well as non-resident. This is very, very important that it applies to non-resident as well. Uh, there are lots of nuances with regard to that. It is that when the non-resident is um, earn, earning income out of a gaming intermediary who is situated in India, then um, that income is deemed to be accruing or arising in India, and therefore that non-resident is taxable. On the other hand, if the um, uh, if the uh, uh, if the gaming intermediary is outside India, then whether that gaming intermediary is actually required to withhold the tax when a resident is actually um, earning gaming uh, gaming income out of this uh, uh, gaming activity that is being carried out. So it's a it's a it's become a little complex provision since both resident and non-resident are included. And when it, uh, it is a non-resident, which is either subject to tax under this provision or is subject to withholding under this provision, whether a double taxation avoidance agreement would come to their rescue or not. What, with, what would be the character of this income under the double taxation avoidance agreement? First of all, whether the non-resident is eligible to double taxation avoidance agreement. Second, is this tax something which is including, included within the scope of the uh, uh, definition of tax under the DTA, applicable DTA, uh, and if it is included therein, is there a provision which says that this particular type of uh, uh, income falls within uh, a particular category and there is a provision as to when is it considered to be arising in India and therefore taxable in India, or if not that, does it fall 
uh, under the defi definition of other income. In uh, most of the treaties, other income is taxable in India as per the Indian law. In many of the treaties, it is taxable in India if uh, the person who uh, receives the income has either a permanent establishment in India or has a fixed base uh, uh, um, uh, available to him and the income is connected with that. So there would be all of those um, uh, aspects which will need to be covered uh, as soon as it is a non-resident who is involved in this uh, particular uh, gaming winnings and, and therefore it becomes a little complex. A new proposed section 115BBJ and 194BA provide uh, definitions for all aspects of online gaming such as com computer resource, internet, online game, online gaming intermediary user, user account. This reminds us of the definitions of uh, on uh, uh, e-commerce uh, e commerce transactions under equalization debits. They, they are uh, fairly uh, detailed definitions. Uh, in some cases, they are detailed. In some case, cases, they are cryptic. So one would need to examine uh, in case of each gaming uh, activity, whether it they, they fall under these definitions or not for the purposes of um, uh, ascertaining whether these sections are attracted. And in case of online gaming, whenever net winning is withdrawn, the 30% tax is to be deducted and the winnings will include both cash and the kind. And if cash is not enough to cover the tax, payer has to ensure that the tax is paid. So therefore, he may have to ask the winner to give him the cash in order to, um, uh, to enable the payer to, de to deposit the 30% withholding tax. If there is a balance left at the end of the year in the user account, tax will need to be deducted on the same, even if not withdrawn. Uh, so, uh, so there could be a situation that there will be a balance in the account uh, and the, the, the tax is paid. And uh, in the following year, the person is withdrawing uh, that, uh, that uh, gain um, uh, even before he makes any further gain. But thankfully, because the tax is withdrawn and this way, the tax with uh, tax uh, deducted from in the previous year is carried forward and given credit. Uh, he will not have to be uh, taxed again on the withdrawal. So um, non-resident gaming intermediary is also liable for TDS, as I just mentioned earlier. The changes in section 115BB and the new section 115BBJ are effective from 1st April 23. And uh, but the changes in 194B and insertion of section 194BB are effective from 1st July 23. So there is a little bit of a, um, uh, a, a, a confusion that could arise when, in, when applying the new sections and the new, uh, new amendments in one part of, the, uh, of these provisions. Uh, where, which becomes uh, applicable on 1st April 23, whereas the other part becomes applicable on 1st July 23. I'm hoping that it is in, uh, inadvertently done and they will be aligned so that there is no confusion. Uh, the next one that I just mentioned was status quo of many provisions. Uh, there is no change in definition of residence, either of individuals or of company. And this is a huge, huge respite because every year when there is a change in the definition of residence, uh, it uh, does not go down well with respect to so many people who are either non-residents, have uh, setups outside India, have companies outside India, or companies who have who send people into India for uh, taking up, um, be becoming uh, employees in their subsidiaries or, or in their joint venture, et cetera. All of this requires long-term planning. So having this stability, at least for this year, is, is a good, uh, uh, decision that the government has taken, and we, we should uh, we should appreciate that for, uh, 
part. Uh, residential status of individuals and company continues to be determined as per the provisions of Section 6 of the Income Tax Act as they existed on 31st January 23. And no change in the, uh, I specifically mentioned 31st January 23, uh, because the, the finance bill uh, has been um, presented on 1st February. So um, at least, you know, up to for 31st of January, we are all very certain. And no change in the tax rates or surcharge for non-residents except as discussed in this um, uh, presentation, which is also a good thing. Uh, now let me move to international taxation. Uh, and as I mentioned, we will go uh, through those, those uh, headings. Uh, so first I'm going to talk about the anti-avoidance measures. Uh, in, in, uh, I mean, anti-avoidance measures are there even for domestic transactions, but um, some of those which apply to domestic also apply to cross-border transactions. So I'm picking up those. Uh, first and foremost, of course, is uh, the one which has already been mentioned uh, in, uh, in the previous session about um, uh, non, not ordinary resident uh, receiving a gift from a resident. Now, um, and, and uh, it, it is being clarified that it will be uh, taxable. And uh, for this purpose, uh, um, uh, section 918 uh, has been amended. Now, uh, this is interesting because not, not ordinarily resident, uh, the, the uh, taxability of that person uh, very clearly says that all Indian source income will be taxed only uh, in the, uh, income which is earned outside India is not going to be taxed. Even the income which is earned outside India, if it is uh, um, earned uh, or realized from a business which is controlled uh, in India or a profession which is set up in India, then it becomes taxable. So clearly people have taken view, uh, which, is, which was a little far-fetched, because if an Indian person is making a gift, that gift does become an Indian source income. And section, uh, section 56 to 10 does not exclude a non-resident from its, uh, uh, its ambit. So you know, if, if non-resident was not excluded, how could non a not ordinary resident be excluded? So it is something which, which was an obvious thing which obviously people took some um, very um, uh, sort of uh, far-fetched views and to ensure that that litigation does not arise, this clarification is given. And therefore, if the, uh, if the person is receiving more than 50,000 and if that person is not receiving uh, that from a relative, then that would be taxable. Um, and uh, that obviously falls under section 56 to 10 uh, and therefore taxed as income from other sources. Now, payment by business trusts to unit holders, uh, which are doubly non-taxed, is now taxable on unit holders. So just to, just to give you a background, uh, business trusts mean um, um, uh, 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 the uh, investment trusts, uh, the um, REITs, uh, and uh, so therefore, uh, the income of these trusts are the pooled vehicles like an AIF, and these are given a pass-through status. But while giving the pass-through status, those provisions mention which are the incomes of these trusts, which arise to the trust and which are to be uh, considered to be direct income of the unit holders, of the investors. So therefore, what happened is that, uh, that it is interest, dividend, or rental income, which are covered in those, uh, those sections, which have the pass-through status. Now, uh, a business trust may be receiving, uh, let's say, repayment of loan given to the SPV, that loan does not have a correct character either of interest or of dividend or of rental. Now, when that is repaid, that 
obviously being a capital receipt was not taxed neither in the hands of the uh, uh, business trust nor in the hands of the unit holders because that specific provision was not there for it to be taxed in the hands of the unit holders. Secondly, it may be that the SPV is buying back shares that the uh, business trust holds in the SPVs. That income is also not taxed because it is not dividend, it is distributed income. So that is not taxed in the hands of the business trust because it is not business income, nor is it taxed in the hands of the uh, unit holders because it is there is no specific provision. Or in, in fact, it is exempted um, uh, uh, under section 115Q. Uh, uh, so um, therefore, there is a need to deal with this situation. So therefore, new sub, uh, sub clause 12 in section 56.2 is inserted to include as income a sum which is paid to a unit holder of a business trust, trust which is neither interest nor dividend nor rented income. In case of units of business trust, repay, repayment of debt could be redemption of units. This being repayment of capital, it is capital receipt, and unless specific provision to tax it is provided, it could not be taxed. Now it is pro now it is provided that such amount uh, is treated as income of the unit holder under this new sub clause 12 of section 56.2b, uh, 56.2, read with section. 224.17c. Uh, the proviso, proviso says that the cost of acquiring the units will be deducted from the payment, thus excluding from the purview of tax the return of investment. And consequent changes are made uh, in section 115 UB to clarify that the sum referred to in section 56.2.12 does not qualify to be the income which retains its character as is envisaged under section 115 UB 1, 2, and 3, as I mentioned, because it is neither interest nor dividend nor rental income. However, this, this treatment of uh, income being treated as other income and being taxed at the higher rate is out of step with the normal provision of taxing the gains as capital gains, which is the case world over. Therefore, uh, already it has been pointed out and a suggestion has been made to the finance minister that this should be taxed as capital gains and not as income from other sources. Uh, which is taxed at a higher rate of uh, tax than capital. Another issue is that if the SPV has bought back its shares, the sums received by business trust would not fall in the categories listed under section 1023 FC and 1023 FCA. Uh, that is, that is interest, dividend, or rent. If such distribution is not taxable due to section 115Q, read with section 234A, in the hands of uh, shareholders, then when the business trust makes the payment to the unit holders, it seems incorrect to tax such income in the hands of the unit holders. If at all, such income should be taxed as capital gains under section 46A and not as other income under section 56.212 as is uh, proposed. Hopefully, this will be um, uh, taken up and understood by the um, um, uh, by the CBDT and the people who are drafting the bills and uh, this kind of anomaly will be removed. I agree that it needs to be taxed, but it should be taxed as it should be taxed. And if it is not taxable under the Income Tax Act, it cannot be made taxable by putting bringing in a non-obstantive non clause. And these new provisions, thankfully, are becoming becoming applicable for the financial year, coming financial year 23-24, um, that is um, assessment year 24-25. The um, another thing is about startups. Now, uh, thankfully, the sunset um, sunset date to set up startup 
to avail the beneficial tax regime under Section 80 IAC, that is 100% tax exemption, for three out of the first 10 years is now extended to uh, 31st March 24 from 31st March 23, uh, which is a very welcome, ta welcome measure. Uh, we all hope that it would be uh, extended till uh, 31st March 2025 in view of the pandemic. Uh, there, there having been certain situations of the pandemic, uh, in pandemic, because of which the startups could not take, uh, take off as they could have otherwise taken off. Uh, but let's see how it goes. Um, also under Section 791, the carry forward of losses for set off has been extended to 10 years in place of seven years. Um, and this is in line with Section 80 IAC, where the tax benefit is available, made available for three years out of 10 years. So that 10 year period is aligned now. Um, another um, so international tax related provisions appear in International Financial Services Center. Um, uh, the, 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 the provision was already made in the prior, uh, previous uh, um, uh, finance, uh, finance Act that when a fund relocates itself into the International Financial Service Center, then the capital gains arising out of that would not be taxable. And there was a it was an exemption provided under Section 47 AD, which exempts capital gains in case where there is a transfer of assets by an offshore fund, which of course has to be full, uh, to fulfill certain prescribed conditions, or their unit holders to a category one, two, or three. Um, alternative investment fund, which is located in International Financial Service Center. Uh, this is known as relocating of the funds. So that is uh, that was already there. The sunset date for this uh, exemption was 31st March 23, and this has been now extended by two years. So it is now extended to 31st March 25, which is a very welcome uh, uh, step. Uh, because uh, even the uh, relocation um, activities during the pandemic slowed down and everyone who wanted to relocate could not have re relocated themselves. And it is important for the government to push this International Financial Services Center if we want to achieve what we want to achieve by way of providing um, you know, the, the India as a hub for international financial services. And so therefore, um, uh, th this transfer will continue to uh, be facilitated and it will give a boost to AIFs to locate um, in uh, IFSC. This would also result in transfer of units held by unit holders, as I just already mentioned, and the same is also exempt and, and new sunset date will apply to that also. There is a further exemption from tax to NRI holders of ODI in relation to International Financial Services Center. Um, and with effect, this, this uh, additional exemption is available from uh, 1st April 23 for AY 2425. Additional tax exemption is provided to non-resident holders of overseas derivative instruments uh, entered with an offshore banking unit of an IFSC which fulfills prescribed conditions under Section 80LA um, uh, 1A. Such ODI holders were exempt from tax on transfer of the ODI. It is now proposed to exempt them from tax on distribution of income to them by the offshore banking unit to the extent that the distributed income is taxed in India under Section 115AD in the hands of the offshore banking unit. So, they, the, the, the intention is not to give a double whammy, a double tax de deduction, but a single tax deduction. So the, uh, the ODI holders will not be taxed provided the um, offshore banking unit is already taxed on its income from which this distribution is made.
Now, this this one, uh, I, I do believe that the, in the previous session, this has already been uh, uh, talked about, but I'll just very quickly uh, walk through this. Um, Section 54 provided exemption from long-term capital gains for gains realized upon sale of residential house if such gains were used to purchase another residential house in India within 12 months prior or two years after the sale or construction uh, was made of another residential house within three years of the sale. Uh, currently, there is no limit on the amount of capital gains which would be exempt under this provision. And uh, similarly, under Section 54F, though uh, the provision is slightly different, and that in, in this case, it is uh, for an individual and HUF, uh, which includes non-resident and non uh, NRI, um, from the exemption is for from capital gains tax if the individual or HUF invests the sale consideration. In section 54, it is capital gains. In this, it is a sale consideration received on sale of in any long-term capital asset in a new residential house if purchased within 12 months before two years after uh, sale or, or construction within three years after the sale. Now, the proposed cap is of the 10 crore rupees um, in respect of residential house and they therefore gains more than 10 crore even if used for new residential house will not be taxed will now be taxed sorry uh, the exemption of lpcg tax under 54f is also proposed to be capped at 10 crore um, and um, so uh, even if the investment in new residential house is more than 10 crore, uh, it will uh, the, 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 the uh, sale consideration about 10 crore uh, will be taxed regardless of what the cost of the new house is. Representations have already been made to remove this restriction under section 54, not under 54F, because 54 is something where a lot of people have, let's say, uh, ancestral properties or properties which were uh, which have been inherited by them or acquired long time ago but they are indeed residential properties and they 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 can't uh, continue to hold them they need to be sold off um, even even beca because of the fact that they have been dilapidated etc so in that kind of a situation uh, the there is a genuine hardship and that genuine hardship needs to be looked into so uh, representations have been made already to the finance minister. We hope that uh, this will be um, uh, taken up and uh, the cap will be uh, increased, if not removed altogether. And uh, both these changes are effective from 23-24. And since ch changes are prospective, if, if gains are realized in years before uh, AY 23-24 and new residential property is bought, in let's say uh, AY 25, 26, this cap should not apply. Now, uh, as far as 54F is concerned, why uh, no representation has been made is that the, the philosophy with which this government is working is that uh, the, the, the people who are in the middle class and lower should not be taxed higher, but those for whom it doesn't make a difference if they have to pay a 20% tax or not when when the when the value the, the, the gains that they realize in hundreds of crores they should not uh, be um, given this kind of a uh, a, a hot tax holiday uh, because then that impacts the revenue not only that this it is not a huge part of the population which is getting impacted by that so that is something which i think uh, we all can live with Now I'm uh, going to talk about provisions which impact cross-border uh, mergers and acquisitions. Um, uh, expanding applicability of uh, angel tax to non-residents. 
to achieve the objective of prevention, generation, and circulation of unaccounted money through share premium. This section, which was restricted to receipt of money from residents, is now expanded to cover non-residents. This change becomes effective from AY2425. And receipt of premium from VCs, uh, VCFs, continues to be outside the purview of this tax and also premium received from persons which are notified by the central government continue to be exempt. There is no change in how the fair market value is to be determined, higher of rule 11U and 11UA or based on the value of assets, including intangibles such as goodwill, know-how, patents, copyrights, trademarks, licenses, franchise, or any other business or commercial rights of similar nature is to be adopted. Now, uh, this it, it is interesting uh, that already uh, these, these, um, uh, these intangibles are now going to be taxed in the hands of the seller if that person is receiving, um, uh, receiving uh, consideration for intangibles. We will be looking at it in a minute, uh, but that is something which is interesting. So if those are already taken into consideration for the purposes of valuation, then there are certain interesting issues which arise, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but the question that arises is whether customer databases, employee skill sets, etc., can be part of these assets since in, uh, for, for the purposes of valuation at least, uh, since in practice, many a times the high premium which uh, an investor is prepared to pay is because of the value, high value that they place on these intangibles of such companies. So that is a question that arises because these are not some things which are already mentioned uh, in the valuation rules. So whether they can be included to uh, arrive at the higher of those two valuations is something, or will it be covered in the DCF valuation method? So that's something which will be, uh, which will need to be considered on a practical level, depending on a case, uh, on, on the facts of each case. So, um, So a consideration which is paid to a target, or it's, this is something that I just talked about, uh, paid to its promoters or shareholders for non-compete or intangibles will now be taxed. Uh, uh, this is an interesting thing because uh, every one of you who has been involved in uh, mergers and acquisitions know that uh, considerations are paid for non-compete and there is a catena of uh, litigation on that, whether that non-compete is, uh, uh, that, that payment is under 28.4 or is it uh, capital receipt or what it is. And that uh, interpretation issue has been, uh, has been there. So there is a huge uh, amount of litigation which has been going on on this. So consideration paid in a mergers and acquisition um, for acquisition of intangibles was not considered taxable since the law did not provide the mechanism to compute capital gains and there was no provision to determine cost of acquisition. There have been significant litigation in this regard. It is now proposed that from uh, AY 2425, Section 551B would be amended to include a new form of asset of any other intangible asset or a payment for non-compete to give up any other right. So now it is very clear that the non-compete payment is good, is now it is, here is an acceptance that this is a capital asset. There, there, there has been litigation, whether it is under falling under 28.4, or it is um, a capital receipt. Now, by saying that payment for non-compete to give up any other right is a capital asset, and it, it, it seems to um, uh, support the arguments made in the past that it was actually a capital receipt. And of course, uh, Supreme Court's decision in Srinivasa Sethi was always uh, used to say that something which for which no cost of acquisition is available or no mechanism is provided how to compute the cost of acquisition, then it is um, 
uh, clear that the legislature did not expect it to intend it to be taxed and therefore it was not to be taxed. Of course, as I said, on non-compete payment, there was also uh, always an argument that it is not a capital receipt because it falls under 28.4. But now it is clear that it is a capital receipt and its um, cost of acquisition is going to be regarded as, uh, as nil. Um, th the entire amount which is uh, paid will become, a, become capital gain and taxed accordingly. Similarly, cost of improvement for such asset is also prescribed to be nil. Now, where the intangible asset is an acquired one, the cost of acquisition will be the price paid on its acquisition. Now, there are several questions with, which arise in, situ in a situation like this. First of all, is it possible to value intangible and bring that into the balance sheet and claim such valuation as the cost of acquisition? The, the, a better view will be, a non-litigious view will be not to do that, but no, because no revaluation or valuation of asset for which there is no substantia, substantiation of showing the cost is accepted as being the cost, um, cost of acquisition of that asset. So the answer to that could very well be a no. But then let's go, go into the second question. Or is it possible for someone to demonstrate how the cost of uh, uh, cost of this intangible asset, depending on the type of uh, intangible that it is, uh, is created? They accumulate all costs incurred for uh, creating the intangible. Uh, the way it is done for plant and machinery or any other type of asset, which is built over a period of time, and use that as cost of acquisition. There is a case to say that it should be permitted, but there is no knowing that it, it would be permitted and it is likely to be litigious. In case of intangibles which are acquired, is it necessary that the cost of improvement should be nil when it is possible to ascertain the exact cost? Because since you have acquired the intangible, it is already existing in your uh, balance sheet, in your books. Then if you are adding something to it, how fair is it to say that that improvement should be, uh, the cost of that improvement should be nil? So there is a case to say that for that, the cost should be, the exact cost should be given as, as cost and not be uh, shown as nil. So let's see whether uh, this, this position is accepted uh, in, in, while passing the finance bill. Then the other question that arises is, the law is silent on whether such gain will be long-term or short-term. Where the intangible asset as defined above is an acquired property under, the merger, under a merger and acquisition transaction, it should be possible to ascertain whether the gain is long-term or short-term based on what it was acquired, uh, when it was acquired. Where it is self-generated, there is no guidance. A clarification in this regard would avoid any litigation. This and the other three questions, as I mentioned, are definitely need uh, some clarification. Uh, Ma'am, sorry to interrupt, but we might have to wrap up in the next four or five minutes because uh, we are uh, going over time. Yes, uh, I did start five minutes late. So yeah, anyway, yeah. I have only two more slides, so it should be possible to um, move quickly. Um, uh, there is a hike in TCS on payment under LRS. Uh, this was also covered. Now, the only thing is, it seems rather unfair to, even without giving any reason whatsoever, there is a fourfold hike, hike on the payment uh, the, under LRS, and there is no threshold. A single penny which is uh, paid out is going to be taxed uh, at 20%. It is, uh, it's a significant concern when, uh, when a person is becoming non-resident or when a person is setting up business outside India, they do need to uh, spend a lot of money and need to take money out. And having to pay this kind of tax is really uh, unfortunate. 
Um, higher tax on sale of market link debentures. I will go quickly on this. Uh, the market link, link debentures uh, are now being equated to derivatives because uh, they, they, they derive their, uh, uh, their, their value uh, to the performance of the underlying securities in the market and hence should be taxed as income from derivatives. Um, income from, uh, NR, NRs are now made eligible to DTA benefits for income from mutual funds. So this is a good relief for uh, non-resident mutual fund holders. And uh, uh, of course they have to provide the tax residency certificate, uh, but giving uh, bringing this provision into the section itself makes it much more easier for the mutual funds to uh, apply the DTA rates. Um, lower withholding the tax certificate is now available to the business trusts when they are making payments to non-residents, uh, which, which um, uh, interest qualifies under Section 194 LBA. This section was missing from the list of sections which are eligible to uh, uh, approach the tax officer for a lower withholding tax under 197.1. So this is a good, um, uh, uh, good uh, insertion which has been made and it will reduce a lot of uh, um, difficulties that, uh, that uh, the non-residents were facing. Um, no, uh, the, the, the payers were facing. Uh, no tax uh, exemption to foreign news agencies. Uh, many would know that um, uh, foreign news agencies which collected news from India were exempt from uh, taxation in India. It is now, um, now that exemption has been remi removed and depending on whether that news agency has a permanent establishment or a business connection, or if the character of income is something like royalty or anything else, then it will be taxed as per the provisions of law um, under the Income Tax Act or the DTA, which is applicable to them. Um, uh, last but not the least, there is a reduction of time in furnishing response to notice under transfer pricing. Uh, it, is, uh, it has been reduced from 30 days to 10 days. Can't, can't understand the reason because it is again extendable, but there we are, that's what it is. And that brings me to the close of my session. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, can I have one query, which is uh, from, from a one of our attendees? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. So is it correct to comment that the confusion continues with the applicability of SEP provisions beyond digital transactions, specifically whether it covers all sales of goods and services and cross-border transactions? Sorry, which, uh, which uh, provision? Continues the uh, applicability of SEP provisions beyond digital transactions. SCP? Yeah. Uh, oh. Are you as a significant economic presence? Correct. So just say that uh, question again. Uh, I didn't get the question. Is it correct to comment that the confusion continues vis-a-vis -vis applicability of significant economic presence provisions beyond digital transactions, specifically whether it covers all sales of goods and services and cross-border transactions? Um, okay. So yes, the confusion remains in as much as in as much as uh, where there is no um, uh, where the transaction is connected with a business connection or permanent establishment, uh, the business income will be taxed in India uh, to the extent that it is allocable to the SEP or the business connection. Uh, uh, having said that the SEP is applicable only in respect of those um, cross-border transactions where the non-resident does not come from a treaty jurisdiction and uh, the treaty does not apply to that right. non-resident. If treaty applies, then SEP has no meaning because it does not appear, uh, does, that does not figure in a DTA. Now, the thing is, when those transactions are not taxable, under permanent establishment, they are, they could well be taxable under equalization levy, which is outside the Income Tax Act. So yes. if, if they are going to be taxed under equalization levy, will they also be taxed under SEP 
if the non-resident is coming from a non-treaty jurisdiction or the treaty does not apply to that non-resident. Currently, that confusion remains. It was hoped that in this budget, at least some roadmap would be given to say how the government is going to deal with uh, both pillar one and pillar two when they come into effect so that there is no overlapping and whether the government is going to go ahead with um, still uh, continuing with uh, equalization levy uh, in respect of those multinational organizations which do not fall under pillar one because of the high threshold of turnover right. that is applicable for pillar one to apply. So yes, the confusion still remains. There is no clarity there. But as I said, that confusion is limited to those non-resident um, uh, entities or uh, individuals who are not eligible to treaty benefits. Fair enough. Wait, ma'am. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure having you with us for this marathon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. So we now move forward to probably our government's favorite topic, charitable and religious trust, with much amendments in the past couple of years. I now welcome Dr. Manoj Fogla, a, well, a fellow member of the ICI and holds a bachelor degree in laws and also holds a master degree in philosophy. He's an expert on taxation, CSR, FCRA, governance, and accountability issues. An author of several best-selling books for professionals on taxation of trust, NGOs, etc. Joining him, we have Suresh Kejriwal, partner, Agarwal Kejriwal and Company, so is mainly working for the NGO sector and has a vast experience of more than 30 years and his professional working areas include India, Bangladesh and Nepal. We are glad to welcome you both, sir. Thank the you. stage is all yours to take. Yeah. So, Namaskar uh, and good, good afternoon. So, today's whatever time we have, we have structured in such a way that I will give a brief context and overview of the charity related amendments, amendments, particularly in this budget and the context and the buildup of amendments pertaining to charity over the years. Then because this year's amendments have far reaching consequences and there are intricacies involved. So I will be joined by my colleagues, uh, Suresh Kejriwal. He, he will provide you a technical overview and as we go along, we will discuss the controversies and debatable issues arising out of it. And towards the end, we will take up uh, questions. So now, uh, like uh, it was said that the charity has become one of the favorite area. So this probably a tax department is a revenue collection department and uh, the, the government doesn't collect enough revenue from charity, but the entire half of the department uh, is engaged in the charity and the laws and the amount of energy is put on charity. Uh, one need to understand whether it is actually worth it and whether the government is going back and forth or uh, there, there is some pattern regarding the governance and the administration of the charity. So, just to give you a context, so there, there are seven, eight major amendments which have come. One major amendment which have come that corpus donation, uh, what has happened? In 2021, 21, the government said uh, that uh, there is no concept of an excess of expenditure over income for a charitable organization, unlike commercial organizations. So you can spend only to the extent of income available. So if there are losses or deficit or excess of expenditure over income, that would mean that the organization has incurred it out of either borrowed fund or its available corpus. So the Income Tax Act in 2021 said that, look, this uh, if you are uh, spending out of corpus, if you have a deficit, then you have to maintain separate accounts, separate disclosures. 
and those unabsorbed expenses should continue into in the balance sheet to be claimed uh, if, uh, in future years uh, income. So in future year, you can just create, uh, re replenish your corpus or repay your loan against the income. That, that was the uh, rationale. Even in 2021, how, how this will happen, how these disclosures will happen in the balance sheet was not disclosed and even now it is not there. But this year, that uh, uh, replenishment of corpus and borrowings has been capped to five years. So it is a reverse five-year accumulation. When you are not able to apply your income, you, we are given uh, five years time to apply the income by filing form 10 for five years. And it is a reverse accumulation when you spend excess and uh, make excess expenditure, then again you have five years. But uh, this is quite debatable, which we will discuss that uh, should the corpus of an organization should be capped for uh, five years, organization saving gestation period, all those issues we'll try to discuss. Then uh, another major discussion is that in 2021 itself, the government kind of liberalized and uh, digitized the registration related provisions. So it was kind of a uh, welcome measure that charitable organization by virtue of that declaration can get provisional registration. That provisional registration will be live for three years uh, subject to six months. Within six months, they have to reapply of commencement of activity. All kind of charitable organizations virtually without producing any records based on mere declaration were allowed to get provisional registration. And incidentally, the provisional registration was on par with the permanent registration, which is the five-year registration on all res respect, which was a bit surprising in 2021 also. And the government believes that those provisions were misused and those provisions linked to another provision. I will tell you, in 2014, just when this new NDA government uh, came, people used to say that it was a gift to religious and charitable institutions. Uh, they brought an amendment under conditions to section 12a. Section 12a are the conditions to registration. And under section 12a2, two provisions were added. Those provisions provided that if a charitable organization or a religious organization gets 12a registration, then all its past assessments which are open will be treated as an exempt organization. That was a huge relief, huge gift uh, to religious institutions, charitable institutions, which were having uh, endowments, which were having income from FDRs, etc., but were not able to apply for 12-year registration with the fear that the income tax department, even if it gives registration, it will go after them for past year's uh, taxes. And this is what was happening prior to 2014. Now, this honeymoon period continued till this budget 2023. Now, that provision, those two provisions have been deleted. So, if you are registered, uh, even if you are giving, given 12-way registration, your past assessment will be subject to scrutiny and you will have no immunity from taxes. And this link with this provisional registration, provisional registration, many organizations were uh, uh, who had not applied, were not availed exemption in the last two years, 2021-22, were applying for provisional registration. Immediately, they were getting 12 year registration certificate and they were further applying to the assessing officer, requesting that all their open assessment, including 143.3 assessment, etc., should be considered as if they are 12 year registered organization retrospectively. So this kind of a loophole and kind of a uh, situation which was good for genuine organization, both way has been plugged. So it, it, it will 
avoid misuse of this provision and it will again create hardship to many uh, charitable organizations the intent for which uh, this uh, amendment came uh, in 2014 then another major uh, amendment which is exit exit tax in 2016 a section 115 td was inserted into the act this was a kind of a uh, harsh section in the sense it says that if an organization 12a registration now 12ab registration is cancelled for some reason then it has to pay a exit tax of 30% plus whatever surcharges on its net worth not the preceding year's income its net worth all those assets created out of exemptions enjoyed would be taxed at market value so it was quite a draconian provision and therefore it was a non starter uh, and in 2016 itself the government realizing the harsh ness of the provision issued a circular circular number 21 uh, uh, of 2016 which instructed uh, cits and other authorities not to go ahead with 115 td only in exceptional circumstances 115 td should be used and in the circular itself was written that if 100 td is used for a commercial activity of an organization or other uh, violations then it it may create undue hardship so this was the position of 100 td in 2016 suddenly in 2023 this budget says that even if you are uh, doing making a mistake even if you are making a mistake in uh, filing a form or while applying a form incorrect information are provided 115 td can be applied so in that sense it seems that this provision is quite in contradiction to the intent and the cbdt circular which came with 115 td so we hope that some rationalization will happen uh, as as before the budget is passed then then there are uh, some provisions pertaining to pre procurement of return and filing of itr etc i think all these things in a methodical manner we should run it through with 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 the help of suresh ji suresh ji uh, thank you manoj ji for uh, setting the tone for uh, today's uh, session and um, uh, i shall uh, share uh, the overall view of the amendments made uh, through my presentation Uh, i am visible manoj ji sir your camera i think is off my camera is off please off. switch on your camera the ppt is visible the camera is uh, the, your photo is it okay now it is okay yes, yes perfect so basically uh, that uh, the today's session i have uh, summarized eight key amendments and uh, this includes a uh, treatment of application out of corpus and loan and borrowings the second amendment is restriction on application by way of intercity donations so these two amendments basically restricts the amount of application which you are going to claim against the application of income then there are amendments whereby there is a de facto rollback of provisional registration for existing organizations that means you are going back to the old scheme of registration for existing organization who have already started activity then as manoj ji has said there is no retrospective benefit for registration then the impact of giving false and incomplete information may attract cancellation again they are saying 
if anyone fails to any organization fails to make application for re-registration, renewal, or converting provision to regular registration, then they are subject to exit tax. Then they are again saying that the updated return, if the NGO is filing, they will not get the benefit of section 11 and 12. And they have also reduced the timeline to submit form number 9A and form number 10. And these amendments which are discussing is also being proposed for uh, 1023C organizations as well. <clears throat> so the first amendment is the, uh, the amount of uh, application out of corpus and uh, uh, loan and borrowings. So what, are the, uh, what is the current treatment? Application out of corpus donation and loans and borrowings shall not be considered as application for charitable or release purposes in the year of application. That is in the year in which we are making the application out of the loan or out of the corpus fund, that shall not be considered as application. But when such corpus are invested or deposited back, or when such loans and borrowings is repaid, then such amount shall be allowed as application in the previous year in which such amount is deposited back to the corpus, or it is the or the amount is repaid to the extent of such repayment or such redeposit. Re so this was the current treatment. Now, what is the proposed uh, uh, amendment? And that is effective from 23-24. Uh, they are saying application out of corpus or loans and borrowings before 1-4-2021 are not allowed. And even if, uh, even if the concern, uh, and they, without considering the fact whether we have claimed application in that respective year or not. So now they are saying any application made out of loan or out of corpus fund before 1-4-2021 shall not be eligible for such a scheme as when the loans have been uh, are repaid, then in that year, the loan refund shall not be treated as application. Again, they are saying there should not be an unlimited period of set, set off. And they are putting a cap on the time limit of five years to restore the corpus or for the repayment of loan. Again, they are saying the amount of application out of corpus or loan only to the extent of eligible application of the concerned year. What they are trying to mean in the first year when you have spent or when you have applied out of the corpus or out of the loans and borrowings, that application must be an eligible uh, application. Eligible application means that there should not be a, a corpus donation, there should not be a uh, cash payment, there should not be an application without TDS, and there should be only on payment basis, there should not be a payment to specified persons. Of, if all these limitations are in, in the application amount of this concerned year, then we have to reduce that amount uh, from the application of that concerned year, and only the eligible portion shall be eligible to be carried forward and set off against the uh, year in which the loan is repaid or the corpus is replaced. Our second amendment is the restriction of uh, inter charity donation. The current treatment is inter charity donations other than corpus is treated at par with that application for the purpose of section 11.1a. What is the proposed amendment? They are saying only 85% of the eligible donation made by a trust or institution to another trust shall be allowed and shall be treated as application. What they are visualizing that uh, the trust making inter charity donations and through cycle of series of trust uh, and by taking 15% of its statutory accommodation benefit, they may, may end in, ending in by spending very little amount of money out of the total grant amount received. And that's why they have considered and they have provided that the 85% of the inter charity grant shall only be considered as application. Just to give an example through present, uh, through an example, suppose the year the income was rupees 100. And the inter charity donation was rupees 80, and the other expenses was 5, the total application was 85, the surplus was 15, and the statutory accumulation was 15. That means your total income becomes nil without payment of any tax and without requiring anything to accumulate. But if the as with the proposed amendment, the income rupees 100, but the inter charity donation shall be allowed only 85% of 80, that was only 68. Five rupees remain the same, that the total application after the proposed amendment shall be only 73. And that means the total 27 becomes a sur surplus and the accumulation, statutory accumulation is 15. That means the same organization end up in a surplus of rupees 12, which either they have to pay tax or they have to uh, go for accumulation or they have to uh, go for the option to spend in the subsequent year. So this is now going to create a number of spectral issues uh, while when the proposed amendment restricts uh, the interest donation to be allowed only 85%. Now, number of issues uh, are arising out of this, which we'll, I think we should discuss with, with Manojji. The first issue is uh, whether or what if the amount was claimed as an application before 1-4-2021, whether it should be allowed or not now. So now th this 
फाइनेंस बिल इज कैटेगरिकली सेइंग दैट एनी अमाउंट accumulated prior to 2021 will not be allowed so between 21 to 31st march 22 this provision was not there so if the organization has claimed a replenishment of old deficits against corpus or loan up to 31st march 2012 if they have claimed to that extent it will be permissible beyond that Uh, any outstanding carried forward whether uh, the cut off date is 31st march any any amount which is carried forward today in the balance sheet it will not be allowed the second issue is manoj ji how to keep track of whether the amount of application has satisfied the uh, eligibility test uh, no this is a very important issue because uh, the itr and uh, other thing is about the in itr also uh, it is required that the source of the funds is to be given so when you make expenditure you can tell that x amount was made out of income and x amount was made out of corpus or loan but the expenditure which was made out of corpus or loan doesn't find a place in the income and expenditure account the way it used to have or it it does have in a traditional income and expenditure account of profit and loss account so what an organization should do that whatever amount whether it is a corpus investment under corpus investment to the extent the investment was used scheduled to the balance sheet the same expenditure uh, should be there uh, and the auditor should audit those expenditure as a scheduled to the balance sheet and the audit notes should be provided and the trail should be available otherwise in future year it will be difficult to claim because these expenditure do not find a place in the income and expenditure account therefore they should find a place with the normal uh, audit and the accounting process as a schedule to the balance sheet and appropriate audit notes otherwise it will become difficult uh, and the third important issue is how to treat the amount if not invested back or So the corpus or loan is not repaid within five years. And this is this is what we were discussing. That this is the difficult part because organizations sometimes there are large institutions, big organizations. Initial few years they work out of corpus or promoters fund or the settler provided uh, trust uh, funds. So if an organization has a large gestation period and it is not generating a, enough revenue. for a uh, few years then it will be extremely difficult because five years suddenly to that extent the your corpus is struck off from the balance sheet so the only option we see unless this provision is rationalized to that extent the existing capital fund or the corpus fund of organization should be reduced by uh, by setting of uh, striking of the debit balances or as Uh, asset side fictitious balances uh, available so the capital fund has to be reduced to that extent thank you manoj ji now we shall discuss about uh, two uh, important amendments uh, regarding roll back of the provisional registration to some extent and vis a vis the uh, no retrospective benefit of the registration so uh, what is the current position uh, for the uh, roll back of the provisional registration the trust or institution which has already commenced the activity is required to file registration application in two stages as per the present law first they have to apply for provisional registration and once the activity starts they have to apply for a normal registration and for the existing organization who have already started the charitable activity they have to form immediately form second form for normal registration once they get the provisional registration so it was a basically two way registration two way form two way system to make the registration normal though it could have been made one uh, the proposed amendment for such cases they are proposing that the trust institutions shall make an application for regular registration who has already commenced the activity but it has not claimed exemption under section 1023c or section 12 11 or 12 for any of the previous year ending and or before the date of application so now the amendment is saying we are not advocating for two way uh, system when the organization is already started activity they should go for only one time race one time application and the cit exemption will uh, examine and uh, give us a 
uh, uh, give them the registration certificate. This, this is in line with what the old system was. But at the same time, they've also added the word that the organization who are making for this registration, they should not have claimed exemption under section 1023C or section 1112 in the past. That means any existing organization who have not applied for uh, re-registration, they cannot file a provisional registration once this act is passed. Uh, earlier, what we are doing, the old organizations we, which have missed the deadline to submit the re-registration form, we are asking them to go for a provisional registration. But after this amendment come, I think that remedy will not uh, come to their rescue. However, the those trust we sell uh, can find, can continue to have a two-way system which has not commenced their activity. Now the second uh, amendment is no restrictive benefit of the registration. What is the current position? The the provision to subsection two of section twelve a provides that the benefit of registration shall be granted to all the past assessment pending before the assessing officer as in the date of registration. Again, the provision says no 147 proceedings can be initiated merely on the ground that the trust is not registered. Again, the provision says that the above benefits shall not be available if the trust has applied, but, uh, but, but his application has been refused. So basically, uh, as per the present scheme of law, uh, once the trust is registered, they are, uh, they are getting the benefit because of this proviso of the assessment for the back years and their back years will also not reopen only because they are not registered. And that's prompted and that encourages most of the NGOs to realize under Income Tax Act by getting the registration. But the, as per the proposed amendment now, the mm -hmm. bill, finance bill has proposed to omit all these three proviso and therefore the benefit of exemption under the, uh, under the, uh, for the past years will not be available. Now the issue is, uh, Manojji, should the organization apply for provisional registration and then commence the activity or apply directly for regular registration after commencing the activity? No, no, this provisional registration, as we said, that those provision of online registration, digitization of registration, availing registration directly, all those uh, uh, amendments now have gone out of the window. Because provisional registration is valid only till you commence your activity. Our understanding of commencement of activity is that even if you spend a single rupee towards charitable or religious purposes, the activity is commenced. So there would be very few organizations which could not be having some activity. In any case, there is a three-year requirement of balance sheets and income and expenditure accounts. So practically for almost all the organizations, except new registration, there is no option of provisional registration. And the for new organization also, the moment you apply for provisional registration, immediately, the moment you spend a single rupee, you have to apply for regular registration within six months. So therefore, all practical purposes, the direct uh, uh, registration of the old regime is the only option left and that is what should be done. Now the second issue comes, uh, Manoji, uh, as per the present law, organization need to apply one month before the commencement of previous year for the, uh, for the, uh, for the purpose of registration. And at the same time, uh, the, this, this bill proposed to withdraw the back year's uh, benefit. Now what shall be the impact on the existing organization who want to recognize themselves? No, no, that is uh, uh, the key question because this has been timed with uh, deleting those provisions under section uh, 12A. So it is not a coincidence. This exactly is the issue in the mind of the department that they will not spare uh, the earlier year uh, assessments and we are going to see 147, 148, 143 assessment on a continuous basis. So, and maybe this one month part, the technicalities, you, you can just explain it a little more. Yeah. No, no, basically, uh, as Banuji has said is in, in, is in introduction remark, keep, uh, as because of this provision, even if one month prior to the commencement of previous year has got no impact because the organization was applying for a provisional registration, getting it, and automatically they were eligible for the past year uh, uh, benefit. But after this withdrawal, um, uh, I think uh, it will have a uh, uh, it will have a great uh, discouragement for the existing uh, organization to uh, get themselves registered and uh, without looking at their past accounts. Uh, now we shall deal with 
two two amendments dealing with uh, the um, uh, applications being submitted uh, containing some uh, incorrect information and uh, is not moving slide so uh, the first is giving incomplete and false information can attract cancellation the first amendment you know, for this and as per the current uh, position cancellation proceedings can be initiated if the pcit or cit has noticed occurrence of a specified violation and the violation need not be noticed only upon assessment and if the registration has been obtained on incomplete or false incorrect information the cit has a power to cancel the registration after giving an opportunity of being heard and this is provided under rule 17a6 that means under rule 17a6 provides that if the information in the form is not complete or uh, or it is a false information then the cit uh, has a power to cancel the registration after giving an opportunity of being heard but similar provisions were not there in the specified violation list under atb uh, 12ab4 now as per the proposed amendment uh, expiration to section 12ab4 provides spec specified violation which results in cancellation and specified violation after this amendment said in to the case where application for approval or registration is incomplete or contains false or incorrect information i understand uh, this amendment is basically uh, facilitate the uh, what has been mentioned in the rule so that get, so uh, so the rule get uh, more uh, legal validity now the more uh, important change and proposed change is uh, the exit tax under section 115 td only if you only on the failure to make application for registration or renewal or for converting uh, uh, the uh, normal uh, provisional registration to normal registration what is the current position as per the uh, uh, as per the new registration requirement every existing uh, registered organization under section 12a 12aa need to be re-registered again the re-registration shall be valid for 5 years and thereafter this again has to be renewed again once the provision certificate is granted one need to apply for a normal registration so these three applications one need to apply depending upon his situation and what is the proposed and there was no clarity in the law what will happen if one fails to apply for a re-registration one fails to apply for re-registration uh, and though it was very clear that the organization shall not be deemed to be a registered organization for the purpose of assessment but whether it will tend to amount to cancellation that was no clear there was no clarity the proposed amendment uh, what they are saying as per the proposed amendment where application are not made for any of the above situation or all the three situation then the organization shall be deemed to have been converted into any form not eligible for registration or approval in a previous year under section 115 td of the income tax act 961 and shall be subject to exit tax so now the proposed amendment are saying if you fails to apply in any of the situation that is you have not applied for a registration you have not applied for a renewal or you have not applied for a uh, provisional registration to normal registration then your organization deemed to be converted into a form not eligible for registration and they are also providing that the date of deemed uh, conversion shall mean that last date of making an application for registration meaning thereby if the last date of making the application is 30th september and you have not applied by 30th september then the dim date of dim conversion shall be the 30th september so this i think is very very uh, uh, going to have a very very uh, great impact to all the ngos and basically the, those ngos which have not get applied for re registrations now the issues here manoj ji uh, what shall be the impact if organization registered under section 12a and 12aa has not yet re registered and keeping in view of the circular uh, dated 111 22 uh, where the existing time where the timeline for submitting application to re register has extended up to 25 11 no no again this circular was intended to give some benefit to the organizations who failed to apply and the date was extended but uh, by virtue of this amendment this circular uh, those who have not applied for them the last date is no longer 31st march uh, 22 it is it, it has become 21 and it, it has become 11 22 so in such circumstances we think one more assessment year will get implicated and the organizations which had the circular not come then the organization would not have been under 115 td 
but now this organization because of this circular will get uh, implicated under section uh, 115 td and just to again put it it is important to reiterate that 115 td under after finance bill 2023 read with section 12 ab violations is is is, is quite absurd because a 12 ab which was earlier section 12 double a it provided that if the organization is not genuine or an organization which is not a charitable organization a commercial organization or some uh, organization with some other motive under the garb of a charity or religious organization if it has taken registration then 115 2d should be applied and cancellation should be done one two Cancellation presupposes certain serious violations. Violations is that uh, making misrepresentation or misusing of firm which has resulted in leakage of revenue to the organization or wrongfully exemptions have been taken. So this was the spirit and this was the provision in the law. And this is this is how 215 TD came in 2014 and the corresponding Section 12 AA only provided for these kind of violations. Now 115 TD will be invoked if you provide incorrect information. If you fail to manage books of account under Section 11 4A, suppose you have incidental business activity and you have not maintained books of account. So if you don't maintain books of account under 11 4A, in any case you will be taxed. That itself is a the, under 11 4A also it is a penal uh, provision and the organization will be subjected to various uh, uh, provisions of the law, penal provisions of the law uh, under 11 4A also. Then treating it is a reason for cancellation or while filing the form if the informations are incorrect which does not result to misrepresentation of fact or claiming wrongful tax benefit, those kinds of circumstances have also been included under 115 TD. It is quite harsh and a bit surprising that this is how these cancellation provisions have been structured over the years. Now cancellation provisions include small clerical error also can be a reason for can cancellation. So this was not the intent with which 12A and cancellation provisions were inserted at the time when they came into the statute, but the shape has changed. So the purpose of a, a 115 TD, purpose of 12A and the application has totally changed. So I, I have re reiterated just uh, keeping in view the intensity and seriousness of this provision. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Maharaj, you are very right. And by all these amendments, now it is very clear that there is no exit route. Once the organization is registered under Section 12 A or 12 AB, then they can't surrender the license. They can't, uh, even they fails to make the application, the 115 TD is there. So if, if the only when you want to get rid of this registration, then you have to pay 115 TD tax now. So now, after all these amendments, there is no exit route without 115 TD if you want to get out from the recession process. So there is now no exit route. Uh, now we shall discuss two more amendments uh, uh, to end with. Uh, the first amendment is the benefit of your exemption will not be uh, available if we are filing the updated return. What is the current position? The Finance Act 22 has inserted subsection 8A in section 139 to enable filing of updated return. And nothing in the law that restricts the filing of the updated return by the institutions and claiming exemption under section, section 11 and 12. So as per the present law, uh, uh, that doesn't restrict when the updated return is filed, the NGO will be not able to claim the exemption benefit. Now, what is the proposed amendment? The return of income shall be filed within the time allowed under section 139.1 and 39.4. Now, the conditions to submit return, the condition, the the requirement of uh, submission of return is one of the condition to claim benefit. Now, earlier, the return of income shall be filed within the time allowed under section 139 was uh, written, not 139.1 and 4. Now, as per the proposed amendment, if you want to claim the benefit of section 11 and 12, then the return has to be filed within 139.1 or 139.4, meaning thereby returns filed in pursuance of 139.8a will not be subject to 
in uh, 12 year registration benefit and therefore uh, at the time of filing of uh, return uh, updated return the benefit of uh, registration under section 12 and 11 will not be available now another uh, amendment is the postponement uh, prepondment of the time limit to file form number 9a and 10 we, we don't know why this has been done uh, the reason uh, mentioned that uh, because the auditor has to give the report by september where form 9a and 10 has not been furnished and difficult on the part of the auditors and that's why they are preparing the time limit to two months they could have also said it uh, one month so, so that the do both the work can be done simultaneously but instead of one month they have put it uh, two months so as for the current position minimum 85 percent has to be spent and shortfall in application either you can apply 9a for the to spend the subsequent year or you can go for form 10 to accumulate for five years and the present time limit for filing 9a and 10 is within due date of the funding of the return but as per the proposed amendment, the time limit has been, has been reduced to at least two months prior to the due date of uh, filing of return. That means if the 31st October is the due date of the submitting return, then 31st August becomes the deadline for submitting form number 9A and 10. Now the issue, Manojji, uh, uh, for the updated return, they are saying the benefit of section 11 and 12 will not be available because the returns is not furnished under section 139, uh, 1 or 134. So whether the benefit of section 1310 or 1311 shall be available because section 1310 and 11 inserted from finance act 22 provides that if there is a violation of filing of return in terms of the requirement then the income has to be computed in a different way as provided in this section first Suresh ji i would uh, request you to just to give a context of section 13 and 11 to our viewers yeah. because if they might not be maybe, maybe you can uh, yeah. This so, way, so, uh, uh, bit, yeah. so the, the Finance Act 22 has inserted uh, section 1310 and 1311 to take care of certain specified uh, non-compliances. And those non-compliances were you have not submitted your 10B report in time, you have not submitted the return as per the prescribed timeline, or you have a, a more than 20% of your business receipt in, in violation of section 215. And all those violations will result in withdrawal of benefit of section 11, 12, and 13, and the entire gross receipt were subjected to tax. So, as a welcome provision, last year, last budget, uh, section 1310 and 1311 has been introduced. And they are saying all these three violations, there will not be a complete withdrawal of uh, benefit of section 11, 12, 13. But in such cases, the income shall be computed in a different manner. And what is that different manner? They are saying only out of the income, only the revenue expenditure shall be allowed. That means no allowances for capital expenditure. They are again saying no interest grant shall be allowed. So they are they are saying only revenue expenditure can be claimed against the income if there are specified non-compliances. And again, there is no benefit of statutory accumulation. There is no benefit for any option to be excised. So basically, the NGO can claim the revenue expenditure even if those violations uh, or non-compliances are there provided this revenue expenditure is not in cash or the TDS have been paid. So th these are the framework which has been introduced last year. And again, this year for 139.8, uh, the non-compliance is only due to the filing of return. And that's why the issue comes whether the updated return though uh, is non is non-complying the filing of return timeline, whether they can claim the benefit of section 1310 and 1311 or not. I, I think Manoji, we can. Uh, yes. you, you can continue, you can complete this. Uh, I, I think uh, the concerned NGO can claim the benefit of section 13, 10, and 11 because this is specified violation has already a separate provision to deal with. And there, therefore, even if there is a complete, uh, the, even if the, uh, there is no, uh, in the intent of the memorandum, it is saying the complete withdrawal of the uh, benefit, but the way it is changed, the way uh, that uh, the section has been modified. It becomes a non-compliance of submission of return, and and those submission of non-submission of return or or submission of return the, after the due date uh, has um, uh, has a privilege or has an option to take the income computed in the section 1310 and 1311. Uh, now the second issue is Manoji, what shall be the impact of preponing the time limit of submission of form number nine and form number ten? Because uh, earlier it was uh, uh, within the due date, now two months before the uh, due date. No, no, it, it, it will have a cascading impact because an organization cannot possibly know 
and completes its account. So it, it presupposes that it, all its accounts and returns should be completed two months prior to the filing of return. So for all practical purposes, the organization has to be prepared unless the, the due date of return is extended for charitable institutions separately. So, and if uh, the, uh, the Form A and 9A are not filed two months prior to the normal filing dates, uh, so th th then I, I think the NGOs are going to face the accountants, the auditors, everybody are going to face a difficult time. Would, would you like to add anything? Yeah, yeah, you are right, Manoji. Because after returning of this rate, basically the last date of submitting return de facto becomes uh, 31st of August. Though the Act provides to submit by uh, October, but when you have to determine the amount of accumulation or amount of uh, option to excise next year, that means you need to finalize your accounts. And once this amount has been finalized, there's no point waiting for to submit the return. So in fact, uh, by this change in the timeline, uh, will require the, uh, may compel the organization to uh, finalize their accounts much ahead. Uh, and which I find shall be very, very difficult for uh, most of the NGOs, which have a, a, a wide uh, uh, working locations in different uh, areas. So, uh, so these are uh, some of the uh, eight amendments and we have also discussed uh, some of the issues. Uh, now it is open to, uh, to the house for uh, any issues to be discussed. So can I take the queries now? Yes, yes. So one of the queries is, in light of the slew of amendments and rulings in recent years concerning public charitable trust, is it correct to comment that going forward, approval under Section 11, 12, and ATG, as well as monitoring of compliances for such trust, has become very onerous and cumbersome, requiring review and relook of their activities by every such trust? No, no, that is certainly a fair comment. It, it, it is for trust, it is already very onerous. And if you see, the ITR 7, ITR 7, most of the demanded assessment order we feel are due to mistakes in filing ITR 7. Not that the consultants are incompetent, but the forms and the rules, etc., are so complex and so many contradicting. And even if uh, one particular field, there is some error, there are multiple fields where sin information can be filled. So already uh, the uh, the compliances are cumbersome and the cumbersome and tediousness of compliances is resulting in uh, huge litigations. I can give you without thinking, I can give you example. We in the recent past we have handled where the demand of 30 crore, 40 crore rupees of tax demand, attachment, 20% uh, uh, deposit, etc., were raised, and ultimately, when we approached the, uh, the jurisdiction AO, we were able to get the entire amount reduced because it was just a technical error or it was a problem. So, the trusts uh, uh, recording onerous that is one part compliance. The second part is the intent. The intent also seems to be very clear that the trusts uh, have to have work into a very limited frame and they, they, they will have a very small space virtually right. the possibility of creating corpus has been reduced so in that sense what he's saying is correct correct so uh, next question how will the restriction on inter charity donations impact the project grants or the restricted grants that again is a very important question because this law, because if you see section 224 sub clause 18, there is a provision which says that government grant will be treated as income so in a specified grant. It, it, it doesn't uh, include. So in that sense, restricted grant legal obligations have al always been kept out of the scope of income. But okay. The way the uh, amendments are coming, the rules are being framed and the ITR form has been uh, structured that there is no scope of disclosing or claiming restricted grants. So you, you go, you, if you go to the ITR uh, 7 form, it is either voluntary contribution or corpus donation. There is no other field of uh, grants received. So therefore, what we understand that, that there is some kind of a dichotomy where 
the act, the judicial precedence, the Supreme Court, High Court allows restricted grant. We keep orders, keep on receiving orders from the CIT appeal tribunal, allowing restricted grant as mm -hmm. none income. But the law is structured in such a way that all corporate grants should be treated as income and 85% application will be allowed. So that maybe it should be addressed. So it should be a part of some representation. Some sanity should come. Or formally, the government should make restricted grant as an artificial deemed income, the way voluntary contribution has been made income. That either, either one should be done. Great. So the next question, Saul, is how the amendment restricting inter-charity donations to 85% may have an impact on the amount that mother NGOs or corporate foundations pay to small charitable organizations. Now, mother NGOs are going to have extremely difficult time. In the sense, mother NGOs, when they used to give grant, then suppose mother NGO has received 1 crore rupees, it gives inter-charity grant of 1 crore rupees. Right. Then the mother NGO, if had, it has some internal accrual, up to 15 lakh rupees it can accumulate. But now the mother NGO, even though it has remitted 1 crore rupees, its income and expenditure account will show only 85 uh, lakh applications. So in that sense, it will be extremely difficult for mother NGOs to accumulate. That indefinite accumulation is virtually uh, withdrawn for uh, mother NGOs. So that, that, that is one uh, major impact which mother NGOs will have. And the other impact will be that the other uh, NGOs will be left with this admin expenses at, at their end and that will be, so it will have a, 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 quite a cascade, cascading effect on the function of large, particularly corporate foundations. I think uh, as per the intent of the uh, amendment, the amendment should be that the receiving for receiving NGO the statutory accumulation should be should not be on the receipt on the grant income. In, in spite of that, they have what they have done. They have reduced the amount of application by. Uh, if that easily said, therefore the receiving NGO interchange donation the statutory accumulation will not be available on that part of the income. And, and one more thing I must add: suppose in case of withdrawal of exemption or in case of application of section 1310, etc., it will create confusion because artificially, artificially only 85% uh, of the expenditure is allowed because uh, this inter-charity donation is not in capital expenditure. So, so that way it, 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 it will also create confusion in future assessments. Okay. So shall I take two, three more questions, sir? Yeah, yeah. So um, next question is, NGO was having a registration under 12A for past 20 years, but not applied for renewal till now. What shall it do now? Now it will have to pay exit tax under 115 TD. After it pays exit tax, it can consider applying for 12A again. So okay. this, this, this what is, is the proposed amendment? But uh, if you want to take a risk, he can apply for a provisional registration. Because uh, as of now, he is not being the, till the act is passed. I think Manoj, he can, uh, he may apply for a provisional recession and can take a right. <laughs> but because uh, this recession mechanism changing from first October 2023, and this okay. act is changing, uh, it's not yet passed. So many of the organization has gone for the provisional recession as of now. But, but even if you take provisional registration, you will find it difficult to get the regular reg registration. Yeah, that that is a <laughs> that is a correct. <laughs> And uh, whether registration for trust is compulsory before applying under Section 12AA? Uh, registration uh, as a society trust, that is what you are saying? It's a gen uh, Maybe, yes, it's asking for that because registration of a trust is written this way. Yes, yes. So, uh, technically, even an unregistered organization is eligible for 12 day registration. There is a Supreme Court ruling in which Supreme Court held that an old trust, which are oral trust, even oral trust can buy by virtue an affidavit and local affirmation, they can apply for 12 way registration. So technically, technically under income tax act, registration is not a prerequisite. Correct. It's not an but for all practical purposes, it has to be registered. These are for academic interest only, or in exceptional cases, it has to be registered. So the next query is, uh... If renewal of registration for assessment year 22-23 not filed 
can the trust file for renewal for assessment year 23-24 to avoid tax on corpus money at the end of financial year 22-23? No, renewal is a totally different provision. Renewal is not related with what the trust has done or not. So that renewal window is closed. Renewal window is closed uh, on uh, that 11 no November 2022. So if uh, all those registrations have lapsed, I don't think renewal is uh, any more possible. Suresh No, no, not possible. And that's why the first query has come to applying for provisional or not. Yeah. So renewal window is closed. <laughs> Correct. Then we have project grant donation in kind to other NGO, also eligible 85% only, please clear. No, no, project grant, as we said, that project grant, if it is treated as a part of your income, uh, then it is subject to the same 85% the, the inter-charity grant and most of the organizations treat it as a part of income and 85% application. And as we said, there is judicial precedence, some organization treat okay. as restricted grant, but it is mostly subject to uh, controversy and litigation. Correct, sir. And one last question we have. 85% cap is applicable only for donation or also for grant, I think, for which recipient charity has furnished utilization certificate? Yes, the 85% cap is not related with grant donation. 85% uh, each income from property of the trust, which includes voluntary contribution, which includes grant, unless it is restricted grant. Okay, okay perfect. Great, sir. Thank you so much for such a valuable session. I think this topic is a very hot topic all the time during the budgets. So having a session on this is truly worth it, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This brings us to the seventh session for today on changes proposed in assessment provisions by Asim Chavla, founder, ASC Legal, Solicitors and Advocate. Asim is highly qualified professional with a bar council membership, a fellow chartered accountant and certificates from Harvard Kennedy School and Vienna University of Economics and Business. He has over 20 years of experience in legal, business and tax advice, including international tax, litigation, investment structuring, corporate advisory and regulatory compliance. Asim is published author and regularly contributes to academic and professional journals and conferences. It's great to have you here with us, sir. So thank you, Ridhima, for this very benign introduction. I don't know whether I deserve all this, considering the definitely do the the you know uh, the diligence which is exhibited by uh, Mr. Naveen, uh, the erudite team of taxmen, and all the prolific speakers, including yourself. Uh, uh, I must uh, start with a caveat. Uh, I am a senior standing counsel now with the revenue. So please, uh, I mean, uh, my request is to take these views as views which are my own personal views and they need not uh, represent the views of the revenue, so to speak. But anyway, I'm most grateful to all of you for this uh, wonderful opportunity. And uh, thank you, uh, I mean, uh, sharing uh, uh, this budget marathon with the uh, with all the uh, luminaries is, is indeed a pleasure uh, coming to uh, the topic at hand i i think uh, the team has done uh, a presentation and ridima if you could ask your technical team to upload it and i'll quickly take to the contents of the suggested changes in chapter 14 which deals with assessment as that is my brief uh, for the day and if there are any questions which to uh, flow from there, I'll try my best to take it within my allocated time of about uh, whatever uh, 30 minutes or so. But uh, thank you once again. Yeah, so please upload the presentation. Yes, sure, sir. And Chika, could you please upload the presentation and share it? So, sir, you want us to operate it as yeah, you yeah, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Just one second, sir. So just one note. Yeah, yeah.
So sorry, it is taking an unexpected time. Meanwhile, you can start. Or okay. Uh, so uh, pretty much the uh, changes uh, proposed by Finance uh, Bill 2023 dealing with Chapter 14 uh, comprising the assessment related provisions are uh, changes with regard to the amendments on the uh, updated return computation of 234B interest, uh, which we all understand uh, the concept was introduced a uh, couple of years ago. Uh, when section 139 capital A was introduced uh, laying down the provision of updated returns, uh, which could be filed up to, for two years from the end of the relevant assessment years. Now, Finance Bill 2023 proposes to amend provisions dealing with section 140 capital B4. Those of you who have your finance bill handy with you, uh, yeah, let's go to slide two. Uh, those of you who have handy uh, finance bill, just straight away jump to the clause which deals with the amendments to provisions of section 140B, subsection 4, which clarifies that the interest payable under 234B, which is the delay or deferment of advance tax, shall be computed on amount equal to assessed tax as reduced by the amounts of uh, advance tax or prepaid taxes which have been claimed in the earlier returns. So this helps in clarifying uh, uh, the position uh, by omitting a particular phrase and the effective date is from 1st April 2022. This is a retrospective amendment. Why? Because the concept of updated return was also introduced by Finance Act 2022. So this is the only change with, with which we have with regard to the concept of scheme of filing of updated uh, taxes, uh, updated return. So, uh, can we move to slide two, please? Uh, if if one can flip, yeah, this is what I was talking about. Uh, the change. Uh, if you carefully look at uh, the last uh, but one bullet of this particular slide, uh, you will figure out that the the phrase which is italicized is what has been omitted, and uh, there and this is the impact of the amendment proposed in the finance bill 2023 yeah moving on to the next slide please can we move to the next slide yeah so uh, one more uh, uh, stakeholder comes into the picture now so to speak uh, as if we had a shortage of number of experts uh, uh, which should be around while the uh, audit process is continuing. So what has happened now is that a cost accountant uh, can be requisitioned for the purposes of inventory valuation. Now the lawmakers do have a belief that inventory valuation is something which over a period of time has become complex. And it's not easy for uh, the assessing officer to purely rely on his skills and judgment. And at the same time, uh, we all understand that under various compliance provisions under corporate law, you have a mandatory cost audit in place for certain section of manufacturing and other companies. So just to have an ability of an expert who could be requisitioned, there is an amendment uh, proposed uh, in section 142 to capital A, where a AO could direct the assessee to submit a valuation report, which is procured from a cost accountant for the purposes of uh, inventory valuation. So the way you have experts which are impaneled, be it impaneled experts of chartered accountants to conduct special audit. On similar lines, you have an you will have an impaneled panel of cost accountants whose services could be requisitioned by the uh, assessing officer to furnish a report on the inventory uh, valuation. And the effective date of this particular uh, provision, which has been introduced wide amending section 142 of the Income Tax Act uh, is with effect from 1st April 2023. Next slide, please. Yeah, 
so uh, this is pretty much uh, uh, the amendment which deals with uh, in, um, uh, introduction of the services of a nominated cost accountant yeah next slide please <coughs> the remuneration etc will be determined by the chief commissioner or the principal commissioner uh, in accordance with the prescribed guidelines as i said there's a panel uh, of cost accountant which would be maintained and uh, accordingly the modalities with regard to fees housekeeping etc uh, would be kept in mind now let's come to the next uh, provision which is an amendment in the reassessment provision which would be of uh, somewhat interest to the audience because reassessment provisions have pretty much uh, taken the center stage in the last couple of years ever since the new scheme of reassessment uh, was introduced and still now we find uh, courts being very busy uh, with various uh, litigations and pursuits on account of reassessment uh, being contested uh, at various uh, fora and the matter has traveled already to supreme court on on numerous uh, or couple of occasions with the this famous decision of Ashish Agarwal and Anshul Jain and and it's likely to knock the doors of the Supreme Court uh, uh, one more time uh, on various aspects. So <clears throat> coming to the uh, provision pertaining to the limitation, uh, there have been uh, some amendments uh, in section 148, 149 and let's look at those amendments. Next slide please. First and foremost, the return period which is required to be filed once a notice is issued under 148 has to be furnished uh, within a period of three months, so to speak. Now, if uh, three months are extended, then uh, you have to furnish it within the extended time. Now, assuming the period is extended, by the AO uh, upon an application and you do not end up filing the set tax return so there could be two situations either you don't either you file it within three months or you are unable to file you seek an extension and the extension is forthcoming and uh, even after the extended period you do not file it then if at all you file such return beyond the period of three months or the extended time as the case may be that return shall be deemed to be a return not filed under 139. So in other words, it's not a return which is which would be considered uh, and taken on record for the purposes of uh, reassessment provision. So that's one hard stop uh, timeline which has now been provided uh, by virtue of amendment to section 148. Now, <clears throat> the next amendment is with regard to the time period and we all understand the time period is encapsulated under section 149 of the act so let's look at the time period for issuance of notice which is in 149 of the act and uh, next slide please <clears throat> now what happens uh, is that there could be instances uh, where search survey uh, operations are initiated just in the nick of time before the end of the financial year and because they are undertaken before the end of the financial year the time period which will be reckoned for the purposes of limitation would be reckoned keeping in mind that particular financial year so due to paucity of time uh, although the revenue feels that it should get some more time but it does not get time or they have to do a hurried job because the year is coming to an end and if they don't do it uh, then the then uh, you have 31st march uh, staring at you now before i uh, move further uh, let's bear in mind the new scheme of reassessment the new scheme of reassessment which we have uh, in so far as matters which deals with search Section 148, capital A is given a go by, right? And in so far as survey provisions are concerned, section 148A compliance has to be done. 
However, in both the situations of search and survey, it would be deemed that there is an information which is already available. So the only difference between search and survey is the fact that in case of search, under the new scheme of reassessment, we all understand that the search provisions are also encapsulated or embraced now in the package of reassessment. Earlier, we had special assessment provisions dealing with search 153 capital A, B, C. And prior to that, those who've been doing income tax search related practice, we had chapter 14B, which was the special provisions again dealing with search popularly known as block assessment. So what happened? Block assessment was there up until 2005, which paved way for special assessment provisions for search 153 capital A, B, C. Once the new reassessment regime was overhauled and we had the new reassessment regime effective 21, the 153A, B, C were given a go by. Now, even the search reassessment will be conducted under the reassessment provisions. You don't have to look at any other separate provisions for assessment for search. The search related provisions in terms of search operations, etc. under 132, they stay as it is. So once a substantive action under 132 has happened, instead of moving to 153 ABC, you will come to reassessment provision. However, because the search has already been conducted, it will be deemed that there is some information which is available. So 140, that provision is given a go by. And also 148A, the GK and drive shaft provision, which has now been encapsulated uh, in the reassessment provision where the assessing officer has to furnish a reason, uh, replies are sought, and then he has to pass an order under 148 capital A D. Uh, that also has been gone, uh, given a go by in search, but not in survey. So survey also, you there is a first level of uh, go by given insofar as deemed information, but 148 capital A hurdle has still to be negotiated in a survey matter by the tax department, right? So to that extent, there is a difference between search and survey, right? Now moving forward, the whole reassessment has to be carried out and there are certain survey and search actions which do happen in the nick of time, so to speak. Now, assuming that there are search or surveys action which are made post 15th of March of a financial year, then the time available is only 15 days. So that uh, leeway is being granted and we'll see the leeway when we look at the next slide, please. Yes, now what the finance bill does, if you look at the second bullet, that after the second proviso in section 149, a third, two provisos are proposed to be inserted. And I have underlined this, which is not a good, uh, I mean, good postulation when you do PowerPoint presentations, you are not supposed to underline, but just to give an emphasis, any post search requisition where 148 expires on 31st March of such financial year. In that particular case, 15 days shall be excluded and it shall be deemed to have been issued on 31st March of such financial year by virtue of which you get another year, so to speak. Right? Similarly, where the information referred in explanation one emanates from a survey action under 133 capital A or 131, which is the third bullet, again, 15 days shall be excluded where the survey etc does takes takes place after 15 days so the limitation provision in the sixth proviso again has been substituted that it should not uh, coming before coming to that the limitation provision should not exceed seven days to the ao for passing the order now all these amendments are with effect from first of april 2023 the genesis or the rationale of this amendment is to give little more time uh, to the to the revenue to be able to 
conclude their fact finding exercise and by virtue of this they get one more year now let's move on to the next slide please now 151 also has been a bane of contention uh, in so far as whether a proper and a requisite approval has been obtained from the uh, which we call it as sanction uh, for the purposes of initiating reassessment uh, provision and we have lot of judgments nc cable etc where you found courts uh, frowning situations uh, where either proper sanction or not a reason sanction was Uh, not on record and therefore reassessment provisions uh, uh, reassessment pro initiations were quashed on account of lack or proper or reason sanction now what 151 does is that uh, on an administrative side that the authority for the sanction would be the principal chief commissioner uh, and where there is no principal chief commissioner the chief commissioner should give approval within a period of 3 years now to clarify the specified authority for cases where reopening was done after 3 years from the relevant assessment year stating that the relevant authority under section 151 shall be the principal chief commissioner principal director general chief commissioner or dg so where you are looking at situations where reassessment uh, cases are for a period of are a period of years which go beyond 3 years then these are the specified authority so one needs to keep in mind that when you are looking at cases where reassessment is being done for a period beyond 3 years then these are the designated authorities we all are very well aware that under the new reassessment regime you have a go back period up to 10 years so to speak so anything beyond 3 years Uh, just consider whether the relevant authority which is the sanctioning authority as specified under 151 has granted the approval or not next slide please the proviso to 151 has been proposed to be inserted so as to provide that while computing the period of 3 years the period which has been excluded or extended as in accordance with 149 shall also be taken into consideration this is pretty much a consequential or a harmonization amendment that when you compute your 3 years the periods which are the limitation periods as included or excluded in 149 will also be Uh, taken into consideration i mean uh, i'm sure if the participants and the delegates can appreciate that this uh, particular uh, proviso has been proposed only to uh, harmonize the situation again all these amendments are with effect from 1st of april 2023 next slide please okay uh, i do acknowledge and uh, Uh, welcome uh, a very dear uh, respected uh, pramod sir i think he's he's joined and uh, he's he is really one of our north star when it comes to the tax jurisprudence so i welcome uh, uh, pramod sir uh, <clears throat> now moving forward uh, the there is a slight alignment with regard to the uh, provisions encapsulated under section 153 with regard to completion of assessment now remember there is a difference between 149 and 153 which we are all aware the elementary difference 153 takes care of the completion of assessment 149 deals with the timeline with regard to the with regard to 149 which we have just dealt with so don't get confused between 149 which is the limitation period right and 153 is the time limit for completion meant of assessment now everybody felt even in the faceless regime uh, this 9 uh, months period is a is a short period to complete the entire process of uh, assessment uh, more so when you have significant time under 143 to proviso to issue the notice so if you get a notice fairly towards the fag end technically you get very little time as little time sometimes as 6 months only 
for you to be able to to hurriedly do the assessment and now with paceless regime there is a fair bit of back and forth so the nine months period uh, seemed very short that has now been uh, it is proposed to amend uh, 153 1a to push the uh, the time limit uh, to 12 months from existing nine uh, from the end of the financial year in which the return is furnished so all along in the last couple of years we saw the limitation period from 24 months getting shrunk to nine uh, with every uh, finance act uh, chipping away the time period for completion went of assessment uh, now a three month breather has been uh, given so this is a, a very uh, positive and uh, a welcome uh, a relief, so to speak, to the tax uh, practitioner and to the in-house uh, tax community. Yeah, next slide, please. <clears throat> Similarly, uh, next slide, could we move on to the next slide, please? Yeah. Similarly, when you have search related uh, operations, Finance Bill 2023 proposes to insert subsection 3 capital A, where uh, they all get uh, extended by 12 months in all categories of uh, post uh, search and post requisition assessment. The, again, the period available uh, shall be extended by 12 months. So again, uh, there is there was felt that you have lesser time to uh, accomplish the assessment or reassessment initiated uh, pursuant to search matter. So that also gets extended by 12 months. So that's also uh, that, of course, uh, as a taxpayer, you don't want uh, the revenue to get more time, but then uh, fair to say uh, to be able to align uh, situation and conduct proper scrutiny, uh, this also has been. Uh, in, introduced again, the as I said, the heading of the slide is aligning the timeline provision. So all this is in the process of uh, uh, alignment. Now uh, coming to uh, some other alignment of uh, timelines, uh, we have uh, alignments in revisionary proceedings under 163 uh, and the alignment uh, with regard to the time limit to pass uh, orders for transfer pricing. Yeah, let's look at those. Yeah, next slide, please. So, <clears throat> Finance Bill 2023 proposes that 153 is amended to provide that provisions of uh, subsection 3, 5, and 6 shall be applicable with regard to revisionary proceedings also uh, and uh, 264 orders. And again, these amendments are with effect from 1st of April. 2023. So these amendments enable the principal chief commissioner and the chief commissioner to pass an order of revision under these sections because either to they did not uh, refer to orders passed by passed by such authorities. So situations where orders could where orders could be passed by such authorities is now what is now conceived again the idea is to streamline and harmonize various provisions of the act so that all are on the same page some provisions did empower a particular designated authority to do something while the other provisions did not recognize uh, those I, I think you will hear them in extenso from uh, respected promoji when he takes up the appeal provisions because again the same thing was happening few uh, few enabling uh, amendments have been proposed uh, again to harmonize those. Uh, Asim, I'll suggest you deal with this at length. I'm going to be very brief. I, so please, please. No, no, I'm just saying that you are going to speak on this. So I'm, I'm rather trying to suggest that I'm not going to speak on this. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Moving on. Uh, <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, uh, again, uh, I leave the uh, the last word to Pramod sir on speaking on the appellate side of it. Uh, suffice to say that a fair bit of revenue is locked up in litigation. And now you have uh, 
joint commissioner appeals i will not use the word that these are small causes appeal but you are creating a larger pool of the commissionerates uh, so to speak to deal with situations of course the orders which are passed by authorities superior to the rank of joint commissioner appeals will not be appealable before the joint commissioner appeals again uh, leave it to i leave it to the authority uh, to speak on this uh, next slide please yes again these amendments are again uh, with effect from 1st of april 2023 so pretty much uh, the take away uh, from this uh, very quick run run down on the amendments proposed in chapter 14 deal with the reassessment timeline under 149 giving one more year 153 harmonizing the few uh, or equalizing few situations where few authorities were not designated and few were designated uh, i think the highlight or the larger headline point is giving one more year uh to finish uh, situations where just in time surveys or search were conducted post 15th of march uh, giving three more three more months to complete the assessment uh, proceedings so these are the larger uh, take away uh, i think with this uh, i'm sure all of us are extremely eager to lend our ears to uh, promote sir uh, back to you ridima uh, thank you so much sir that was in a very insightful session indeed uh, can i take few queries if you allow uh, sir i think you uh, you are on mute one or two and rest i can uh, i can uh, you know reply offline i'm sure everybody is keen we ought we should pay a premium to the time of promote ji i see my man retired man i have all time in the world premium is on <laughs> please carry Uh, intellectually i think you're still hyperactive no <laughs> okay ridima let's take one or two very quickly okay okay so um one thing can the faceless prescribed authority issue 143 to notice to all assessees including central and international taxation cell no why since a few of them are not still part of faceless no? so i mean you can't uh, Say this statement, card branch. Yes, you know there are still an e-assessment situation going on. So there's a difference between faceless and e-assessment, and certainly the investigation department is still not covered with faceless. So the answer is is a qualified yes or a qualified no. Next, yeah, two more questions. That's it. I can answer all questions, but it's just that I don't Definitely. want to wait. <laughs> Correct. Uh, so next is. can additions under section 153a be made in the absence of incriminating materials for that sub duty is the, the matter is going on before supreme court as we speak oh okay the great cars bench is hearing the matter and i thought some extensive arguments happened unless the judgment is reserved and the arguments are concluded noted noted so another one i think is related to appeals i'll take it forward with pramod sir Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. It I was a big thank time. you for the special thing of uh, being able to give face time with Pramodji. <laughs> <laughs> That's so sweet, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Over to you. Thank you. So we are now transitioning to a session on appeals, penalties, and prosecutions, led by the esteemed Mr. Pramod Kumar, former Vice President ITAC. Mr Pramod Kumar is highly experienced chartered accountant with over 15 years in practice and 22 years as a member and vice president in the income tax appellate tribunal he has worked on UND project and served as a director for the international association of tax judges established by the tax court of canada mr kumar is renowned in india and internationally for his innovative contributions to the field of international taxation and transfer pricing It's an honor to have you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ritima. Thank you for very kind words. Uh, I'll not be sharing a presentation. I'll okay. Speak general terms. And thank you, Asim, for very kind words. Uh, things which I did not deserve also were included, but that's your mm -hmm. usual. That's a usual complaint with you anyway. So I'll live with it. My topic today is to talk about. appeals penalties and prosecutions and in the last budget there hasn't been much of a change in this 
except in a very peripheral manner. So anyway, whatever little amendments have taken place, uh, I will talk about it and I'll share with you my perspective on what I think about this and what more probably needs to be done. The first and foremost, I'll pick up a rather mundane topic, otherwise mundane, of cross objections. Uh, if you look at section 253.4, 253.4 permitted to file cross objections against the orders of the uh, commissioner appeals. If you read the exact words, it says the assessing officer or the assessee, as the case may be, on receipt of notice that an appeal against the order of the commissioner appeals has been preferred under subsection one or subsection two by the other party, may thereof within 30 days of the receipt of notice file a memorandum of cross objection verified in a prescribed manner against any part of the order of the commission appeals and such memorandum shall be disposed of as if within the time prescribed under subsection three. Now, interestingly, instead of the expression commissioner appeals, what the uh, amendment seeks to do is, it says any part of such order, that is the order appeal against. So if you are thinking about the impact being confined to the DRP order, so far so good. The only practical difference it makes, and that's a difference which has been recognized in the example given in the memorandum explaining the provision, that now the orders, now the cross objection can only also be filed against the orders of the DRP. To, to that extent, rightly or wrongly, whether it's appropriate, well advised or not, particularly when at the time you receive the order of the DRP, there's already a scrutiny of the order, a call is taken whether to appeal against it or not, and then you want to supplement this call by further opportunity uh, when an appeal is filed by the department, that apart, but it's understandable. However, when you read the fine print and you read the uh, memorandum, para five particularly, it says something very curious. It says, however, it's pertinent to note that appeal can be uh, made to the in appellate tribunal against the orders other than commissioner appeals also, like principal commissioner or commissioner or principal director or director, etc. And then it justifies why, so that the parties are on an even ground and opportunity should be given to the assessing officer to file cross objection against this. To be honest, I, it's not clear to me as to which order they have in mind other than the orders of the CRP, but if they are referring to the or, other orders which are passed by the principal commissioner, commissioner, director, principal director, then one has to bear in mind the fact that the question of cross objection is something parallel to appeal. If somebody cannot file an appeal against an order, there can't be a question of cross objection. So I do not know which order of the assessing officer in which order of the director, assessing officer can be an appeal. And it, you know, to that extent, it should remain in parity. That is one aspect which I would think uh, is little, uh, I'm, I'm sure there must be some good reason for this, just that I couldn't find that good reason beyond the fact that DRP orders are not only appealable for quite some time, now, even the uh, cross objection comes up. The other tactical aspect of this cross objection is that my experience uh, in the tribunal tells me that generally the question of cross objection doesn't arise because once you have an order which can be appealed against, there's a systematic scrutiny of this order. So once this scrutiny takes place and then a conscious call is taken as to whether this order is to be appealed against or not. Now, the only occasions when cross objections are generally filed by the department are the occasions when during the course of the argument, the arguing counsel or the arguing DR realizes that there was something lacking which needs to be supplemented. Such a practice, to what extent we should encourage such a practice is something on which probably a conscious call needs to be taken. And now that uh, it has been done in the case of DRP, I'm sure that's the same manner in which this provision of cross objection is likely to be used. It might mean a few extra appeals, so far as the DRP appeals are concerned, where at the time of the argument, we are a bright idea. Departmental representative has an idea about supplementing something which they couldn't decide earlier. That's a conscious revisiting of the appellate right. Well, that's how it is. 
Now, the second important amendment which has taken place uh, in the present budget so far as the appellate mechanism is concerned is revival. I would say revival because except for the name deputy commissioner to joint commissioner and additional commission, there's a much change. Revival of the another, another level of appeals, another level of functionary in the first appellate process. And that is where the joint commissioner appeal and additional commissioner appeal has been revived. Today, it's something very good, very good from the point of view that people at the hem of the affairs in the government have realized that they have a problem with respect to huge pendency at the first appellate level. And I'm told by the people who know that this figure is an alarming figure, which is around 500,000 cases as on today. Now, 500,000 cases in the first appeals being in process is something very serious. And you have to think about it from this angle, that the average disposal of the tribunal in good old years was just about 50,000. As a matter of fact, those of you who are interested in trivia, the best disposal that we had, uh, the, when I say we, I, refer, I still refer to my old empire, old habits, old habits die hard. The best disposal that the tribunal had in any of the year was in 2004-05, where it was 78,901. Average disposal till four or five years ago used to be 50,000. Now, just imagine this. If 30% of these appeals are to be disposed of, are to be coming to the tribunal, you have 150,000 appeals waiting in the wings for coming to the tribunal. How is it going to clog the system? Thank God people have realized the gravity of the situation. But then the question is how to solve this problem? Can we solve this problem with just some additional hands? Certainly, these additional hands will help. And that's why I say it's very thoughtful on the part of the government to have realized that we need to address this alarming issue. But I'm sure that much more than these extra hands, I think that's where the ITAT can share uh, their experiences with the department on quick disposal of the appeals. There was a time when ITAT had a pendency, a docket pendency of 300,000 which should now be around 35,000. It's a huge journey. And that was a time when our, uh, you know, the departmental pendency would probably be 50,000, which is to 500,000. Now, if we have to learn anything from the income tax appellate tribunal, so far as the disposal is concerned, there'll be a lot of activities. And even our recent uh, steps, which have been taken the last few years, this is, uh, the, uh, you know, this is something which could show the path to other departments. You have to do the bunching, you have to ensure that the uh, allotment of the cases to the officers concerned takes into account their profile, their ability to work hard. And then you have to identify the matters where appeals have been filed just to keep the issues alive. And then you have to identify some functional areas and do some bunching on the functional level also. And then I would also think because the uh, uh, pendency has arisen mainly in the cases where the faceless appeal mechanism has been put to take a feedback from the people who are actually manning the affairs, who are actually performing the job as CIT appeal in face face era. Take some input from them and make some minor adjustments to the mechanism of faceless appeal you have today. If the, the pendency has a reason because of the glitches in the faceless process and because of some inherent issues in the functioning of the faceless process, my take of the situation is, that unless you address those fundamental issues, just addressing, just increasing the number of hands may not suffice. For the last several years, this work has virtually come to a standstill. And as a matter of fact, this has come to a level that whenever this work is disposed, you know, these pending appeals are disposed of, there are going to be many other functional issues, including the issues on how to, you know, uh, address these things in the second appeal. And a quick resolution of a tax dispute is by itself a tax incentive. That kick resolution is, I'm, I'm afraid, under severe, severe problem. We are taking in undue time, unduly long time in disposing of the appeals in the first appellate level. And it is now affecting their, their issues about the collection of the demands in the meantime. There are also issues about ensuring that the demands, which are legitimate demand, these demands are not recovered in the meantime. And now my only apprehension is when we, we know, when I think of the uh, youngsters coming as uh, joint commissioner appeal, that whether these officers who are not as experienced 
in the adjudication process and who are not ex as experienced in the revenue service also, whether they'll be able to take the kind of calls which are required to be taken. To a tax consultant, probably it wouldn't make a difference. You are dealing with a faceless process in the CIT appeals, in, in most of the areas, and the same thing in all likelihood is likely to continue so far as the, uh, the DC appeal or JCIT appeals is concerned. So now with the increase in the forum, as I said, one good thing is that someone has got the hands at the right place, and this is an issue which is being considered. So once you identify the problem, then there's a good possibility of you being able to solve it. I'm sure with the pragmatic approach that the department has, it should, it should only be a matter of time that uh, these appeals will start um, you know, getting disposed of. Uh, there have been many suggestions about how to do it. There was once upon a time, a talk about a specialized judicial branch in the income tax department itself. I don't know how workable is this, but as long as officers take posting in the appeals as something that they are not comfortable with, there would always be justification of finding out or identifying people who have a neck for the judicial work and who will probably be inclined and motivated to do it. One thing is certain, apart from whatever legislative amendment which has been made, you will need some out of the box thinking. You will need to, uh, you know, depending on what variables you have, you can't have a straight jacket formula for everything. What worked in the IT, IT may or may not work elsewhere. But you will need to address this issue as to what, how exactly we have to ensure that these appeals are disposed of. Then, then there'll be issues regarding jurisdiction, appeals transfer patient, uh, taking place from CIT appeal to joint commissioner and vice versa. But then good move, uh, you know, certainly something in, in right direction. And uh, I'm sure it is you know, of interest to the professionals also, because at the end of the day, their efficiency depends on the efficiency of the department in, in continuing with the matter in disposing of the things with you. So that is something which is very positive. And I'm sure which is probably going to help uh, professionals, help taxpayer, and which is going to help people reach tax certainty faster. 100 uh, new people, joint commissioners and initial commissioners working in this is, is something quite, quite uh, substantial. Now, third point on which the amendment is made so far as the appellate process is concerned, that is with regard to 271 uh, AAB, AAC, AD, et cetera. This is just with respect to those such cases, 68, 69 uh, additions and uh, the entries, which uh, fake entries or the entries which are right, but they don't find place where the powers have been given to, powers were given the last uh, budget to the commissioners for making the additions. Now, uh, commissioner appeals, et cetera. Now, so far as this is only a consequential adjustment and it, it doesn't uh, have much, much you know, substance. Then there are issues with regard to 154 in respect to 263 matters uh, by the principal commissioners, principal directors, where again, the kind of amendment which has been made, which is more of a consequential amendment than, uh, you know, rather than having an amendment of substance. As we talk about it, there's one thing which comes to my mind, and that is with regard to 154 by the DRP. I was hoping that at least in this budget, this some clarity will come because there's some kind of a dichotomy so far as 154 by the DRP is concerned. Uh, since DRP is not falling in the uh, definition, of the income tax authority under section 116, that's not covered by 154 of the act, even though under rule 13 of the DRP rules, you nevertheless have the power to rectify. We're still not clear about what is the time limit or the mechanism. So I'm sure probably in you know one of the, uh, at, at a later stage, this issue also is, is taken up and uh, the clarity is brought about the 154 uh, by the DRP itself or its base place. Now, so far as prosecution is concerned, there are two changes and which are, um, I would think, get a very uh, peripheral level. One change is, of course, uh, with regard to the amendment in 276B, uh, and of course, there's a corresponding amendment 271 capital C also, uh, on the tax deductions under 194R, 194S, 194B, A, et cetera, because these were the benefits of acquisite in respect of a business transfer of virtual digital asset and online gaming, uh, uh, online uh, game winnings, which is coming now. 
uh, if you have, there's a uh, beach in this regard, then the, uh, this also comes in the scope of the 271 capital C and 271 uh, uh, and 276B. Now, so far as a 276A is concerned about which Honorable Finance Minister uh, said that uh, it's an attempt for decriminalization and it's in the process of decriminalization, undoubtedly that's something that comes. Uh, but nevertheless, we must clear in mind the fact that the provisions of the uh, in bankruptcy code, they uh, override the provisions of the act. And since now you have a separate solvency code anyway, and the role of the liquidator is governed by this. So to that extent, uh, to what extent does section 178 it still hold good and to what extent it should be, there should be a prosecution for non-compliance for, for ensuring uh, that the uh, taxes which are due have not been kept aside or taking the approval. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't really make much sense to me because when 178 itself is superseded or is uh, overshadowed by the IBC provisions, there would not be uh, much to do um, this. Now, uh, these are the small things, but then there are a few things which I thought somebody could probably, uh, these were required to be dealt with with respect to the tribunal also, with respect to the institution where I worked for a long time. I was hoping that there will be some amendment in section 252A, which is the concert, which is the sort of linkage, uh, uh, you know, between the, which deals with the service conditions of the people who join prior to the reforms taking place. Because 252A, if you are aware, it deals with section 184 of the Finance Act uh, 2017, which has anyway become uh, irrelevant today when you, uh, after the uh, Terminal Reforms Act and the rules have come into play. But there's one anomaly in this, that if somebody who is joined the tribunal prior to uh, the uh, reforms and you know four-year tenure taking place he used to be promoted and it's taken as an appointment because whether you are appointed as a vice president that's also an appointment then he ends up getting just four years well nobody has an issue with the interpretation that the government has given that's uh, that's probably that's how the law stands as it is but somebody has to take a policy decision about whether they can be disincentive for promotion whether somebody on his promotion may lose a few years of his job. Of course, as, as disciplined government servants, the affected people will never even talk about it. I'm sure they will not be even happy that I'm talking about it. But I think this is time that government, instead of simply interpreting this, government takes a conscious call as to what extent 252A has to be kept in this form. Of course, even without the amendment with the help of General Process Act, one could justify certain interpretations. But I would think that this, this was a time when everybody was expecting that there has to be a conscious decision about the fact whether any tribunal officers, tribunal members can be incentivized for their going for promotion. And this uh, alarming, sad situation that some of our very, very bright members, I mean, each one of them is better than each other. I had at least three of them in Mumbai uh, benches when I was in job. They did not even opt for being considered for promotion. Uh, I would have thought this issue was required to be addressed. I hope and I pray that maybe in the times to come, this issue gets uh, considered and the government takes call one way or the other, whatever way it thinks face. Similarly, for the faceless tribunal, which is uh, still some, uh, you know, something uh, about this, there's no clarity. We still have time of one more year, but it appears that the stakeholders have, have some uh, reservations about the faceless tribunal. So, I mean, we need not do everything in a particular way. If the way the faceless uh, first appealer process has gone, it is not necessary that something like the same uh, is to be done at the level of the ITAT. But perhaps the time has come that some call is to be taken about it, about this, about the manner in which it is to be implemented. Is it to be mellowed down? Is it to be discarded? We, uh, rather than leaving these things as these are, Today, you have a tribunal where unprecedented infrastructure development has taken place, uh, particularly in the regime of uh, Justice Bhatt and uh, Mr. Pannu. They have done unimaginable work in the infrastructure development. We are, we are ready for the next generation of uh, technology, the kind of uh, 
work that has been done in the last few years is incredible i think we have to we have to build on this we have to see what at to what level we can introduce the technology and the technology can be introduced only when we have a statutory framework for this the the framework that we have about the faceless the tribunal probably it needs more clarity and it needs some concrete steps with the without you know making drastic changes in the existing system but making the best out of the infrastructure which has been created out of the uh, work commendable work which the tribunal has done in the last few years particularly and then to make the best out of it uh second uh, of course one consideration i always uh think about is uh, uh, the catchment area of the tribunal presidency um, if you have a seven years requirement and then you want a tax judge then probably it's time i'm sure the government must have applied its mind to it but i from my uh, uh from my narrow vision i would say i would have thought that it's the time we need greater application of mind about this what kind of people are required we have people inside the tribunal who need to be at the helm of the affairs are they not good enough what is the feedback that we have from two experiments we had in the last few years regarding taking taking people from outside there were billion judges and their contribution has been immense in many fields but uh, is it what the government expected or or is uh, you know what is today required to make the best use of this second appellate forum particularly at a time when in the years to come there has to be there there is going to be so much of work for the tribunal it's going to play such a critical role so maybe some uh, more clarity on this would have been in order but these are all wishes uh yeah i think i mentioned to you that's all uh, which i find so far as the uh, amendments in the budgets are concerned and which i thought there could be more areas if you have some questions i'll be happy to answer this insightful session so i have one question coming up for oh. sir so why has the government not addressed the authority for advance ruling board dispute resolution infrastructure as yet what has happened to the opening of new branches chairman appointment etc this would help us clearing pendency of a lot of cases what are your views see on a very personal note i think judicial work is something which administrative officers do not really are much inclined to see they see it a kind as a kind of you know necessary evil rather than as a, a core professional area now uh i i, I don't know now the way the authority for advance ruling has been reconstituted as a board of advance ruling i don't even know in what form is it going to work how judicious will it be and what kind of faith people have in it ultimately every institution is as good as the people as the faith that the citizenry has in it now, right probably it's not on the priority and it's not as much on the taxpayers uh, uh you know wish list also as to what do they want from this i i i i couldn't agree with you more that having a robust system of advance ruling would reduce considerable burden from the judicial forums and that is uh, that contributes much more to the tax certainty than anything than anything else. that's a good idea next we have what are your opinion to reduce number of litigations under income tax oh god see <laughs> uh, that is something interesting uh, first of all one have to realize that if I, this is what i believe from my experience that 50% of the appeals by the income tax department are the appeals which the officers themselves know are not required to be done as i was saying just either to keep the issue alive or to keep themselves safe you know sometimes they are under the uh, apprehension that if i don't file an appeal tomorrow i might be blamed for this so we need to have a strong system about uh, ensuring you know when that the people who take decision bona fide decision in the performance of their duties are protected so as uh, when uh, when this thing comes into play i think number of de- uh, appeals from the department will reduce secondly i would also think that sometimes judiciary is also blamed because we are so inconsistent that uh, even if somebody is making a shoot the moon request he has a genuine hope that some bench might help him out from this so when you try to be uh, too uh, unpredictable too you know too generous then also you have too many um, 
litigation and finally the kind of uh, work which is done at the assessment level that is the ultimately you know that is where the work is being created if these officers work uh, in a more uh, in a manner which is more responsive to society and which is the you know and in accordance with the policies of the government without fear without worries and without being uh, you know seen as a kind of uh, my bap approach then the problems will not arise but the trouble is that many of us we still live in the legacy where once you have a government position to hold you think you are the boss and you decide what is to be done there's so much of uh, you have a tendency to believe that you have unfettered discretion now these illusions also create the kind of work which happens and uh, and finally i uh, think it's, it's at the cost of the taxpayer every time there is a litigation i mean every judge has to realize this that the his salaries his perks is everything at the cost of a helpless taxpayer who has been wronged very well said one hopes and prays this is controlled can i take few more please please so uh, r 1433 order covered under jurisdiction of joint commissioner appeals from the quick look at the section i found yes as the amendment takes place because if you look at uh, at, at their first roman roman i it says an order being an intimation under so it's so where the assessor of or any order of assessment under sub section 3 of section 143 or 144 so answer is there in the in the section itself answer is yes but it will of, of course be a subject to a monetary limit which we will see in the times to come as to what is the monetary limit that they put within that monetary limit 1433 will be covered correct so uh, i don't know if i should ask you this we have got in chat box c ashok once has asked so what is your opinion on the usage of the word my lord in the act uh, of the word my lord oh god i used to get very uncomfortable about it it shouldn't be there see uh, all you you know uh, i do not know of any judicial officer who would like to be addressed as my lord but people who are appearing in that court they want to take them to a level where they they actually start believing that they are very highly respected people and you know this is the man who is making them so uh, comfortable so this is more of a courtesy of the lawyers than the you know than the desire of the judicial officers and i personally i mean more so because i was an accountant member every time somebody said my lord in the my court room i used to think uh, he or she is addressing only the judicial member because i had already hit the ceiling uh-huh. hard in the tribunal it's very un- i mean on a uh, as a as a as a normal citizen i think uh, this is very kind of a feudal uh, thing it should be you know done away with uh, there is one more question oh uh, this is about the about the pillar 1 and 2 proposals of the oecd are good enough for the enactment under the indian tax law what amendment are needed if any now so far as the uh, yes yes ridima go ahead yes sir um, so should i repeat the question do you think that the current pillar 1 and 2 proposals of oecd are good enough for enactment under income tax laws what amendments are needed if any no you said you are going to answer the question that's what i read there uh, no 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 actually you were asking answering no, that as, as a matter of fact many people were expecting i was one of them we were we were hoping for some amendment so far as pillar 2 is concerned because that's where the amendments are required as to what amendments are needed it's quite a complex issue because if you have to have these rules coming into place then it's a complex set of uh, uh it's it's a it's a complex set of variables which will play a role in this i'm not too sure about the pillar 1 because that's where the additional revenue question comes pillar 2 is certainly yes are the okay. cpa orders accessible to accession number 15 correct correct and one is there in the chat uh, another uh, chat box should i read it sir yeah please so the cit appeals orders are exhibible to rectification under section 154 but many a times the cit appeals sometimes delay this just to be on safe side and either the appeal is preferred so you take on this sir you must as, as i was saying earlier also that uh, you know commissioner when you see commissioner appeals departmental representatives people sitting in the drp you must understand they are essentially administrative officers they are tax administrators performing judicial functions and performing judicial function is not a part of their daily you know their uh, which is something when they do their entire career 
it's only in some segments which they do it. So their comfort level with doing the judicial work is probably, in, I mean, not in all cases, but in many cases, an average comfort level of sticking their uh, you know, neck out on judicial issues, likelihood is much lower than then in, in a judicial forum. Now, when you say about mistake apparent on regard, which, which is what uh, 154 deals with, if it is one of those mistakes, which is actually glaring, obvious, and on which there should be, you know, there shouldn't be much debate, and which, which may not have many consequences, the, the chances are always there that you will rectify this. But where in the garb of 154, you go to the issues which may have serious ramifications. Of course, 154 may also have serious ramifications. My experience is that uh, commissioner appeals are generally a little reluctant or they are not as aggressive as they otherwise, as knowledgeable and as wise they are. They, you don't find them as aggressive in taking those calls. So it's always safer. Um, and remember, uh, because in any event, if it's a mistake apparent on the record, then it's something surely appealable also. You have a much better chance because the scope of uh, work which will have to be done in a normal appeal is, is essentially much, much broader than what is done in 154. So, I mean, that, that makes immense sense. And then uh, traditionally, and uh, I'm proud to say this, that this institution where I worked for 22 and a half long years, this is uh, a very... Um, uh, I should say, uh, judicious institution and which is known to take tough calls, is stick its neck out, you know, whenever required for the cause of taxpayers. So you are, you, you know, you are much safer. And today, courtesy non-disposal of the appeals by the commissioner appeals, we have so little institution in our, and, in our um, tribunal. The chances are that the appeal you file is, you know, will come up for hearing in two months, three months time. And uh, pro probably uh, commission appeals will take that much of time for even picking up 154 for hearing. So to the last query for the session, sir, will the joint commissioner appeals appointment be within the current rank of tax officer within the department or would fresh appointments are going to be made? I, I, I you know, normally I'm not, uh, I shouldn't even answer this because that is something I do not know. But the answer is so obvious. Uh, there can't be fresh appointments for this. There has right. to be present uh, field of, you know, present uh, strength of officers. The only thing is, you know, the finance minister and of course, and of course, you know, people at the other people who are part of our team. I'm sure the, you know, right from the uh, the chairman, uh, chairman CBDT to revenue secretary, they have been thoughtful enough. They have been, I, I should say, they have been proactive enough to understand that this is the time you need additional hands. Right. Get rid to you know get rid of this pendency and that is a very welcome sign. That's you know that's where you feel proud of the present administration, which has its ears firmly to the ground. Uh, if you need extra people, give it to them. And uh, that seems to be a welcome step, as I said, from the current officers. As it is, there are many officers who complain that they don't have much work, so they'll have some work elsewhere. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much, sir, for such an engaging section, uh, session and interaction. It was a pleasure having you, sir. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you so much. So to the last session on amendments of income tax, we have Vishwas Kanjar, partner Nangya Anderson LLP, to take us on the topic M&A and startup compliance exchanges. Vishwas Kanjar is an expert in corporate and international taxation, company law, and exchange control with over 16 years of experience. He advises clients in various industries and manages key accounts. He is a frequent speaker at professional forums and holds honorary positions at the Roundtable India. A very good evening, Vishwas, and welcome to the event today. Good evening, good evening. Thank you so much, Radhima and uh, Naveen, for this opportunity. Uh, one thing I'd like to really compliment, considering that this is a marathon, and uh, with I being perhaps the 10th speaker or ninth speaker, right? right You're right. not on time. The, at least the, uh, my clock says it's 5.45, which is exactly the time that you wrote uh, on your email. Absolutely. I like to believe that this is well planned rather than a coincidence. Great. So when uh, when Naveen asked me to present for, uh, is my screen invisible, Rhythm? Yes, yes. The voice is getting echoed a bit. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm closer. Is this better or uh, you want me to put on? Better. Okay. Great. 
So uh, when Naveen asked me to uh, present for the m &A and startups, uh, my thought was that it was uh, when the budget actually came and there was so little for me to talk about. I was wondering uh, whether this would go on for 45 minutes, so I would encourage the participants to ask questions if they have any. Right, so I I like to begin. Uh, these are the four topics that I would uh, want to cover. Uh, just let you know that what's what's coming about. The first thing that I wanted to cover was the TCS. Now, uh, TCS on LRS is, I mean, one might say that it's ostensibly not really a topic, but there is uh, there is a relationship uh, with the structuring opportunities that we have, and therefore I wanted to bring this up. The rate of TCS has been raised to 20% from the existing 5% on LRS. Now, this is an important consideration now, right? Because this is, it does affect the cash flow and it is an important consideration as far as overseas investments are concerned. So, as an individual, if I was to set up a company or make an investment or, or, or set up a structure, anything outside India, I have to be mindful that whatever money that I send out, there would be an additional 20% TCS. And this is the money mind, the money that I'm spend, uh, sending out of my tax paid income out of my saving, but still there would be a TCS. That's the way the TCS works. On the other hand, if I choose to make the same structure through an entity of mine in India, this, these regulations are not going to affect uh, because LRS is an is a regulation which is defined in the SEMA and which is available to a resident individual and not uh, to companies. So even if let's say if a promoter is a non-resident otherwise and he has money in India in, in a account or any other account in India and he he sets up he sends money or he sets up the structure still this these regulations or this this proposed change would not protect him. What is interesting to note is that only this year, I mean, in, in August this year, the ODI regulations were uh, revamped to a lot of extent, both for uh, ODI for individuals as well as for uh, companies. And these uh, changes were, uh, were to a large extent pragmatic and was encouraging uh, overseas investment. Now, come February, uh, the proposed budget is has has made this TCS to be 20% from the existing 5%, which is a lot of expense can be said to be discouraging people for making investments or making structures outside India. Now, these two changes, which have pretty much happened in the same uh, same year, one by the uh, RBI or in the overseas regulations and one by uh, one in this budget, they are there is a bit of an incoherence in terms of the policy language. Right? So there is there is one could say that it's blowing hot and cold, and it's very difficult to perhaps get the sentiment. And obviously, this is one of the reasons here was to uh, discourage movement of uh, capital or uh, foreign exchange out to the country. But given the comfortable position that we are in foreign exchange, it's it's a little surprising. Moving on to the next topic that I would want to cover is uh, actually section again, section 54 and 54 and although I didn't attend this uh, session in the morning, uh, I believe there was something in the capital gains and this honestly is more on a capital gains provisions or it probably cap fits better into a capital gains ses uh, section of this presentation. But again, there is a there's a relationship in why I wanted to bring this up. Both 54 and 54F are uh, sections that provide deduction uh, from capital gains. Uh, 54 being a uh, being a section where you, you know, if you buy one roof by selling another roof and you incur capital gains in 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 that in the process, it provides that uh, exemption. And 54F being other than residential assets, if you if you sell some other long-term capital asset and buy a house for yourself, then there is a deduction available. Now, the ethos behind uh, Section 54F is that in India and probably in other parts of the world as well, uh, buying a residential house is one of the very significant 
events in, in anyone's life. And it's a very capital intensive, you know, milestone. So which, in, which would basically involve people selling a lot of their assets or some, something that they've held for, for a long time. Perhaps you've held a share for a long time and you want, now want to exit out of that and buy a house to yourself. There was no limit on such a reduction. For example, if you had, uh, uh, if you sell a share of, of a company that you held for a long time, and you have a have a cap, uh, have a capital gain, or you get a proceed of let's say fifty crores or twenty five crores, and you invest the entire twenty five crores in buying a house for yourself, and obviously subject to some other conditions that the Section Fifty Four provides, the entire you don't have to pay any capital gains as of now. But now there is the budget proposes a cap that you could only uh, invest on any investment in the excess of 10 crores uh, 10 crores will be uh, would be ignored. So one of the practical or suggestions that can be given right now is that for the, you know if you have a let's say if you have a startup investment and which has already matured. Or you want to, or you're one of the early investors and it has matured and you're thinking of making an exit next year might as well do it this year because if if, if you sell your startup investment or any other investment within march and you have a huge proceeds uh, and a huge capital gains and you invest all of that in buying a house for yourself it's still there is no gain uh, capital gains that you have to pay uh, this is an uh, example which would perhaps make it a little bit more clearer. Uh, uh, there's, there's another aspect of with respect to house property of uh, interest which could have been covered in the example, but that's I'm not covering that within the topic which has been allocated to me. But as you would see that in this example, if your sale consideration was uh, was 45. And you invested the entire 45 as of now within this financial year, you don't have to pay any capital gains tax. Whereas in if this amendment takes effect, your capital gains would be limited. Uh, your, you, you still will have to the, the amount of investment that can be has to be made is, has to be limited to 10 crores, and therefore you there would be the residual amount would still uh, result in capital. Gains. Startups. Right there. So there are two buckets of changes uh, that has come in startup. One is uh, one bucket of changes for the eligible startups, and uh, the other benefit is for the other startups. Now the eligible startups are those which have uh, which have to be approved by the interministerial board, and uh, is only uh, has a turnover of less than hundred crores. So now, you know these the number of uh, this has been criticized uh, quite too often, so I don't want to spend too much time. But the number of uh, startups which are actually eligible uh, or have been approved by the interministerial board, there are several which have been approved by the DPIIT, but uh, the ones which are approved by the interministerial are so little. But it's one sometimes thinks that whether it deserves time uh, or in a budget speech or of the parliament or even the session. But since it's uh, it's there on the topic, so I must cover it. You know, we had moved away from uh, profit-based deductions a long time ago, but one of the uh, one of the profit-based deduction that was introduced for startups uh, was that there was uh, there was a uh, hundred percent of the profit was available uh, was uh, was not uh, was deductible uh, in the in the in the in in the three years out of the first ten years. Now this was available to a startup which st which is incorporated till 31st March of 23, which means that uh -huh. March of 23 was the sunset uh, clause for that those startups. This has been extended by another year. Right. So uh, uh, similarly, uh, there was a benefit available for uh, change in shareholding. Uh, just for the uninitiated, uh, you know, one must mention the background that in case there is a change in shareholding of a company to the beyond 51%, the losses are uh, lo losses lapse. They are not available. And, you know, we know that startups by nature, the found, uh, there are multiple rounds of funding that happens and the, and the, the founders or the initial sh shareholders who were the, you know, maybe the majority or 100% of the shareholder when most of the losses were incurred, 
slowly gets reduced to uh, a, minor, a minority. So there was, there's, they would have lost the, uh, uh, they would lost the benefit of the losses that they've incurred, or they would not be able to set off those losses that they would incurred in the earlier years. But first, if you're a starter, an eligible starter, then the, the existing provision said that in, in, the, in the first seven years, if the, as long as the shareholders continue, even if they are below 51%, the losses will still be available. Now, this seven years has now been increased to 10 years. Uh, there's another set of uh, uh, case where the founders uh, exit is in case of a consolidation or takeover. But mind you, this, this benefit was never available to them. Right? If, if a founders exit completely, they're no longer a shareholder at all, then uh, the losses would expire. So, you know, this, this would perhaps, this is another consideration for, uh, for the investments in consolidation and transactions and and their transactions in startups that uh, perhaps the founders, even if there is no one off model or there's no other commercial reasons for those, uh, the shareholders to exist, only shareholders to continue, they may still have to do that for the purpose of just keeping the brought forward losses in mind. Moving on to the second bunch, which is uh, uh, which is uh, the, the Let's say the specified startups. So I just use a different term just to help you appreciate the difference. Specified startups are startups which are which you know the, the conditions are mentioned. They don't need to be approved by the interministerial board. They are the DPIT recognized startup, which is uh, which is clearly the a bigger lot. And uh, it makes much, much more sense to talk about the uh, benefits which are available to them. Now, uh, there was, uh, if, if, you, if you receive a premium, uh, on the, you know, which is in excess for a prescriptive value of those of the shares of the company, those are, uh, those, are, uh, those, are uh, those become taxable in the hands of the company. So there was an exemption available to them. Now, uh, which, is, uh, which is whether from a resident or non-resident. Now, there's uh, this. There was a 2000 uh, in 2019. Those uh, notifications were made available to uh, 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 to all eligible uh, to these eligible startups, which have been mentioned now. Uh, Vishwas, all okay? Yeah. So, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so now this is uh, there is as, as long as these uh, the conditions of these uh, this are met, which is that you're Turnover is below 25 crores, and they, uh, and we are registered with DPIC. Where the the premium that you receive on the shares, whether from a resident or a non-resident, that would not be uh, there would not be any tax on the sector for, uh, for that investment. Uh, the last uh, topic that I would want to uh, cover is again uh, uh, MMR, which stands for, uh, which is a acronym for maximum margin rate. This again is uh, uh, I'll, I'll give me a moment to explain how this is uh, how this fits into the MA section of this presentation. So one one of the biggest uh, reliefs that is there is the headline rate of tax, uh, uh, which is which is there in the super rates that has come down uh, from 32.74 uh, to 39 percent. That is, uh, or has been proposed to be brought down from 42.74 percent uh, to 39 percent. Now this has got another effect also that in, in case of uh, a lot of these uh, HMIs and uh, high net worth families, they plan to do a succession planning and they use various structures. A trust is a very common way, a uh, very common structure that is being used by for succession planning. Now, trusts are 
are taxed like an AOP, and uh, in in, in more, more, most cases than not, the AOP would be taxed at a maximum marginal rate. So effectively, uh, what needs to be uh, what needs to be evaluated and, and and considered is that in case even in case in such cases when there is a succession planning, this not only affects the HMIs in the personal hands when they move to or they choose the the new tax regime, which which is now the exchange is the most obvious choice for uh, people with high income in the personal hands to use the new tax regime, but even for the trusts where the assets, assets are, are moving and you know as 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 a, as a as an action or a, as a planning estate planning exercise even for those the maximum uh, marginal rate or the number has come down and which should which should also which is a welcome move so it's not only in the personal hand but also post restructuring even if you're building uh, bringing in a trust structure in your succession planning even in those cases, the MMR is going to uh, the reduction in MMR is going to be helpful uh, helpful for for the structure. That's pretty much all I had really. And uh, uh, Ridhiman, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. I don't know how we're doing in time, but we do have a good time. Uh, so certainly, I'll ask a few queries which we have. Sure. I think LS, L, uh, the pro 20 percent TCS is something which is going to have a lot of debate in the coming future, correct? Yes. So what are your views uh, as in why the government had a thought of putting such a high rate on the transaction? Because this it is something it completely baffles, it completely, it completely baffles me. Right? That's what that's exactly what I wanted to uh, what I mentioned. Is that in, in the, so recently, right? Uh, uh, the ODI regulations have been revamped, and and mind you, these the changes that have happened in the ODI regulations, they are uh, they have happened the demands or or the or, of of various family offices and uh, and people wanting to make investment for a long, long time. Some of these changes that have come there, it was a long it was a long standing demand which was finally conceded. And a very and a liberal uh, or, a, or a more pragmatic stage was shown, right? And our foreign exchange results are very good. <laughs> very well, everyone is aware about that, right? They're doing very well. So at, and come in, come you know they, we move from summer to winter, and suddenly there is uh, 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 there is a twenty percent on all RS payments. So which is which is quite strange. But I mean. It's important to also understand that why I mentioned only about LRS here, right? That, uh, but uh, if you're making, uh, so if you if you're making as a as a company, you're making investment, it's not applicable. But if you if it's a company, you're 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 buying an overseas store, it is still applicable, right? Because that's not LRS; that's applicable to everyone. So if you if if there is a five lakh, for example, expense for a uh, for a tour uh, overseas, it's now going to take out six lakhs from the companies, etc. So this is, a, uh, I think it's uh, a, a little bit, um, uh, a bit of uh, it's, it's it's beyond a tax collection mechanism, right? Because it's definitely twenty percent cannot be a tracing mechanism. Five percent was enough to trace income, right? So uh, you know, if, uh, for example, one ninety five, there is only one percent. If it's only a matter of tracing, so, right. Twenty percent is is a little worth it, definitely worth it. So, are the representations being made <laughs> to reduce the rate? I won't be surprised if it comes down. I won't. I won't be surprised if it does actually. Yeah, because uh, people uh, will face a genuine difficulty. Like many of the students go abroad, the, their parents sending living expenses. Will they be covered here? If it's um, it's if it's funded by loan, it is not. But otherwise, it is. Yeah, because education, when we talk about education, there's education loan, right? Which is other way 0.5%. And then coming to education related part, it is 5%. But living expenses. I have. Living expenses would not be here. So living expenses would attract this 20%, you're saying? Uh, ed education related. Uh, I, I would imagine that it will be still be 20%. Huh? Quite a hole in the pocket. Out of, out of loan, uh, 0.5%. If if it's and 
uh, not out of loan, but still uh, a curriculum expense five uh, percent. If, if not none of the two, then twenty percent. Yeah. Pretty pretty tough. Yeah. I think we ha we have a lot of questions coming here. So, does the threshold limit of seven lakhs per year? This is one of our attendees asked. Would apply for remittance made under LRS other than education fees or medical purposes, which is applicable for the new levy. I think this is. So sorry, what's the question? Can you repeat that? Uh, one sec. So the question in our chat box is: Does the threshold limit of seven lakhs per year is for remittance under LR LRS other than education fees or medical purpose apply for the levy of TCS, or there is no threshold limit basically? Oh, so you, you is he asking that if somebody makes a, already has made up the remittance of seven lakhs for medical purposes, yeah, then? I would imagine that no, there is it has to be seven lakhs. Other than the so, um, other than I, uh, I, is there any threshold limit or uh, for twenty percent or is it flat? Uh, then, uh, just one second. No, there is twenty percent. There is no threshold limit. Correct. For the percent, there is no threshold limit. Correct. Right. That's there. That's that element is very clearly there. That for uh, for other purposes there is no threshold. Right. So uh, another query which we have here is taxing on funds from NR under Section Fifty Six will block the funds to startups. Correct. So how is it going to boost the startup ecosystem in India? <laughs> now that is that is <laughs> another thing. I think I because of that. Uh, Issue we couldn't talk well on that, right? You know, so now uh, any FDI coming in, the, the, the rationale seems to be to now introduce uh, the rationale in the first place to have fifty six to seven B was that uh, unrecorded or it's it's a it's a way of giving uh, consideration and it's like re recirculation of black money, etc., etc. And the, the and the reason for excluding uh, a foreign investments uh, or premium of uh, from shares issued to a non-resident was always that you know first obviously to encourage investment is one aspect from overseas and second is to is that if if you if you if an investment is coming out from outside India, it's already a level of scrutiny which is it's going to, right? Because there is, uh, I'm, I'm sure people are aware that there is a there is a KYC norm that is that has uh, that that needs to be fulfilled, and uh, uh, there is there is a reporting mechanism within the you know within the uh, uh, with the, with the uh, let's say the RBI uh, or, or the some regulations. Uh, and in, not to mention that there are valuation mechanism and anyhow the uh, valuation mechanism is, is a floor there and not a ceiling as a, so it, it was always there so uh, it, it had enough uh, let's say gatekeepers or uh, uh, there's no need of uh, of including, uh, having an anti abuse tax so now uh, now there seems uh, seems to be a change in that thought process you now there's a, still a lot of black money or or let's say not black money like unaccounted or money or or uh, or this is a way of giving out considerations to many people. But it's, I think it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's fair to, fair to expose uh, foreign investments to such, uh, such a kind of invest, uh, such kind of regulation. That one, on one hand, we are, we are trying to show ourselves as a, as a, you know, a danger story. The, and saying that they invest into India, are making into India, you know. And on the other hand, we are making it so uh, so prescriptive, right? And, uh, imagine somebody, a foreign investor, coming to India, making an investment. As far as uh, companies are is concerned, as far as FMI is concerned, there is there is a there is a floor uh, pricing that is available. And now in income tax, there is a ceiling pricing available. So what do you do? Then you, you there is uh, in the uh, so to say there is no uh, what do you say band? If, if otherwise in charge of pricing, there is a concept of a band, but then. If, if one one goes strictly by what is there, it's strictly, if there is no ban. You you, right. you have to get that one price, that exactly one price. There is no and uh, who who on this planet uh, is smart enough to uh, have exact price of a share of a commodity like share. So it is it's it's over prescriptive and uh, uh, very straight jacketed. It makes it difficult. 
So what will be the rate of tax on such investment under Section 56? Other sources, so it uh, it will be the the company's tax, right? So tax on the company. Yeah. Uh, next question do we have is how do we determine the value in such cases that capital infusion exceeds the fair market value? Will the DCF DCF be acceptable, or can AO opt for the NAV method? No, so okay. So, so this is also a big debate. Right? There is, as I said, uh, while the audience here may be mostly for tax, so they would appreciate 56 more. But what we need to understand is that even in Section 42 Companies Act also, in private placement, you are required to have a valuation. Done. It's, you know, by a registered valuer. In 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 FEMA also, you need to have a valuation done. It, it says any acceptable, uh, globally acceptable uh, valuation principle. But in income tax, no, nothing. Nobody replies when they have a, they have a formula over DCF. But DCF, uh, DCF still uh, discounted cash flow still relies on the uh, on the projection that one makes and assumption one uh, projection that's available and the and the assumption one takes. Uh, now. D, uh, DCF methodologies otherwise also fits into the other two, right? The in FEMA and income tax, uh, sorry, in, in Companies Act and FEMA also, because that's for an ongoing business. That's the most acceptable way of making it, uh, making an uh, for an ongoing business. That's the that's the uh, that's the most appropriate method of doing a share valuation. That that uh, that, that is fine. So, but. So it's DCF would work. That's uh, the, that's. I don't think that's DCF would be a problem. But then there is a, there is some debate beyond this is whether if it becomes like a if you if you sub, if it's a TP item now it becomes an ALP. ALP has a concept of a band. Then uh, uh, you can have one DCF, one some other method or some. It can go beyond that. Let's put it that way. Great. Great. Uh, one more we have. If startup starts making profit and would like to opt 115 BAA and BAB, either of them, what happens to the losses? Are they lost? Uh, if they want to, so they, 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 it's one of the, uh, they, one of the three years that they want to take exemption. But if the loss is available, I would imagine why would anyone want to go for that? Right. Uh, but okay, even if they do, uh, it's okay. I, I, I probably have to have to check that, but uh, it's, uh, it's it's a six year, right? It's a deduction from total income. The deduction comes first, or, uh, or the straight off losses comes first. So then, uh, I, I, I'll have to reunite with them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ramesh, you're still on mute. Uh, Ramesh, you're still on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, Discussable topic. So TCS must somebody else must have taken. I included TCS only from the perspective of this. The what is there in the slide? So I mean, these threshold seven percent. I, I I haven't applied myself so much on it. But anyhow, please go ahead. But I'm telling uh, this uh, has been taken by all the speakers in thoda thoda part, and everyone had some or the other queries because this is actually a very discussable topic, and because it has come as a shock, to be very honest, with yeah. such a high rate. So, and, and people questioning all the transactions they look up to. So, this uh, question which we have is, will TCS provision would apply if I invest in overseas stocks through Indian brokers? No, why not? So, it, it, broker, maybe, oh, you'll, you'll have to buy the foreign exchange. So, there is the broker. Bro, uh, so, you have to buy the foreign exchange. Then, yes, it is. If, if you're an individual, you're buying the... Uh, so, uh, the most... Uh, this is left, uh, I don't know, very extreme statement would be then I start by minus 20, right? I start with the investor, I may start early because, see, oh, yeah, because I, 20 rupees, I don't know when I'll get. Uh, the department will find one way or other to not give me or, uh, give me that refund or whatever. Uh, so, but that that may be the most extreme way of dealing with that, that if I if I have to make an overseas investment of 100, the next day I start with 80, right? <laughs> like, uh, so, but that's that's not too much. After all, only a tax collection mechanism, right? So they would, uh, uh, at some point in time, you you will be able to recoup that. But uh, yeah, but why would why would one want to do that, right? If there is if I have a hundred, uh, if I have available hundred rupees dis uh, disposable income, right. To invest, right? If I invest in India, I'll be able to invest hundred rupees. But if I have to invest in uh, overseas, I will only invest only 18 because or, or whatever the little different calculation comes. 
uh, because of the grossing up, but uh, I'll be able to invest about 80 only because I still have to pay as uh, TCS. Right. And I think there are many such transactions coming up. Flight, uh, flight tickets, hotel separately, not booking through package, which is the tour part. <laughs> I won't know that. I also give, uh, hmm. Debit card transactions overseas. Hmm. But the, I think that has been cast on on the on the travel agent, right? I mean that. Uh, so if, if the one would say that, what if I buy from Goda, which is not in India, and whether he will comply or not? So anyhow, let's uh, let's, I, promote, I, let's promote tourism in India. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tourism in India. <laughs> sure. And oh, uh, uh, just one second. Can the income of startup exceeding go? One second. Exceeding FMB under section 56 be taxed under section 115 BBE as unexplained income at the rate of 78% or will the normal rate apply? I think PG, I think the income will have to be from profit, right? This will be the other source. I, I I, 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 again, I'll have to review and come back. I mean, if I can have the email address, or I, I, I'll email it to you with the manual. You can, you can send back it. But I, I, I don't think it will be, uh, it will be available. Uh, you know, uh, you accept, uh, take premium and then claim on the rate. So anyhow, you know, how, how many, how many? I don't know uh, if anyone has the latest data. How many of these are uh, who? What is the number of the eligible startup as of now? Has it cost thousand? Or, I don't think that it has, right? I I really do I really do need to check about this. That's why I said there were two buckets, right? This one, uh, you know, this this is available only to an eligible startup, which has nine hundred. It's nine hundred. It hasn't cost thousand, right? Yeah. So does it does it really deserve uh, in in a in a country one point four billion? Does it even deserve place in our budget speak or any? Yeah, so this this is more relevant, right? That now now there is a now there is a uh, even if there is a there is a short premium coming from an overseas investor, but then the startup otherwise, right? There is a there is a tax now. Yeah. Correct. Uh, second. So yeah, I just got an updated figure from one of our colleagues. 89,000 startups recognized and 1,000 startups eligible for tax benefits. So imagine, does it involve, so this, this that we spoke about, right, it is, it, it is for 1,000 startups. Correct. So uh, what are your closing views on how the government can actually bend more ways beneficial for the startups to grow? Because as the numbers say, what on what basis the government work more both tax wise and environment wise and uh, structure wise so that the startup culture can be more organized so you know i i i, I, I believe that you're uh, you're asking from a tax perspective what 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 tax measures can be taken there are various other things that can be done right so that's uh, since the discussion about tax one of the clear thing that needs to be done is that make this available to the entire startup community, right? There is there are there is a DPIT there is which which is already existing startups based on certain conditions. Make these available to them. You know, it's there is no point having a tax policy which is actually effective only on thousand people in, in, in a country of this size or for that matter perhaps country of any size. It's it's really not fruitful to have uh, a policy or or anything or any regime which is actually available only to thousand people. So mm -hmm. I think that's that's the first thing that definitely that, that can be done uh, from a tax perspective, right? So other demands would be quite radical. Like there is, uh, I mean, they are mostly non-tax actually, right? Because it's, the startups um, for most of the years, right? The Second Amendment that you see, the the period has been changed. Brought forward losses, benefit has been changed for seven to ten years. Is 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 in a lot of sense in accordance with the fact that it takes a startup period longer than seven years to come from you know red to green. So uh, tax may not necessarily fix 
next show. Like the, this, this is the bigger issue, right? That they, they, they you are, uh, uh, that you try, if somebody is able to value a, a startup, which is beyond, uh, beyond a mathematical formula or an empirical method that one can think of, uh, then you should let them be, they should be, uh, let them value that and not try and touch and, and and suspect that into that once something is recognized as a startup issue, very flourish. So that's that's what I would say uh, from a tax perspective. That's all kind of most of the other things are like from the, uh, uh, like an ecosystem things which are which is beyond that. It's a lot of things are already happening. So it is one of the thriving. Uh, India is one of the thriving economies as far as startups are concerned. So we okay. can throw more light because one of the things is exit. Is it is it one of the things that uh, startups should be uh, should uh, should be able to avail? I absolutely correct. I second this. Uh, so I think thank you so much, Vishwas, for such a helpful session on startup and also TCS. It was it was a pleasure. <laughs> having TCS, you. Uh, sure. Huh? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So those were the insightful and education sessions on amendment to direct taxes. This leads us to our next segment, proposals in corporate laws and corporate finances. To introduce this, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Vinod Kothari, partner Vinod Kothari and Company. Mr. Vinod Kothari is a fellow of ICSI and associate of ICAI, managing partner at Vinod Kothari and Company. He's a renowned expert in company law with 33 years of experience and has authored several books on the subject. He's a frequent speaker at forums discussing various corporate law topics. Thank you very much, sir. We wish you a very warm welcome today. Thanks, Atan Ridhimaji. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, very good evening, all of you. Uh, thank you, Taxman, for giving me the opportunity of uh, being here today with all of you. And particularly thanks to all the marathoners. Uh, the marathoners have been running this race for last, what, five hours already? So we and... started. <laughs> I'm sorry, with six hours. Yeah. Six hours already and are slated for another uh, roughly about two hours of talking. So that requires a tremendous amount of endurance, a tremendous amount of uh, a zeal for uh, listening to people. And uh, that is really very, very commendable. Thank you. Uh, let me just give a broad overview of what I'm going to do over the next uh, 45 minutes or so. I'll, of course, love to interact with whoever would like to uh, interact in whichever way Taxman takes uh, discussions from the participants. Briefly, this is what I'm going to do. I'll talk broadly about certain provisions which are connected with corporate finances. When I say finances, I would mean the manner of raising funds by companies, whether the budget provisions will have an impact on the liability side of balance sheet of companies. Uh, that's part one. <clears throat> part two, I'll talk about some specific provisions dealing with corporate laws. Uh, as such, it's a budget and budget mostly concerned with taxation provisions, but there are some provisions which might have impact on um, corporate law provisions as well. So we'll discuss those. And uh, as we proceed, we will, depending on how we progress, we'll maybe discuss a bit about the proposals on green uh, funding or green credits, uh, which is another very important area. And of course, uh, certain provisions about centralization of financial information in form of a centralized registry. So that's that's what I'm intending to do today. And let me straight go to the agenda. So we will start with first the provisions which might impact corporate uh, liabilities, funding by companies. And that has certain provisions dealing with issuance of bonds, debentures by companies, to an extent payments uh, by way of uh, uh, purchase of goods and services to MSMEs. Uh, let's straight come to those and then we talk about green credit scheme and CSR expenditure, which is obviously coming from companies that but the tax provisions are impacting CSR expense as well. And then some proposals pertaining to financial sector, 
uh, namely on regulators of financial sector and then information about in uh, uh, provisions about information repositories i proceed straight to the capital market provisions where one of the most um outstanding provisions is a specific insertion of a section which deals with market linked debentures and i'm sure throughout the day speakers might have talked about it i'll probably be do, be a little overlap on my part to talk about that but i'll give maybe a, a slightly different perspective because i'll talk from the point of view of what is really happening in the market and then provisions dealing with withholding tax on listed debentures and there is a little um, maybe unintended uh, miss on the part of the finance minister to not extend the provision about deduction of tax at source on offshore issuance of the bonds under section 194 lc and 194 ld uh, that also I'll maybe briefly discuss let's first straight come to market linked debentures so i'll first give a quick background on what exactly is market linked debentures market linked debentures have mostly been placed mostly been issued by non banking finance companies in india i'm sure people who are familiar with the bond market would agree that corporate bonds issuers mostly are financial sector entities and of that nbfcs are very significant issuers of bonds in india most of the market for issuance of bonds in india is a private placement market public offers do happen but public offers are quite uh, small quite skeletal most of the bonds are privately placed so privately placed bonds issued by non banking finance companies now the practice about market linked bonds market linked bonds are not unique to india market linked bonds or market linked debentures they exist everywhere in the world and they prevail under various names for example they are sometimes called equity linked bonds or index linked bonds they are quite common structures mostly they carry a principal protection feature that is the principal to the bond holder will anyway be repaid thereafter comes the coupon or the interest on the debentures that interest or coupon is normally linked with some particular index market linked but some kind of market index the returns get linked with market index now you might probably get a feeling that there is uh, some real linkage with market linked i mean market forces or market linked uh, indices for example some mlds i i'll use the word mld for uh, referring to market linked debentures some of you might get a feeling that the mlds are let's say linked with nifty some would probably say well it's linked with sensex more likely nifty than sensex but well they might be or some are linked with rate on government securities so they are linked generally with various parameters various indices however in reality the fixation of the rate is so done so as to almost assure a fixed rate of return to the bondholder the the transaction is almost done on a bespoke basis almost on a bespoke meaning on negotiated basis typically there are one or two or three investors in a market linked bond mld issuance the issuer is an nbfc the investor is one or two or three mostly it could be ultra net worth individuals who would like to invest for example let's say somebody has got 100 crores to invest over the next two years somebody is coming with 50 crores to invest over the next uh, uh, 18 months so that becomes a fit case for issuing mlds now these mlds uh, like i say here normally have a tenure of 12 to 36 months why because the intention of the investor is not to block the money for a long time investor is looking at a medium term uh, kind of investment option investor is expecting a particular coupon rate investor and that coupon rate is mostly payable on redemption either the coupon is not there there is a redemption premium or even if coupon is there the coupon is payable on redemption that would mean during the tenure of 2 years 1 and 1/2 years or 36 months there is no payment of coupon at all the coupon is payable on redemption so either there might be premium on redemption or the coupon itself is payable on redemption the bonds are privately placed like i mentioned all um, most of them most of like 90 more than 80% of indian bond market is privately placed a market however the bonds are listed why are they taken for listing 
Now, the next point that we discussed becomes quite important because the bonds are taken for, or the bonds were taken for listing for the very simple reason so as to qualify as a long term capital asset for the purpose of capital gains taxation. So, the structuring basically was that I've issued the bond, let's say, for 18 months, two years, uh, 24, uh, 30. And then I issue it on private placement basis to one or two investors, take it for listing. Because it's listed, therefore, it qualifies for uh, long-term capital asset. And the, the return is payable on redemption. Now, I'm sure you are able to recollect that there is a CBLT circular uh, issued several years back about uh, zero coupon bonds. And it talks about capital gain treatment if the bonds are sold prior to maturity. So mostly what is done is the bonds are transferred to some other entity prior to maturity so that the original bond holder does not remain the bond holder. The, the, the holding of the bonds gets shifted to another entity, mostly an associated entity. And the bonds are then redeemed to the associated entity. So the game becomes quite simple. We are able to claim the entire income on the bonds as capital gain. The redemption happens to an associated entity, but in the meantime, the associated entity has acquired the bonds from the actual bond holder. The bonds are listed, but however, there is no trading in the bonds really, excepting this uh, transfer to uh, the, the group company just before redemption. As a result of that, the investor pays merely 10% tax on the bonds. 10% tax. Uh, because that's the rate applicable on listed securities. Since the bonds in question are listed security, they're bonds, but nevertheless taken as securities and they're listed. So it qualifies as a listed security. In that case, on a holding period of one year, uh, un uh, unlike uh, other assets where the holding period is three years, based on a holding period of one year only, the bonds will qualify as a listed security with only 10% tax. Now, assume the issuer issues the bonds with 10% yield. I mean, the coupon rate may not be there because the, the income might be going in form of a premium or redemption. But let's assume that there is a servicing rate. It may not be coupon. It may be premium on redemption. It may be coupon payable on redemption. But effectively, the XIRR or the, the cost of the issuance or to the investor is, say, for a minute, 10%. Investor pays 10% long-term capital gain tax. He is able to therefore get a post-tax return of 9%. If I were to really do a computation of post-tax rate of return, it would probably be higher than 9 because that tax is deferred till redemption. I'm not paying tax as I earn. I'm paying tax in the ultimate year when the redemption happens. So that would further um, improve the post-tax rate of return of the bond. So 10% pre-tax cost in the hands of the issuer translates to roughly about nine, little more than 9% in the hands of the investor. That is the economics from a taxation perspective. Also understand that in case of listed uh, bonds, listed debentures, there, there has always been an exemption from withholding tax as well. So section 193 exempts the withholding tax in case of listed bonds. So there is no withholding tax, number one. Number two, the income from the bonds gets converted into long-term capital gain with a 10% tax and just a 12-month holding period. Now, in addition to this tax benefit, there was a substantial regulatory arbitrage as well. Regulatory arbitrage meaning what? That normally speaking, when normal corporate bonds are issued, if the amount involved in the issuance is 50 crores or higher, then the issuer mandatorily has to use the electronic book building process, EBP platform, electronic book building platform of the stock exchanges. Electronic book building platform essentially is that the issuer will upload an offer document on the platform. The platform in turn uh, gets the bids or offers from its subscribers, which are again a part of the platform. Uh, then uh, the cutoff rate is fixed. And based on that, the Allotments are typically done. Now, in case of in case of uh, market link debentures, there is an exemption from having to use the electronic build, book building process. The EBP platform, so to say, is not mandatorily required in case of market link debentures. 
Now that makes it substantially easy for the issuer because across the table, over the counter, the issuer may agree with the investors. Supposing one or two investors come, the issuer may in a GP prepare the offer documents, give the offer documents to the investor. Investor puts in money, the debentures get allotted, matter simple. There's no need to upload offer documents on a um, uh, EBP platform. There's no need to wait for investors to put in bids. The entire uh, procedural formality gets completely cut and the issuance can happen in a, in a GIF fee. Now, this was, in addition, there is a restriction of 12 ISINs on the maturity of the debentures. This is a small benefit, not very significant benefit. This is mostly in case of very, very regular bond issuers. There is an additional 5 ISIN limit. 12 is the normal limit, plus additional 5 in case of MLDs. That's yet another benefit in case of MLDs. So, MLDs... Uh, were getting popular among uh, among NBFCs, and as you can see from the data that we have, uh, it's showing there has been sixteen thousand four sixty three crores worth of MLD issuances in April to December, just about nine months time. Sixteen thousand four sixty three crores worth of issuance. Last year, I think for the entire year, the issuance was roughly about twelve thousand crores. This year, over the ninth month period itself, the issuance has crossed 16,463 crores. Most of the issuers are non-banking finance companies. I would just reiterate that. So this was the position so far about MLDs. They were talk of the town. They were very hotly talked about everywhere. And uh, uh, they. And, uh, I, I just want to show some structural features of MLDs so that you realize the kind of instrument that we're talking about. These are from issuances already done. Uh, I've mentioned case one, case two, etc. So these are, I don't need to talk about specific issuers names here. Case one, for example, and all the cases here, all the five are non-banking finance companies. The returns in the first case is by way of premium. The tenure is three years. The premium obviously is payable on redemption. And the link is here is with 10-year uh, government of India securities, 10-year government of India bonds. Now, what this instrument says is that <coughs> if the, the maturity value, the maturity value of the, the government bonds at the time of redemption, which is only three years away, is more than 25% of its original value. In that case, the investor will get 8.18%. And if the maturity value of the government bonds is less than 25%, in that case, the bond owner will get only the principal only. As I said, the bonds are principal protected. So the principal is anyway repaid. But the coupon or the premium redemption is missed if the maturity value of 10-year government securities drops to less than 25% of the value at the inception. Now, I'm sure all of you can realize what is the prospect of returns on government securities falling to a value of less than 25%? <coughs> Unless there is a severe credit downgrade in the country, there's severe financial crisis in the country, there's a severe uh, increase in interest rates, there's a huge debacle in the country's economy. The possibility of a over 75% depreciation in the value of government securities is nearly ruled out, which actually means what? Therefore, the bondholder will almost comfortably get 8.18% interest. Look at the second case. This one is 2.2 years linked with Nifty. And here it says, if the <coughs> Nifty at the maturity is less than 25% of what it was on issuance. Once again, we're talking about Nifty dropping by over 75%. Right? And once again, that is... Nearly 75% drop in Nifty is obviously um, not very likely. So basically what we're getting is that <clears throat> the conditions, the market conditions to which the returns in the bonds are linked are so very unlikely to happen that essentially the bondholder will still get a fixed rate. Uh, for example, you can see the case 5. 
It's talking about 10 year government security, just a two year issuance. And here it's saying where the, the, the level of government security, 10 year government securities are quoting at less than 50%. Once again, 50% drop in government securities is almost unlikely to happen. So the point I'm trying to make is that while semantically, while uh, optically, the bonds are linked with market rates like GSAX or uh, Nifty or any other market rate for that matter. But the basic idea is to pay to the investor a fixed rate. Investor is not really wanting to take a risk on an underlying. <coughs> the investor is mostly looking at getting a fixed rate. This was the position before the budget proposal came. Now, the budget has completely upturned the economics of MLDs. I must once again say, remember those numbers I said, if the pre-tax return is 10%, the post-tax return with the 10% long-term capital gain tax would turn out to be little more than 9 Investor would therefore be getting more than 9% because he's paying tax ultimately on maturity. <coughs> How does the budget change the equation completely? The budget now says... <coughs> Irrespective of the holding period, the budget proposes to bring a new section called 50AA. <clears throat> says, irrespective of the holding period, a market link debenture will always be taken as short term capital asset. Though it's very rare to have market link debentures with more than three years maturity. But even if technically one was to issue a market linked debenture with more than 36 maturity, it would still be taken as short term capital asset. So that actually means what irrespective of the listing status, the market link debenture will nevertheless be taken as a short term capital asset resulting into short term capital gain. Now, if it's a short term capital gain, will be called upon to pay tax at the rates applicable to normal business income. It's not even a case of shares. Therefore, normal slab rate will become applicable and the normal slab rates may range anywhere between 30 to 40 percent. So if the pre-tax rate of return was 10, the post-tax rate of return now drops to 6 percent. Now, I would just want to highlight this point. Earlier, we said 10 percent was working out to post-tax rate of 9 percent. Now, we're saying the same 10 percent amounts to a post tax rate of 6%. 9% becomes 6%. The ironical part in this entire exercise, and that's a hugely ironical, is that this provision does not have any grandfathering exception. The meaning of grandfathering exception is that it applies to even existing market link debentures, which might, might have already been issued and might already have been held by investors. Like I mentioned, those 16,000 crores worth of issuance already done during the year or the issuance is already outstanding prior to that. The amended provision will apply from 1st April 2023 because it is applicable for assessment year 24-25, therefore applicable to income year 23-24. From 1st April 2023, the gains on redemption or sale of the MLDs will become chargeable to tax at normal slab rates. Now that's a huge drop. And particularly when it comes to existing issuances, normally we say tax provisions cannot be retrospective. Tax provisions, however, quite often become retroactive. Retroactive because they affect transactions or businesses or contracts already executed. <clears throat> so this provision is not retrospective but is definitely retroactive because it applies to existing issuances as well. And uh, quite possibly, I'm sure uh, the issuers will agitate against the provision. Some people might even be uh, tempted to agitate in legal forums as well. And perhaps there might be a rollback of the applicability to existing issuances. But that is something which is contentious. So without, let's say, writing on that, if currently the company has already issued market link, market link debentures and they've been affected by this uh, new provision, what options do we have? There is a provision under the 
issue and listing of non-convertible securities for a prior redemption of any uh, non-convertible securities. The number one option, the company along with the investors may opt for a prior uh, redemption. Call option may not be there actually, but based on investor request, the company may actually go for a prior redemption. That would be possible only for uh, debentures which have been there for 12 months at least. That would mean no question of this being applicable to MLDs issued during this year. That will necessarily get caught. But if MLDs were issued more than 12 months ago, the company and the bondholders may think of prior redemption. So redeem it, let's say, before 31st March so that we don't cross 1st April 2023, the applicability date. That's one option. Second option, which is uh, once again, uh, well, that's subject to stock exchange concurrence, concurrence of the stock exchanges, because this is, uh, I mean, this is a change in structure of the bonds and that will require the concurrence of the stock exchange. How cooperative will the stock exchanges be is something that one wouldn't know as of now, but it's possible under regulation 59 of LODR regulations to amend the terms of, amend the structure of a bond for which what we need basically is 75% consent of the bondholders, which I'm sure would be easy to get. Approval of board of directors of the and the debenture trustee, which also I guess would be easy to get. But the last point is prior approval of the exchanges. So whether exchanges will be, exchanges will be cooperative and give the approval, that will depend on what is the view taken by the regulator in this case, the regulator is SEBI, of course. So how do issuers uh, work with SEBI to get this uh, uh, approval process uh, streamlined? Because otherwise, uh, exposing issuances which have already been done to a tax which takes them retrospectively, in, in a way, the, the gains which would be coming after 1st April 2023 will actually be gains pertaining to previous years. Because the gains are, it's a premium payable on redemption. So that pertains to a large part of the year, which actually is prior to 1st April 2023 as well. So tax all of that from 1st of April 2023, actually in a, in, a, in a manner of speaking, it amounts to retrospective tax as well. Retroactive definitely, yes, but to an extent retrospective as well. And therefore, SEBI may also be inclined to take a little liberal view on this. To enable companies to clean their uh, bond books, MLD book. Now, I'm saying cleaning the MLD book is not very easy though. Which is why? Because liquidity issue. The issuers will have to mop up liquidity. Last quarter of the fiscal year is when the issuers need most money. Around that time, if you talk about liquidity past MLDs, where is the money? I mean, uh, this is not the right time to go for fresh issuances. The market anyway is uh, getting tighter towards uh, March. So investors may anyway be jittery. Investors may not be may not be fully cooperative. So thinking of making a fresh issue in the last quarter for the purpose of repayment of MLDs will itself be a difficulty. So this is uh, something that is putting companies into a real tight position. Let's go to the next part, which is listed bonds. This actually. I mean, I would say I'm wondering why was this change at all needed because the retail investment in bonds in India is anyway very small. Like I mentioned, most of the bonds in India are publicly or uh, privately placed. You can see on the right hand side, the graph shows the blue line is public offers and the red line is private placements. Public offers are extremely small. And if you're talking about the extent of retail investment, Retail investments are very small in bonds. Now, when it comes to a retail investor holding bonds and the bonds are listed bonds, there was an exemption from withholding tax under Section 193. Now, this exemption is proposed to be withdrawn. And this also is applicable from 1st April 2023 without any grandfathering. And therefore, this also would be applicable to existing bond issuances as well. Now, <clears throat> as a matter of uh, tax principle, fiscal principle, the duty of collecting taxes is on the government. 
the government is constantly shifting the duty of collecting taxes to the persons responsible to pay the money like in this case the responsibility instead of shifting it on the instead of the government the tax officer collecting the tax the government is expecting the tax to be collected by the by the issuer company issuer company collects the tax and pays it to the government now if the taxpayer has a tax obligation he anyway adjusts it against his tax liability assuming he does not have taxable income he claims a refund so that is the situation is inequitable because withholding tax in general is presumptive it presumes that every recipient of the income is liable to pay tax lot of the so called uh, fixed income investors may actually not be liable to pay taxes as per their individual taxability they may not be liable to pay taxes at all now from each of the investors tax is deducted at source and thereafter they either i mean go running for refunds or they file a particular declaration saying my income is not chargeable to tax etc that is not a healthy operation of a a system so this is another provision which is again without grandfathering and therefore that also might affect the bond market uh i would talk about a third thing which is uh, green debt securities now this green debt security green bonds or green debt securities uh green bonds in india in compared to other countries in the world the, the volume of green bonds in india is still much smaller however green bonds have been growing and india has a framework for green bonds in terms of the issue and listing of non convertible securities uh, these uh, regulations define the end use of the money uh, which will qualify as green uh, bonds i am sure you'll all be aware that recently the government of india also did the first issuance of green bonds on the 25th of january to be precise and these bonds the government was able to issue at a six basis points advantage over normal returns on government bonds the issuance at a price better than the non green price that's called greenium that is the premium on green a greenium so government of india was able to get a six basis point greenium the big point is not the greenium involved the big point is that there is a dedicated amount of money available for green initiatives in case of government the green initiatives are different in case of corporate issuers the uses of the money for any of these renewable sustainable energy clean transportation sustainable water climate change adaptation energy efficiency sustainable land use a uh, pollution prevention and control circular economy uh, which obviously means uh, things which can be recycled uh, and uh, it can be used uh, as inputs once again blue bonds which are for sustainable water management yellow bonds which are for solar energy uh, creation and transition bonds which are enabling people to move uh, to a renewable energy uh, device based on the ndcs of the country so these are the items which qualify a bond as a green bond if the bond qualifies as a green bond then sebi has recently come up with the operational guideline of how to ensure that the green bonds are actually green i mean they are not uh, what do you call green washed they are not simply washed with green they actually are green and that requires a continual disclosure of the actual use of the money etc i wouldn't want to bother you with details of this so the, the fact that there is a recognition of green bonds there is a recognition of uh, uh, the need for green funding in the budget as well that is an important point yet another point which might impact the bond market in at least in medium term is the fact that withdrawal of tax deductions in case of non unit linked insurance schemes uh, because the income in case of insurance uh, policies where the premium in the aggregate was rupees 5 lakhs or above and that will now be taxable at the time of withdrawal at the time of uh, maturity and uh, several of the so called guaranteed returns insurance plans actually had a premium would not mostly be more than rupees 5 lakhs because mostly these were offered to high net worth individuals but there also the exemption would be lost that would mean the money would cease to flow into these schemes 
And this money was mostly directed by the insurance companies towards the bond market. So that way, one of the sources of funding, one of the sources of uh, input or supply of money to the bond market will also get curtailed. I'll straight come to the provisions pertaining to MSMEs and then keep some time for the CSR, which is another important point. As for MSMEs, the simple point that I just want to speak today, and I'm, uh, there are a lot one can speak about MSMEs, but uh, the point which is connected with the budget is the Section 43B provision. Now, Section 43B simply disallows of the expense. Disallows of the expense uh, by way of uh, any Section 43 deduction, Section 37 deduction. That would mean anything which is claimed as an expense. Anything which is claimed as an expense for under any provision of uh, the Income Tax Act, starting uh, from, let's say, uh, Section uh, 35 until Section 37 onwards. Anything which is claimed as an expense, uh, the, the section links the deductibility of the expense to the actual payment. Uh, 43B has been there for several years now, so everyone is aware. Um, it was mostly for statutory payments, and now it's also applicable. It was applicable for interest payable to banks or financial institutions too. Now it's been extended to payments due to MSMEs as well. So if you're making a payment to an MSME, but you're not paying it within the time, the time specified in the MSME Development Act, Section 15, is 45 days. <coughs> If you're not paying within 45 days, <coughs> in that case, it would be allowed only on actual payment. So let's say something was due on 1st Feb 2023. You did not pay it by 31st March 2023. You've crossed 45 days and you paid it, say, sometime in 30th April. You will not be claiming deduction in 31st March 2023. You'll be claiming deduction in the next financial year. So the deductibility will be linked with the date of payment. So far, okay. I mean, I think it's a significant disincentive to delay payments to MSMEs. But even a bigger disincentive anyway existed. The bigger disincentive was the statutory obligation to pay interest on delayed payments. MSME Development Act is not all about making timely payment. It also goes to a next level to say that if you haven't made payment to an MSME within 45 days, then you need to start paying interest at the rate which is three times of the bank rate to the recipient. You are mandatorily required to pay interest. In addition, when it comes to companies, you need to do a filing of the dues to MSMEs too. So there are several things. Number one, interest becomes payable. Number two, you need to file the record, the file the list of MSME delays with the registrar of companies. Number three, you anyway having to report MSME dues as a part of your financial reports. So several disincentives were there already. Now with all the disincentives being there, still are we saying that MSME dues were being paid in time? Well, I don't think that uh, can easily be said uh, because in most cases, many cases, larger companies still take advantage of their overpowering position. Sometimes uh, entities are requested to replace the bill, issue a fresh bill with a current date. Uh, so various, uh, I mean, pressures still exist. And well, of course, one has to anyway keep uh, client relationship in mind. So it's not as if it's law which always prevails. It's quite often the client relationship also that makes uh, its own difference. So. Um, Therefore, this provision about MSMEs is though quite a welcome move, but what we need to see is that this is actually observed by larger companies in true spirit and not merely as a way a, a, a way to or, or not merely as a legal mandate to uh, to abide by because this is a very interesting, very important, Certainty of payment, timely payment, certain payment, certainty of payment is very important for the entire system. NBFCs are, uh, sorry, MSMEs are part of the very same system. And in fact, the MSME Development Act also says the invoice will be deemed accepted. Within 45 days, if you have not disputed the payment, then the invoice will be deemed accepted. Uh, let me proceed further and straight come to the CSR provision. And I'll maybe just 
talk about two further things before we uh, maybe uh, discuss some questions and answers. And let's first talk about CSR number ones. CSR expenditure. Now, as I'm sure everyone is aware that the expenditure incurred on CSR comes from section 135 of the Companies Act. 2% of average profits of last three years is supposed to be incurred by companies towards a CSR, which is listed in Schedule 7, the 12 items listed in Schedule 7 of the Companies Act. The CSR expense has to be incurred on those expenditure on, on those uh, items. Now, when CSR uh, provision was inserted in the statute to the effective 1st April 2014, uh, people started claiming CSR expense as a deductible expense also. As a general uh, expense item, uh, people used to claim it under Section 37.1 saying this is my regular business expense. CSR is not donation. CSR is not, um, um, what do you call, CSR is not um, gift. CSR is not, uh, <clears throat> it's not uh, bounty. It's an expense incurred as a part of business model. The statute requires it. In any case, every business has to be socially responsible. So it's a part of social responsibility obligation of the business. And therefore, people would claim it by way of deduction under Section 37.1. So first, the Income Tax Act was amended to deny the CSR expense under Section 37.1. I think second provision to 37.1 was inserted to deny the income tax deductibility to an expense incurred for the purpose of CSR. That has not stopped people from claiming it under Section 80G. Some people are still, I think, making a claim under Section 80G as well. The other issue, however, which was though contentious, but there were various uh, views coming from different uh, tribunals and different advanced authority uh, for rulings, AAR rulings. There were a couple of high court rulings as well was on the eligibility of CSR expenditure for the purpose of GST input tax credit. Now, this was an interesting point because assuming the company incurs a CSR expense of, let's say, 100 rupees, buying some goods or services, and the supplier of goods and services charges, let's say, 18 rupees at GST. Now, would I be able to, would the company be able to set off that 18 rupees against its GST output tax liability? or the company would not be able to claim the GST liability at all. Now, I would, one can also see that there is an, a repercussion of the question. If the company is able to claim rupees 18 paid as input taxes uh, on, the, uh, on the acquisitions done for the purpose of CSR, the actual cost of the company is only rupees 100. As we normally do in case of any actual cost of goods and services is minus GST to the extent we've been able to get a set of of GST. Some people were, however, playing over smart. They were saying that my actual cost is still 118. I've been able to get a set off of 18 rupees. That is set off. It's not a deduction from the cost I incurred. So my CSR expense is still 118. And on top of that, I would be able to claim rupees 18 as a GST set off as well. In a manner of speaking, therefore, that 18 rupees, which has been taken as a credit from the government already, that was also being claimed as a CSR expense. And the rulings of different forums on this were going in different directions. Uh, for example, uh, one can see a, a recent ruling of Telangana AAR. This is quite a recent ruling, Benmino Pasta. I think this is as recent as November 2022. There has been a ruling of Kerala Authority, which says you cannot claim ITC. The Telangana ruling says you can claim AAC, uh, you can claim set off. Uh, there, there have been rulings uh, from a from couple of high courts as well. There have been rulings from some of the high courts also, for example, Karnataka High Court, etc. There have been rulings of different ARs in different directions. And now what is the budget proposing with effect from 1st April 2023 once again is proposing to amend Section 17 by 5 to say that ITC shall not be available in case of CSR expenditure. As long as the company is claiming the CSR expense as an expense for a CSR obligation, the benefit of GST set off will not be available. That's the uh, proposed change in GST law. 
So the emerging position that now emerges for companies incurring CSR, and by the way, this is applicable from 1st April 2023. So that would mean <clears throat> the position remains as uh, gray as it's not a clarificatory change. The position remains gray up to 31st March 2023. So depending on which AR are you covered by or which High Court are you covered by, you can still take your own position up to 31st March 2023. But from 1st April 2023, depending on the way you incur CSR expenditure, many companies these days are not incurring CSR expenses. They are not carrying CSR activities in-house, that is in the company itself. They mostly engage either implementing agencies or they uh, they they make contributions to an end beneficiary. For example, say the company is contributing money to a hospital for, let's say, a construction of cancer beds. Company simply pays money. The acquisition of goods and services is done by the hospital. Or the company provides the money to an implementing agency, which in turn provides the money or goods and services to the ultimate beneficiary, say the hospital. So only if the expense is incurred by the company, situation therefore is that after this change, after the change of law, if the expense is incurred by the company, like let's say here, the company acquires the goods and services, company pays 18 rupees by way of GST, it cannot claim set off at all. And therefore the total costs incurred by the company is 118 only because the company has not been able to get a set off. So the question is the company treats rupees 118 as a part of its CSR spending. Earlier, this 18 rupees was coming from the government. Now, the 18 rupees will stop coming from the government. However, as for the company is concerned, it is still a part of the aggregate CSR outgo. To my mind, the net sufferer is the CSR spending. The CSR spending actually suffers because, you know, earlier rupees 118 worth of money was getting into the CSR activity. Now only... Um, I mean, the company would have therefore contributed 100 rupees, claimed 18 rupees as set off, and therefore to qualify its own CSR obligations, the net spending by the company would have been higher. Now, the net spending by the company, inclusive of GST, will be the target, and therefore companies will eventually spend a little lesser because they'll count the GST also as a part of the, the, the CSR spending. If the money is spent through implementing agencies, the agencies are typically intermediaries. As a, and as intermediaries, the agencies may not have a GST registration themselves. If the agency does not have a GST registration, the question of the agency claiming a GST setoff does not arise. So I will let the middle column status. But now most common will be the situation where the money is given by the company to the end beneficiary, say the hospital. In that case, the company pays rupees, uh, the hospital incurs a cost of rupees 100. The hospital pays GST. The company pays rupees 100 to the hospital because the actual cost of the hospital is not 118. The actual cost is 100 because 18 rupees is coming by way of set off. So as long as the company pays 100 to the hospital, the position that was existing prior to the amendment still remains. The company pays 100 rupees. 18 rupees is claimed as deduction or set off by the hospital itself except in cases where outputs of the beneficiary, for example, the hospital itself is exempted from GST. In that case, maybe this benefit may not be extended, but otherwise it would be possible to continue the benefit in case of direct spending, that is spending by end beneficiaries rather than through the intermediation of, or rather than by the company itself. Now, other than this, I'll just maybe briefly talk about some other changes which are relevant from point of view of uh, uh, corporate laws. Um, <clears throat> number one, this is this is something which has been talked about, and I'm sure this has been discussed at length by the earlier panelists. So I will not maybe deal with that. Is 56, one, 56 by one seven B will affect uh, investments from non-resident investors? Uh, there is a proposed simplification of KYC process and a business unification of business, identifi business identifier as well. Pan to be taken as one common identifier. Currently, companies have multiple identifiers. 
there's a sin number there's a gst number there's a pen number there is a uid number there are multiple identifiers for a business so maybe a unification of identifier will uh, perhaps help a lot and i'll come to the last part which is repository of financial information this is coming from once again several corporate laws partly from rbi directions partly from uh, a cic uh, surface law partly from companies act as well there are multiple places where currently financial information is being filed for example every financial entity has to file information with sibil and not just sibil there are four credit uh, information companies that apart if the loan becomes delinquent or becomes a special mention account the information goes to krilsi if the uh, if if uh, in addition the month the information has to go to nesl also which is information ut utility under ibc law currently the ibbi has mandated that every default for the purpose of section 7 and uh, section 9 will have to be proved as a default by ius records information utility records so that also makes filing with nesl mandatory that apart there is a registration with sarsai which is required as per rbi records if the loan is a secured loan we need to file charges with roc as well if the charges on immovable property we need to file it with the land registry so multiple registrations under multiple laws uh initially when the surface act was enacted the idea was that there will be a unified registration because that is exactly what section 23 of the surface act talked about it talked about a unified integrated registry system but unfortunately that unification never happened and we have continued to live with multiple registrations under multiple statutes so maybe now the government is proposing to have a single window registration it says that there will be a statute to provide for it i don't know what statute separate statute or maybe section 23 of surface act will get amended i'm not sure on that but that's another proposal which is of course extremely welcome but we are hoping that this will not be one more registry it would probably be one registry which is serving for all the registries uh, ridhima i am almost done with my time so please do let me know if uh, i need to properly be properly on time sir i must say so we do have some questions i'll read it out for you one second sir one question which is coming up is finance bill 2023 brought an amendment in section 18a of scra now the offshore derivatives will be legal and valid contracts how this will impact foreign investment in india so this is mostly for ifsc entity ifsc was intended to be i mean india's uh, bridge with, between the financial markets of the world right. so the whole idea was to bring and encourage trades in offshore derivatives to be done through ifsc and therefore the government has clarified the position that was prevailing earlier earlier there was a confusion about whether offshore derivative ifsc is though from fema perspective not a part of india but from income tax perspective it is a part of india hmm it's india when it comes to income tax it's not india when it comes to fema so therefore income tax act still applies to ifsc and hence the provision is uh, directly intended to enable offshore derivatives to be transacted through ifsc yes interesting next question coming up is is gar provisions are not applicable to existing mld uh gar would be i mean yeah one could one could argue that if the substance over form theory be applied to mlds one could probably challenge them saying that the substance was one of uh, earning income but gar right. applies only after a threshold level number 1 number 2 gar has a complicated process of first uh, referring it to a determination person then that also becomes challengeable i mean you are right that perhaps the tax officer could have challenged it uh, based on the substance but that would have been a case by case uh, attack here it's a generic i mean amendment of the statute which is uh, killed the arbitrage for mlds altogether interesting uh, so can i take one more mm -hmm. sir transferring ifs ifsc via lrs then tds at 20% will be applicable is it correct uh transfers via ifsc 
I'm not sure on this, Radhima. I'm not There's sure. still a very uh, debatable thing going on. Not sure on this. No worries. Uh, next question we have on our another platform is, yeah. The finance minister proposed setting up an IT-enabled, i.e. PFA portal. Will this ease the processing of investors' claim? Uh, hopefully. <laughs> Because currently, once the shares and the dividends go to IPF, drawing it back is Herculean task. And there are right. enormous number of regions for which the claims get rejected. Sometimes uh, because it has to go back to the company. I mean, getting it back is a tremendous task and normally it's all done by mediators, which is what is not the right way of uh, running the system. So yes, if the idea of a unified IPF withdrawal mechanism it gets him. I think it's a it's a wonderful thing to happen. Perfect, sir. perfect. Sir. Right. Thank you so much, sir. Right. It was a very, uh, I must say, a very needful insight. And thank you for a thorough analysis on the topics. Thanks, Adan. Thanks a lot, sir. So to conclude the changes in indirect taxation, our final segment, we have with us A. Jatin Christopher, partner, JCSS and Associates. Jatin is a chartered accountant, cost accountant, and a law graduate with expertise in indirect tax laws. He's published author and a resource person for ICI and the government. He has been in practice as a partner in JCSS, a full service firm since 2000. Hi, Jatin. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good evening. Hope Good you evening. had a wonderful uh, marathon session all day. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> so without further ado, I'll say you to take it forward. Thank you. Good evening, friends. Uh, economic problems are very complex and um, dealing with ex ec economic problems accommodates experimentation with lawmaking. And uh, tax legislations have, not, have never been strangers to this experimentation of dealing with economic problems. A very wonder wonderful uh, expose on this whole concept of uh, where does the legislature enjoy latitude to experiment with uh, lawmaking to deal with these complex economic problems and the courts to allow legislature the freedom it needs to do such things. Uh, we find uh, Swiss ribbons to give us a very wonderful insight into this aspect and uh, today's uh, finance uh, proposals that we see are uh, Ca ca capture this entire aspect of uh, what were the complexities and how has the government attempted to address those in the course of experimenting with lawmaking. When we look at uh, a budgetary proposal, indirect taxes used to occupy center stage almost in the past. And uh, for the last uh, little over five years, we've seen the sheen lost as far as the indirect tax proposals are concerned. I'm sure members participating this evening have uh, poured through the notifications relating to customs provisions. I want to bring your attention to one aspect, which is uh, the aspect linked to applicability of these tariff changes and how quickly will these take effect. The provisions in the finance bill 126A alone have been notified for purposes of uh, provisional collection of taxes act 1931. So therefore the second schedule amendment will take immediate effect. Not that alone, but uh, we also have notifications that have been issued, which uh, come into effect from 2nd of uh, February 2023. So when we're looking at customs notifications, please pay special attention to changes in the first schedule of the customs law, which is contained in the second schedule to the finance bill. And all notifications that have been issued dated uh, to take effect from 2nd of February. When we look at the tariff provisions itself, I leave it for you to consider the changes that have uh, been given effect. But I would also bring you to look at what is being attempted by these changes in the tariff. It points to a certain direction of policy thinking. Broad level changes in the first schedule indicates that uh, there are this special attention being paid to sectors which show a lot of promise to take us through to the 5 trillion economy target 
to take us through a cleaner and a more responsible in, um, economy. When we look at these aspects, I think the direction is very clear as far as how things are being aligned to help us see us see this nation through to the next phase of progress and development. India is a significant player in the world uh, economy. India continues to lead the way as far as several economies are concerned as to how policy thinking can be aligned and domestic legislation is aligned with that uh, policy thinking. Moving from customs into the interesting aspects of GST provisions, although lawmaking in GST is very complex because of the structure that is uh, put in place in the 101st Constitutional Amendment, the amendments that have been introduced in this bill in the central GST and the integrated GST statutes do two things. Just as any amendment, one, it provides us the clarity needed going forward. Two, it uh, admits the absence of this clarity in the provisions up to date. Friends, today we will look at a few provisions from both this perspective, not just to see what amendments have been brought about, but also to see what do these amendments do to the tax positions taken in the past? We have provisions straight away in section 16. The uh, One of those provisions that has uh, brought great grief to taxpayers because of their own, uh, perhaps let's call it lack of insight as far as what these provisions potentially were capable of doing. The tweaking of the provisions in section 16.2 points us in a direction that the government is very res resolved as far as matching of credits is concerned. We've seen a slew of amendments in the past. We've seen refinement of those provisions, introduction of uh, 16.2 AA. We've seen uh, 43A come in and go. We've seen 36.4, rule 36.4 come in, get uh, refined as we go along. And today we've seen a complete change in uh, section 38 and 61, rule 61 to help us come to terms with the fact that uh, matching is here to stay. Matching is here to stay. We've seen a circular 183 issued just at the end of uh, last year, where we saw government bring about this resolve for the past as well. Please bear in mind, friends, when, a, when circular 183 makes it uh, necessary for taxpayer to produce a chartered accountant or cost accountant certificate for 17, 18 and 18, 19. There was never a rule at, for those years to accomplish matching, but the circular accomplishes what the law could not. Today, what's happened is tax officers who could examine bona fides of a transaction, today their hands are tied because the circular imposes upon them the duty to demand a chartered accountant certificate for the past for the first two years of GST. We have a recent uh, decision in Wipro's case of Karnataka High Court, which says that that uh, in, the instructions in that circular can even be followed for the third year since introduction of GST. Friends, please bear in mind, matching is something that we have to get our hands around and make sure that uh, the ecosystem within which taxpayers operate is refined to only entertain diligent taxpayers, suppliers to work with taxpayers so that we don't have mismatch of credits. It's remarkable of the four circumstances that that circular talks about. It only contemplates taxes discharged through 3B and not in any other way. And uh, Though other than those four circumstances, there are plenty others we can think of, but something which a circular skirts to accommodate. Friends, please bear in mind, this amendment here also brings us back to the same position. Have we looked at matching diligently? And what's the consequence when those amendments, when, when those credits don't match, when we have creditors who we will need to pay, if we have not discharged their dues, what becomes of that liability? Some refinement has been made in 16 to see to me in the proviso to make sure that it aligns with the refinement we've seen in the rules uh, relating to payment to suppliers. Moving from there, we look at something very interesting in section 17.5. I was just uh, a, a while ago, uh, uh, had the chance to, to hear uh, 
So Vinod Kotari, take us through the CSR related amendments and how it will have a bearing on the tax on the income tax position. He had to but touch upon the GST implications, uh, and I have the benefit of uh, him having shared insights into the advance rulings that uh, gave the two different possibilities here. But friends, let's look at something that's remarkable here. Section 17.5, which contains blocked credits, it talks about certain inward supplies where there is no debate as to the merits of that expense or the purchase, but the credit is going to be blocked nevertheless. The first thing I want to bring you to consider is uh, the placement of this uh, embargo. It's re it resides between clause F and G in a clause titled clause FA. I think there is a lot of purpose why it was placed between F and G. G deals with personal expenses. So therefore, F deals with uh, NRTPs. Placement there brings us to consider that there's some purpose here. Apart from that, if you see the construct of the language here, I don't think CSR spends have been addressed with finality through this proposal. First of all, this proposal is going to get into the statute book maybe 10 months or a year later because amendment to the central GST law will take effect only when the last of the states bring about amendment to their state legislation. But uh, a year from now, if we set the date, some far more significant amendments will also come in because uh, we're expecting uh, another GST council meeting at the end of this month. And among the significant things for them to make a decision, it includes the decision about the GST appellate tribunal dealing with uh, the observations of the Supreme Court in the number of judgments as to how the composition of the bench must uh, be in compliance with R. Gandhi and uh, Roger Matthew and one and all those decisions that have established uh, the principles to apply. Friends, please bear in mind, there could be a ordinance sometime this year to introduce changes in the central GST law and the state GST law for purposes of activating the tribunal. Perhaps some of those changes will come into effect far sooner than these budget, budget proposals will take effect. Take effect. So therefore, 17.5 FA, we need to see when it will come into effect. Next, what it does, for the future, credits are blocked. For the past, credits are not blocked. The need for an explicit provision Without, while the opportunity was there to give retroactivity to this provision, since in the wisdom of the government, the retrospective effect has not been included in this clause, this clause will take effect only from prospectively. And when something so important was required as statutory, an amendment to the statute, this makes it very clear that until now, there is no doubt about admissibility of in, uh, input tax credit in respect of CSR activity. Those who have got uh, adverse rulings have to go with it because advanced rulings assure certainty, accuracy being only a byproduct. Look, looking at exactly the contents of this, now to, let's say uh, six months from now, one year from now, Clause FA comes into the statute book. All states have also amended their laws. Look at the construct of clause FA. It talks about goods or services used in CSR activity. Please bear in mind, used does not mean used up. So therefore, the one who has made the inward supply, counting this as a CSR activity, he will continue to hold the goods. If he does not continue to hold the goods, but there is a transfer of title in those goods in the course of CSR activity, the transfer is a one of the eight forms of supply. Now let's contrast FA with the construct of another provision. If you see para one schedule one, read with 17.5 H and the word disposal used in 7.1 A, there is a, it will triangulate into a point as to one of the three places it will come into effect. 
so a disposal when it can be one of the eight forms of supply why can transfer not be one of the forms of supply so without making this any more complex than it already is clause fa does not deal with all kinds of csr expenditure csr expenditure that is not a supply will only fall within 17.5 fa which means if it is a transfer of title because of course it is in the course of business secondly it also has consideration because consideration is not just increase in assets it is dis decrease in liabilities is also consideration so therefore this issue has not been resolved but it does a lot to bring us to pay special attention to csr activity vinod ji also mentioned this aspect of uh, certain actors interposing themselves between the donor and the donee in the csr project they need to be tremendously vigilant because they will not come within the exclusion provided in entry number 1 to 12 bar 17 because that is not these 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 actors in between are not the ones engaging in any charitable activity themselves or engaged in csr activities themselves so look at from this point of view csr the issue around itc and output tax on csr activity is far from resolved so we will see some more uh, clarification not necessarily by way of circulars but clarification in the language of the law the scope and its applicability in the days to come if we look at uh, the exclusion that is provided as far as uh, reversal of credit previously only transfer of land was brought within the fiction of section 173 but today para 8a has also been proposed to be included which means goods imported left in a bonded warehouse and thereafter sold although that transaction will not be treated as a supply input tax reversal will attract on this but friends please bear in mind as far as reversal of credits under 173 is concerned 172 is concerned the reversal is only in respect of common credits today reversal under rule 42 43 is being imposed as if it applies to the entire population of input tax credit and that is a misapplication of law one amendment that was being um understood and carried through since the beginning was uh, has been introduced now by amending uh, by proposing an amendment to clause section 23 where it starts off with a non obstant clause very specifically making it clear that it does not operate in derogation of either 22 or 24 and interestingly six times in 6 years here is this amendment that goes back if effective from 1st of july 2017 the rest of the section itself is still the same but the effectiveness of the section is now established there is no there is no ambiguity any longer that this will not be in derogation of 22 or 23 some changes have been made 37 52 all of those provisions to address the fact that uh, there's a restriction that someone cannot file subsequent months returns without having filed the previous months returns today and uh, a proposal is made to restrict the claim of uh, the, the filing of returns to the beyond 3 years it's now not possible for someone to go about filing those returns when someone cannot file returns what is the consequence please recollect 62 and 63 62 allows opportunity for the officer for the proper officer to conduct a worst judgment excuse me best judgment assessment under 62 63 imposes a requirement where uh, a notice could have been given a notice is given and then that notice is redressed by tax payer providing some response and an order being passed under best judgment provision so therefore there is this play of 62 63 that we have to consider when we look at these provisions moving on from there very quickly we touch upon section 56 an amendment is being brought in proposed in section 56 dealing with interest but it's only a matter of interest that we we'll look at this this amendment but uh, much still remains to be done as far as government being held accountable for payment for de belated disbursement of refunds that have been sanctioned we look at changes to section 122 and then co contrast it with some changes in 132 as you know 
e-commerce operators were not uh, measurably accountable if suppliers list themselves on the portal although they have to necessarily register themselves under section 24 ask the e-commerce operator and their response was that uh, suppliers are not amenable to instructions by the e-commerce operator unless it flows from the statute so today e-commerce companies are not in a position still they are not in a position to block these suppliers who are not registered to come in and enlist themselves on the portal but for allowing such uh, suppliers e-commerce operator will now be liable to punitive action under 122. So when you look at it from this point of view, it becomes very clear that uh, administration is leaning more towards organized players. And uh, with use of technology, it is far more eff effective to enforce these provisions through organized players than to pursue suppliers who may not themselves be large enough or organize themselves. So there is a provision, e-commerce operators will need to be mindful that when this provision does come into effect, they will be accountable, gives them sufficient time to start getting their act together, looking out for all the suppliers who are registered, uh, who are not registered, but listed to get them uh, to understand their responsibility under section 24 and therefore exonerate themselves. But look at it this way, there is a supplier who's registered, enlisted on the portal, and his registration is subsequently cancelled, hopefully not retrospectively, what is the responsibility of the e-commerce operator? When we deal with punitive provisions, please bear in mind, whether there is an express mention or not, there is a necessary ingredient of the required extent of animus. If the operator, if any person to be prosecuted and for penalty under 122, positive action and failure in that action must both be established. Now, when we look at 73, 74, we find provisions dealing with uh, fixed percentages of penalty. Please bear in mind, statute prescribing fixed percentages of penalty does not take away the discretion of a judicial proceeding. If taxpayer does not want to suffer discretion in the hands of the proper officer as far as uh, penalties are concerned, statute prescribes fixed percentages, taking away discretion from a proper officer. But when it comes to a appellate proceeding, definitely the statute only provides a recommended percentage of penalty, but not a fixed percentage. Bringing that principle here, we find that unless e-commerce operators are foisted with that necessary animus, they will not be exposed to a penalty. When we look at 10,000 as a penalty, it may not seem much, but consider the tens of thousands of suppliers listed. And even if we say some percentage of them might not be registered, the penalty can be can, can cascade and become a substantial amount. Now look at 132, the amendment proposed. The amendment is to take away three offenses listed here, but please bear in mind those three were discussed in the 48 GST council that decriminalization will be done on those in respect of those three, but those three offenses will not be liable for prosecution, but still be liable for penalty under 122.1. These three provisions apart, there is a tweaking that has been made to clause three under 132.1. What this provision does in my mind is that um, one, two, and three, all other offenses, Class 3 seem to sweep all other offenses under uh, its uh, operation. But to me, with this proposed amendment, it brings a lot of clarity as to how 132 should be understood in the past. In the past, prosecution was almost, uh, arrest under 69 was almost uh, barred if the value of offense was uh, below 5 crores. Today, what's happened is clause 3 says of the offense listed in 132.1b alone is captured within clause 3. This means that all other offenses below 5 crores, above 2 crores under clause 2 will be liable for prosecution. So there is a great amount of clarity that this amendment brings to what should be the way we should understand these provisions for the past, while it also brings about clarity that except for clause B, 
See, class B is very mischievous. You know, class B, 131B is very mischievous for the reason that it, uh, it deals with someone who issues an invoice without supply. Mischief. It erodes, it strikes at the heart of a progressive economy that someone will simply print invoices and send it away and facilitate claim of credit. But you know, there are a number of other instances where transaction may present itself in this manner, but it is not something that is designed to perpetrate this offense. So we need to be very diligent about how to look for the ingredients that bring about um, that, that satisfy the definition of offenses in section 132. There's still a lot to be discussed about the nature of this amendment being brought in 132, but we'll move on, quickly look at uh, changes made, proposed to section 138 to lower the limit for compounding of offenses, except the ones that the government is resolute about uh, prosecuting. Compounding also has been, um, proposal is made to make changes to section 138 so that other than these three, which have been decriminalized, all other instances with a lower amount by 25%, the compounding fee has been set at that level. We've discussed this in the context of the 48th GST Council meeting. Still some more interesting provisions. 158A, keeping in mind the guidance of the Supreme Court in Puttaswamy's case, 158A makes it now possible for disclosure, exchange of information between various regulatory bodies. Friends, please bear in mind, we have 150 where the information return is not yet notified. We have 151 that came in last year. Again, it's notified, implemented, but there's no order that is issued by the commissioner. Now we have 158A where specific information, of course, consent will be sought. But if you look at the one who is to give consent, it is the benign party to the transaction whose consent is sought. So when you look at it from this point of view, 58A will bring much needed transparency. Friends, government will, regulators will now know, they already do, and this is just one more step in that direction where regulators will know far more intelligent information about taxpayers than taxpayers themselves. Taxpayers have in the past dumped reams of information on the proper officer's desk. Today, with extensive use of technology, information in a very distilled manner will now be accessible to regulators to see what it implies. But let's pause here and consider data analytics can only do that much. Data analytics will present possibilities. It is human ingenuity that still is required to convert that into an allegation, present evidence that substantiates that allegation. Please bear in mind, when we look at any allegation, 58, section 58 of evidence law makes it very clear that unless it is left undisputed, allegations also can transform themselves and become facts. So taxpayers need to be extremely vigilant not to leave unacceptable allegations undisputed. Allegations left undisputed transform themselves to become facts. And the moment any allegation is disputed, the question of burden of proof springs to life. Tax authorities bear the burden of proof about allegations that they canvas based on a new interpretation that they have thought about, and they need to adduce that allegation, substantiate that allegation with evidence. So when you look at 158A, it's another way in which information can be secured, exchanged with various regulators, but all of them will come and stop at one place and one place only. That is where inferences are being drawn. Taxpayers need to be diligent and uh, to identify whether that inference has it graduated to even be an allegation? And has that allegation proceeded to be supported by unimpeachable evidence? Please bear in mind today with the volumes of transactions being looking at, it's simply not possible for a regulator to meet the standards in the law. And this is where GST is a telling example of how rule of law prevails in our country. So the 
information is there it's now for the regulator to avail that information and canvas that interpretation that they propose taxpayers also need to be diligent about how they run their business taxpayers who are doing their business diligently are often blinded by their own innocence diligence does not is not a synonym for uh, innocence an innocent person also needs to be diligent about how he maintains his ecosystem customers suppliers filing of returns classification valuation reporting of the data in a timely manner merely innocent mere innocence will not cut it and gst is one one place where uh, innocence is discounted so greatly innocence is discounted so greatly that uh, taxpayers now have to up their game and make sure that they, they they operate within a very compliant ecosystem of customers suppliers and uh, uh, their own distinct entities that they operate with another interesting amendment being proposed retrospectively again we've seen clause 7 and 8 being introduced to schedule 3 now here is an amendment that is being made to say that the treatment that transactions in 7 and 8 will not amount to a supply is being given retrospective effect but look at what happens here there is a 146 142 clause 142 in the bill has clause b which says two which says anyone who has already discharged tax under a misinformation that this amendment is only prospective and not clarificatory to be retrospective will not be given refund friends gst is a very forward looking legislation it does not look back and set things right for the past but one thing is certain taxpayers who were uh, seeking self assessment you know minimum government maximum government governance they have gst has answered that to ask and said now you are responsible for your assessment section 59 which says self self assessment is the way to go places an a tremendous burden on taxpayers to be diligent about how they will go about making this self assessment uh, work for them serve their interests best so therefore taxpayers need to be mindful that if they make mistakes in their own self assessment it is to their own peril and no government is going to come in to the rescue of those who are less than diligent about this liberty available in section 59 quickly we let look at uh, amendments in uh, igst law simple but profound mind you it is simple but very profound amendment being proposed is to the actual expression in uh, two subsection 17 where as far as uh, oidr services are concerned it simply eliminates one necessary ingredient it says essentially automated involving minimal human intervention this expression is sought to be amended what does it do it is so innocuous it is so innocuous that one might uh, tend to just pass it by saying that yes it's a simple amendment essentially automated and involving minimal human intervention is no longer will no longer be required for the transaction to be liable to tax as oidr services friends this opens up new areas it opens up new areas where even if it is not essentially automated even if there is a material amount of human intervention such a service can be under tax under oidr services so therefore we will need to relook how we have viewed this term what new transactions can come within the scope of this i just name a few which have uh, attracted a lot of attention in the past online gaming online gaming um crypto exchanges crypto exchanges information portals when you have these areas that have attracted a lot of attention to my mind this innocuous proposal in the finance bill takes us back to reexamining the tax positions taken in respect of these three sectors and plenty others friends please bear in mind just because the amendment is uh, tiny does not mean it does not have potential 
amendment introduced in section 12.8 to introduce a proviso. Now that proviso is sought to be withdrawn. We have circular 184 dealing with the consequences of this. To my mind, circular 184 does something special. It allows supplier to pick a credit efficient place of supply provision. This, this, this comes in handy as far as uh, interstate infrastructure construction projects are concerned. I very briefly mentioned what this could be because uh, place of supply provisions in section 10, 11, 12, and 13 of IGST law are only to determine one question, the nature of supply. Taxpayer is nobody to bother about where revenue go, flows to which state authority or does it go to the union. Taxpayer only has to apply POS provisions to pick interstate or intrastate. Once you pick, it is not intrastate, it is interstate and interstate in a manner that optimizes credits to the recipient. So please consider this amendment is significant in illuminating our understanding about that provision. When you look at the overall array of amendments being made, they teach us a lot about the amendments that uh, they themselves achieve for the future, but it also illuminates our understanding for the past. One amendment that I is conspicuously missing that we I so dearly hoped to find in this bill, which I must bring to members' attention is uh, a saving provision in 16.4. I'll give you just one example. There are seven illustrations, but only one example I will, I'll present for you to consider. Clubs and associations, clubs and associations were brought to tax from 1120 to effective 1717. So in January 22, clubs were called upon to pay output tax from 1717. Are they not hit by 16.4? A consequential amendment should have been made two years ago to 16.4 to save clubs and associations from losing input tax credit due to operation of 16.4. To my mind, this year especially, without a saving clause being introduced to 16.4 is going to be the nemesis of 16.4 in the future, rendering the time limit in 16.4 directory and not mandatory. Moving on from there, another interesting aspect that we can see is uh, the SESTAC, Customs Excise Service Tax Appellate Tribunal being designated as the tribunal to address interstate disputes relating to central sales tax. Friends, as you're aware, Provisions were introduced to designate the advance ruling authority of income tax to be the designated authority. Today, amendment is proposed, deleting section 24, substituting section 19 for purpose of section 9 and 6A of Central Sales Tax Act 1956 to make SISTAT the designated authority. We have to wait because it's going to present some very interesting situations where there's going to be three parties. There's going to be the taxpayer himself. There's going to be the state which has collected the tax. There's going to be a state which is now seeking to demand tax. Section 6A deals with burden of proof. While burden of proof is one aspect, if SESTAT has to now sit in judgment and preside over these matters, it's going to be so remarkable. It's going to make some very interesting turn of events as to how these interstate disputes will be addressed as far as central sales tax disputes dealing with two states seeking revenue discharge already before one authority becoming payable before the other. We will need to await some more consequential changes in the rules to understand how tribunal will function to address these issues, who will be the parties impleded. If uh, burden of proof has been long, transactions have been concluded long ago, how will burden of proof now be discharged? And if uh, tribunal being the last fact finding authority can go into inquiry to will they continue to enjoy the power of remand to direct certain facts to be now found out by the original authority. Friends, amendments being brought about in this uh, finance bill 
in the context of indirect tax provisions are not too little to be dismissed, but too profound for the two reasons that we discussed earlier. One, for what it is capable of doing for the future. Two, for what it also implicitly does for the past. Governance is very complex. Economic problems have to be dealt with. And we cannot lay blame for these amendments, retrospective and refining amendments at the doorstep of the government because the government is dealing with uh, really complex problems and uh, 246A does not give a simple problem for the government to contend with. Therefore, the humility that the government has shown cannot be discounted because credit, we might find fault with uh, a variety of things that GST law has to um, present presents to taxpayers. But one thing we must admit and give credit where it is due that the humility that the government shows in being able to uh, be willing to go back and make changes as often as necessary to make it clear that the decisions taken, they are so resolute about it. Faced with a resolute government, which is equally humble about having to make changes, uh, even retrospectively, if you will, we find that um, the stage is quite well set, that this government is not going to accept any lackadaisical approach in running one's businesses. Taxpayers have for long tried foul that uh, we are not in a position to supervise our suppliers integrity about how they do business. But I think uh, we've come a long way since introduction, although it's been a short five years. But in these short five years, the message is very clear that we will need to get our act together, clean the ecosystem within which we wish to operate. Taxpayers who are diligent about their businesses need to understand that here is a law that is the world's envy because there's no country that could possibly have a legislation as robust as we have in GST with all our diverse uh, needs that are being met through this one legislation that no less than a constitutional amendment was required to bring about a legislation as wonderful as ours. It just requires a whole new mindset. We will need to reset the way we look at GST law because this law upholds rule of law. There's no two ways about it because we have taxpayers complaining that this law is complex, but please consider for a moment how complex it is for tax administration, not only to grasp the way this law operates, use information that is minimal and available on the portal, not have the power to have intrusive investigations. With all these limitations, the challenge is equal on both sides. The purpose is very clear. Self-assessment in its true spirit is what GST shoots for. And if uh, taxpayers are diligent to understand the responsibility that goes with self-assessment, I think we will have for ourselves a winner in this law and see the potential that it has to offer us in the days to come. Thank you very much. Over to you, Rudina. Thanks a lot, sir. I think uh, with council meetings being a mini budget in themselves, thank you for an extensive and a comprehensive session on the proposal in the finance bill. I'll take a few questions, sir. Would, you, uh, would it be OK? Please. One sec. The first question are, what are the grounds on which we can say CSR would be allowed for the past periods? The fact that this amendment was necessary is proof in itself that without this amendment, one could not have possibly been denied credit. Correct. And then there are scores of others. Right, absolutely. Next is, what is the purpose of inserting the new provision of Section 158A and which organizations are expected to be covered here? Unlike 150, 158A allows regulators to exchange information at a very granular level. So I don't think we can look at 158A as uh, covering large information utilities or organizations that hold significant amount of information. I think individually, 
consent can be sought and information shared with various regulators. So I think 158A is tremendously potent. Interesting. Uh, what would be the implications of change in the definition of OIDR services? So this is what I was talking about, essentially automated and minimal human intervention being proposed to be taken out. So even if it is not essentially automated, or even if it involves material amount of human intervention, those transactions also seem to come within the operation of the definition. So therefore, we'll have to be careful what are those sectors, because many times to come out of uh, any demand of OIDAR, the grounds used are, look, it's not extensively automated. Look, okay. it does not have minimal human intervention. Now that those goalposts have been shifted, those defenses go away and transactions that took shelter behind those defenses will now be exposed. That's the risk. Certainly. So the last question for today, sir. The GST Council recommended to relax mandatory registration requirement for ECO suppliers for composition scheme dealers and unregistered persons. The relaxation is only extended to composition dealers. Is it expected that the, that the relaxation would also be extended to unregistered persons? See, what happens is, to my mind, service providers don't have any exclusion. There was never any commitment that service providers also will be allowed to get away from this. Where large number of service providers operate through e-commerce, we've seen like uh, ride hailing services, etc. They have been brought within uh, nine five so that there is no leakage of revenue. The necessity is to be registered. I think that doesn't go away. I don't expect unregistered persons to be completely uh, free to sell online yet not take registration at all. Today, I think it's very clear composition is permitted. Composition is permitted, but not unregistered taxpayers. I don't think, I don't expect that that will change. But mind you, when we say composition taxpayers are permitted to list online, taxpayers shouldn't rush to composition because composition taxpayers are liable to pay tax on the state turnover. It's not only on taxable turnover. So you are in a better position to go in for regular registration with QRMP rather than going for composition. And I think section 10 will slowly fall into disuse. This is one of those sections that we don't, government's position was that why do we need composition? Taxpayers said we need composition. Composition has become so stringent and so unviable that soon I would expect section 10 to fall into disuse, although it will stay in the statute book. Certainly right. So that's it from us. Thank you so much, Jatin, for an extensive and a comprehensive session. Ending the day exactly on a high note. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So what an informative and educational day it is, right? So I would like to express gratitude to all our speakers, including Mr. Mukesh Patel, Saraswati Kasturi Rangan, Suvira Agarwal, Ian Dwarkana, Tapan Gupta, Daksha Bakshi, Dr. Manoj Fogla, Suresh Kumar Kejriwal, Asim Chavla, Mr. Pramod Kumar, Vishwas Panjiar, Vinod Kothari, and A. Jatin Christopher for taking time out of their busy schedules to share their knowledge and insights with us. Thank you so much. A heartfelt thank you to all the attendees for making today's event a success. I, Ridma Bhatia, sign off for today with the words of Nelson Mandela, Education is the most powerful weapon which can use to change the world. Thank you so much. <laughs>